Preface to the Portrait of a Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont, USA. The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. Preface. The Portrait of a Lady was, like Roderick Hudson, begun in Florence, during three months spent there in the spring of 1879. Like Roderick, and like the American, it had been designed for publication in the Atlantic Monthly, where it began to appear in 1880. It differed from its two predecessors, however, in finding a course also open to it from month to month in Macmillan's magazine, which was to be for me one of the last occasions of simultaneous serialization in the two countries that the changing conditions of literary intercourse between England and the United States had up to then left unaltered. It is a long novel, and I was long in writing it. I remember being again much occupied with it the following year, during a stay of several weeks made in Venice. I had rooms on the Riva Schiavoni, at the top of a house near the passage leading off to San Zaccaria. The waterside life, the wondrous lagoon spread before me, and the ceaseless human chatter of Venice came in at my windows, to which I seemed to myself to have been constantly driven, in the fruitless fidget of composition, as if to see whether, out in the blue channel, the ship of some right suggestion, of some better phrase, of the next happy twist of my subject, the next true touch for my canvas, mightn't come into sight. But I recall vividly enough that the response most elicited in general to these restless appeals was the rather grim admonition that romantic and historic sites, such as the land of Italy abounds in, offer the artist a questionable aid to concentration when they themselves are not to be the subject of it. They are too rich in their own life, and too charged with their own meaning, merely to help him out with a lame phrase. They draw him away from his small question to their own greater ones, so that after a little he feels, while thus yearning toward them in his difficulty, as if he were asking an army of glorious veterans to help him to arrest a peddler who has given him the wrong change. There are pages of the book which, in the reading over, have seemed to make me see again the bristling curve of the wide riva, the large colour spots of the balconied houses, and the repeated undulation of the little hunchbacked bridges, marked by the rise and drop again, with the wave of foreshortened clicking pedestrians. The Venetian footfall and the Venetian cry all talk there, wherever uttered, having the pitch of a call across the water, come in once more at the window, renewing one's old impression of the delighted senses and the divided, frustrated mind. How can places that speak in general so to the imagination not give it at the moment the particular thing it wants? I recollect again and again in beautiful places dropping into that wonderment. The real truth is, I think, that they express under this appeal only too much, more than, in the given case, one has use for so that one finds oneself working less congruously, after all, so far as the surrounding picture is concerned than in the presence of the moderate and the neutral, to which we may lend something of the light of our vision. Such a place as Venice is too proud for such charities. Venice doesn't borrow, she but all magnificently gives. We profit by that enormously, but to do so we must either be quite off duty or be on it in her service alone. Such and so rueful are these reminiscences, though on the whole, no doubt, one's book and one's literary effort at large were to be the better for them. Strangely fertilizing in the long run does a wasted effort of attention often prove. It all depends on how the attention has been cheated, has been squandered. There are high-handed, insolent frauds, and there are insidious, sneaking ones. And there is, I fear, even on the most designing artist's part, always witless enough good faith, always anxious enough to desire, to fail to guard him against their deceits. Trying to recover here for recognition the germ of my idea, 
I see that it must have consisted not at all in any conceit of a plot, nefarious name in any flash upon the fancy of a set of relations, or in any one of those situations that by a logic of their own immediately fall for the fabulist into movement, into a march or a rush, a patter of quick steps, but altogether in the sense of a single character, the character and aspect of a particularly engaging young woman, to which all the usual elements of a subject, certainly of a setting, were to need to be superadded. Quite as interesting as the young woman herself, at her best, do I find, I must again repeat this projection of memory upon the whole matter of the growth in one's imagination, of some such apology for a motive. These are the fascinations of the fabulist's art, these lurking forces of expansion, these necessities of upspringing in the seed, these beautiful determinations, on the part of the idea entertained, to grow as tall as possible, to push into the light and the air and thickly flower there, and, quite as much, these fine possibilities of recovering from some good standpoint on the ground gained, the intimate history of the business, of retracing and reconstructing its steps and stages. I have always fondly remembered a remark that I heard fall years ago from the lips of Ivan Turgenev in regard to his own experience of the usual origin of the fictive picture. It began for him almost always with the vision of some person or persons who hovered before him, soliciting him as the active or passive figure, interesting him and appealing to him just as they were and by what they were. He saw them in that fashion as disponible, saw them subject to the chances, the complications of existence, and saw them vividly, but then had to find for them the right relations, those that would most bring them out, to imagine, to invent, and select, and piece together the situations most useful and favourable to the sense of the creatures themselves, the complications that they would be most likely to produce and to feel. To arrive at these things is to arrive at my story, he said, and that's the way I look for it. The result is that I'm often accused of not having story enough. I seem to myself to have as much as I need, to show my people, to exhibit their relations with each other, for that is all my measure. If I watch them long enough, I see them come together, I see them placed, I see them engaged in this or that act, and in this or that difficulty. How they look and move and speak and behave, always in the setting I have found for them, is my account of them, of which, I dare say, alas, que cela manque souvent d'architecture. But I would rather, I think, have too little architecture than too much, when there's danger of its interfering with my measure of the truth. The French, of course, like more of it than I give, having by their own genius such a hand for it, and indeed one must give all one can. As for the origin of one's wind-blown germs themselves, who shall say, as you ask, where they come from? We have to go too far back, too far behind, to say. Isn't it all we can say, that they come from every quarter of heaven, that they are there at almost any turn of the road? They accumulate, and we are always picking them over, selecting among them. They are the breath of life, by which I mean that life, in its own way, breathes them upon us. They are so, in a manner prescribed and imposed, floated into our minds by the current of life. That reduces to imbecility the vain critic's quarrel, so often with one subject, when he hasn't the wit to accept it. Will he point out, then, which other it should properly have been, his office being essentially to point out? Il en serait bien embarrassé. Ah, when he points out what I've done or failed to do with it, that's another matter. There he's on his ground. I give him up my architecture, my distinguished friend concluded, as much as he will. So this beautiful genius, and I recall with comfort the gratitude I drew from his reference to the intensity of suggestion that may reside in the stray figure, the unattached character, the image en disponibilité. It gave me higher warrant than I seemed then to have met for just that blessed habit of one's own imagination, 
the trick of investing some conceived or encountered individual some brace or group of individuals with the germinal property and authority i was myself so much more antecedently conscious of my figures than of their setting a too preliminary a preferential interest in which struck me as in general such a putting of the cart before the horse i might envy though i couldn't emulate the imaginative writer so constituted as to see his fable first and to make out its agents afterwards i could think so little of any fable that didn't need its agents positively to launch it i could think so little of any situation that didn't depend for its interest on the nature of the person situated and thereby on their way of taking it there are methods of so-called presentation i believe among novelists who have appeared to flourish that offer the situation as indifferent to that support but i have not lost the sense of the value for me at the time of the admirable russian's testimony to my not needing all superstitiously to try and perform any such gymnastic other echoes from the same source linger with me i confess as unfadingly if it be not all indeed one much embracing echo it was impossible after that not to read for one's uses high lucidity into the tormented and disfigured and bemuddled question of the objective value and even quite into that of the critical appreciation of subject in the novel one had had from an early time for that matter the instinct of the right estimate of such values and of its reducing to the inane the dull dispute over the immoral subject and the moral recognizing so promptly the one measure of the worth of a given subject the question about it that rightly answered disposes of all others is it valid in a word is it genuine is it sincere the result of some direct impression or perception of life i had found small edification mostly in a critical pretension that had neglected from the first all delimitation of ground and all definition of terms the air of my earlier time shows to memory as darkened all round with that vanity unless the difference to-day be just in one's own final impatience the lapse of one's own attention there is i think no more nutritive or suggestive truth in this connection than that of the perfect dependence of the moral sense of a work of art on the amount of felt life concerned in producing it the question comes back thus obviously to the kind and the degree of the artist's prime sensibility which is the soil out of which his subject springs the quality and capacity of that soil its ability to grow with due freshness and straightness any vision of life represents strongly or weakly the projected morality that element is but another name for the more or less close connection of the subject with some mark made on the intelligence with some sincere experience by which at the same time of course one is far from contending that this enveloping air of the artist's humanity which gives the last touch to the worth of the work is not a widely and wondrously varying element being on one occasion a rich and magnificent medium and on another a comparatively poor and ungenerous one here we get exactly the high price of the novel as a literary form its power not only while preserving that form with closeness to range through all the differences of the individual relation to its general subject matter all the varieties of outlook on life of disposition to reflect and project created by conditions that are never the same from man to man or so far as that goes from man to woman but positively to appear more true to its character in proportion as it strains or tends to burst with a latent extravagance its mould the house of fiction has in short not one window but a million a number of possible windows not to be reckoned rather every one of which has been pierced or is still pierceable in its vast front by the need of the individual vision and by the pressure of the individual will these apertures of dissimilar shape and size hang so altogether over the human scene that we might have expected of them a greater sameness of report than we find they are but windows at the best mere holes in a dead wall disconnected perched aloft 
they are not hinged doors opening straight upon life but they have this mark of their own that in each of them stands a figure with a pair of eyes or at least with a field glass which forms again and again for observation a unique instrument ensuring to the person making use of it an impression distinct from every other he and his neighbours are watching the same show but one seeing more where the other sees less one seeing black where the other sees white one seeing big where the other sees small one seeing coarse where the other sees fine and so on and so on there is fortunately no saying on what for the particular pair of eyes the window may not open fortunately by reason precisely of this incalculability of range the spreading field the human scene is the choice of subject the pierced aperture either broad or balconied or slit-like and low-browed is the literary form but they are singly or together as nothing without the posted presence of the watcher without in other words the consciousness of the artist tell me what the artist is and i will tell you of what he has been conscious thereby i shall express to you at once his boundless freedom and his moral reference all this is a long way round however for my word about my first dim move toward the portrait which was exactly my grasp of a single character an acquisition i had made moreover after a fashion not to be here retraced enough that i was as seemed to me in complete possession of it that i had been so for a long time that this had made it familiar and yet had not blurred its charm and that all urgently all tormentingly i saw it in motion and so to speak in transit this amounts to saying that i saw it as bent upon its fate some fate or other which among the possibilities being precisely the question thus i had my vivid and individual vivid so strangely in spite of being still at large not confined by the conditions not engaged in the tangle to which we look from much of the impress that constitutes an identity if the apparition was still all to be placed how came it to be vivid since we puzzled such quantities out mostly just by the business of placing them one could answer such a question beautifully doubtless if one could do so subtle if not so monstrous a thing as to write the history of the growth of one's imagination one would describe then what at a given time had extraordinarily happened to it and one would so for instance be in a position to tell with an approach to clearness how under favour of occasion it had been able to take over take over straight from life such and such a constituted animated figure or form the figure has to that extent as you see been placed placed in the imagination that detains it preserves protects enjoys it conscious of its presence in the dusky crowded heterogeneous back shop of the mind very much as a wary dealer in precious odds and ends competent to make an advance on rare objects confided to him is conscious of the rare little piece left in deposit by the reduced mysterious lady of title or the speculative amateur and which is already there to disclose its merit afresh as soon as the key shall have clicked in a cupboard door that may be i recognize a somewhat superfine analogy for the particular value i here speak of the image of the young feminine nature that i had had for so considerable a time all curiously at my disposal but it appears to fond memory quite to fit the fact with the recall in addition of my pious desire but to place my treasure right i quite remind myself thus of the dealer resigned not to realize resigned to keeping the precious object locked up indefinitely rather than commit it at no matter what price to vulgar hands for there are dealers in these forms and figures and treasures capable of that refinement the point is however that this single small cornerstone the conception of a certain young woman affronting her destiny had begun with being all my outfit for the large building of the portrait of a lady it came to be a square and spacious house 
or has at least seemed so to me in this going over it again. But such as it is, it had to be put up round my young woman while she stood there in perfect isolation. That is to me, artistically speaking, the circumstance of interest, for I have lost myself once more, I confess, in the curiosity of analysing the structure. By what process of logical accretion was this slight personality, the mere slim shade of an intelligent but presumptuous girl, to find itself endowed with the high attributes of a subject, and indeed by what thinness, at the best, would such a subject not be vitiated? Millions of presumptuous girls, intelligent or not intelligent, daily affront their destiny, and what is it open to their destiny to be, at the most, that we should make an ado about it? The novel is of its very nature an ado, an ado about something, and the larger the form it takes, the greater, of course, the ado. Therefore, consciously, that was what one was in for, for positively organizing an ado about Isabel Archer. One looked it well in the face, I seem to remember, this extravagance, and with the effect precisely of recognizing the charm of the problem. Challenge any such problem, with any intelligence, and you immediately see how full it is of substance. The wonder being, all the while, as we look at the world, how absolutely, how inordinately, the Isabel Archers, an even much smaller female fry, insist on mattering. George Eliot has admirably noted it. In these frail vessels is borne onward through the ages the treasure of human affection. In Romeo and Juliet, Juliet has to be important, just as in Adam Bede and the Mill on the Floss, and Middlemarch and Daniel Deronda, Hetty Sorrel and Maggie Tulliver and Rosamond Vincy and Gwendolyn Harleth have to be, with that much of firm ground, that much of bracing air, at the disposal all the while of their feet and their lungs. They are typical, none the less, of a class difficult in the individual case to make a centre of interest, so difficult, in fact, that many an expert painter, as, for instance, Dickens and Walter Scott, as, for instance, even in the main, so subtle a hand as that of R. L. Stevenson, has preferred to leave the task unattempted. There are, in fact, writers as to whom we make out that their refuge from this is to assume it be not worth their attempting by which pusillanimity and truth their honour is scantly saved. It is never an attestation of a value, or even of our imperfect sense of one, it is never a tribute to any truth at all, that we shall represent that value badly. It never makes up artistically for an artist's dim feeling about a thing, that he shall do the thing as ill as possible. There are better ways than that, the best of all of which is to begin with less stupidity. It may be answered, meanwhile, in regard to Shakespeare's and to George Eliot's testimony, that their concession to the importance of their Juliet's and Cleopatra's and Portia's, even with Portia as the very type and model of the young person intelligent and presumptuous, and to that of their Hetty's and Maggie's and Rosamond's and Gwendolyn's, suffers the abatement that these slimnesses are, when figuring as the main props of the theme, never suffered to be sole ministers of its appeal, but have their inadequacy eked out with comic relief and underplots, as the playwrights say, when not with murders and battles and the great mutations of the world. If they are shown as mattering as much as they could possibly pretend to, the proof of it is in a hundred other persons made of much stouter stuff, and each involved, moreover, in a hundred relations which matter to them concomitantly with that one. Cleopatra matters beyond bounds to Antony, but his colleagues, his antagonists, the state of Rome, and the impending battle also prodigiously matter. Portia matters to Antonio, and to Shylock, and to the Prince of Morocco, to the fifty aspiring princes, but for these gentry there are other lively concerns. For Antonio, notably, there are Shylock and Bassanio, and his lost ventures, and the extremity of his predicament. This extremity, indeed, by the same token, matters to Portia, 
though its doing so becomes of interest all by the fact that Portia matters to us. That she does so, at any rate, and that almost everything comes round to it again, supports my contention as to this fine example of the value recognized in the mere young thing. I say mere young thing, because I guess that even Shakespeare, preoccupied mainly though he may have been with the passions of princes, would scarce have pretended to found the best of his appeal for her on her high social position. It is an example exactly of the deep difficulty braved, the difficulty of making George Eliot's frail vessel, if not the all in all for our attention, at least the clearest of the call. Now, to see deep difficulty braved is at any time, for the really addicted artist, to feel almost even as a pang the beautiful incentive, and to feel it verily in such sort as to wish the danger intensified. The difficulty most worth tackling can only be for him, in these conditions, the greatest the case permits of. So I remember feeling here, in presence always, that is, of the particular uncertainty of my ground, that there would be one way better than another, oh, ever so much better than any other, of making it fight out its own battle. The frail vessel, that charged with George Eliot's treasure, and thereby of such importance to those who curiously approach it, has likewise possibilities of importance to itself, possibilities which permit of treatment, and in fact peculiarly require it from the moment they are considered at all. There is always the escape from any close account of the weak agent of such spells, by using as a bridge for evasion, for retreat and flight, the view of her relation to those surrounding her. Make it predominantly a view of their relation, and the trick is played. You give the general sense of her effect, and you give it, so far as the raising on it of a superstructure goes, with the maximum of ease. Well, I recall perfectly how little, in my now quite established connection, the maximum of ease appealed to me, and how I seemed to get rid of it by an honest transposition of the weights and the two scales. Place the centre of the subject in the young woman's own consciousness, I said to myself, and you get as interesting and as beautiful a difficulty as you could wish. Stick to that for the centre. Put the heaviest weight into that scale, which will be so large the scale of her relation to herself. Make her only interested enough at the same time in the things that are not herself, and this relation needn't fear to be too limited. Place, meanwhile, in the other scale, the lighter weight, which is usually the one that tips the balance of interest. Press least hard, in short, on the consciousness of your heroine's satellites, especially the male. Make it an interest contributive only to the greater one. See, at all events, what can be done in this way. What better field could there be for a due ingenuity? The girl hovers, inextinguishable, as a charming creature, and the job will be to translate her into the highest terms of that formula, and as nearly as possible, moreover, into all of them. To depend upon her, and her little concerns wholly, to see you through, will necessitate, remember, your really doing her. So far, I reasoned, and it took nothing less than that technical rigour, I now easily see, to inspire me with the right confidence for erecting on such a plot of ground the neat and careful and proportioned pile of bricks that arches over it, and that was thus to form, constructionally speaking, a literary monument. Such is the aspect that to-day the portrait wears for me, a structure reared with an architectural competence, as Turgenev would have said, that makes it, to the author's own sense, the most proportioned of his productions after the ambassadors, which was to follow it so many years later, and which has, no doubt, a superior roundness. On one thing I was determined, that though I should clearly have to pile brick upon brick for the creation of an interest, I would leave no pretext for saying that anything is out of line, scale, or perspective. 
I would build large, in fine embossed vaults and painted arches, as who should say, and yet never let it appear, that the chequered pavement, the ground under the reader's feet, fails to stretch at every point to the base of the walls. That precautionary spirit, on reperusal of the book, is the old note that most touches me. It testifies so for my own ear to the anxiety of my provision for the reader's amusement. I felt, in view of the possible limitations of my subject, that no such provision could be excessive, and the development of the latter was simply the general form of that earnest quest. And I find, indeed, that this is the only account I can give myself of the evolution of the fable. It is all under the head thus named that I conceive the needful accretion as having taken place, the right complications as having started. It was naturally of the essence that the young woman should be herself complex. That was rudimentary, or was at any rate the light in which Isabel Archer had originally dawned. It went, however, but a certain way, and other lights, contending, conflicting lights, and of as many different colours, if possible, as the rockets, the Roman candles, and Catherine wheels of a pyrotechnic display, would be employable to attest that she was. I had no doubt a groping instinct for the right complications, since I am quite unable to track the footsteps of those that constitute, as the case stands, the general situation exhibited. They are there for what they are worth, and as numerous as might be, but my memory, I confess, is a blank as to how and whence they came. I seem to myself to have waked up one morning in possession of them of Ralph Touchett and his parents, of Madame Merrill, of Gilbert Osmond and his daughter and his sister, of Lord Warburton, Caspar Goodwood and Miss Stackpole, the definite array of contributions to Isabel Arch's history. I recognized them, I knew them, they were the numbered pieces of my puzzle, the concrete terms of my plot. It was as if they had simply, by an impulse of their own, floated into my ken, and all in response to my primary question, well, what will she do? Their answer seemed to be that if I would trust them, they would show me, on which, with an urgent appeal to them to make it at least as interesting as they could, I trusted them. They were like the group of attendants and entertainers who come down by train when people in the country give a party. They represented the contract for carrying the party on. That was an excellent relation with them, a possible one even with so broken a reed, from her slightness of cohesion, as Henrietta Stackpole. It is a familiar truth to the novelist, at the strenuous hour, that as certain elements in any work are of the essence, so others are only of the form that as this or that character, this or that disposition of the material, belongs to the subject directly, so to speak, so this or that other belongs to it, but indirectly, belongs intimately to the treatment. This is a truth, however, of which he rarely gets the benefit, since it could be assured to him really, but by criticism based upon perception, criticism which is too little of this world. He must not think of benefits, moreover, I freely recognize, for that way dishonor lies. He has, that is, but one to think of, the benefit, whatever it may be, involved in his having cast a spell upon the simpler, the very simplest forms of attention. This is all he is entitled to. He is entitled to nothing he is bound to admit that can come to him from the reader, as a result of the latter's part of any act of reflection or discrimination. He may enjoy this finer tribute, that is another affair, but on condition only of taking it as a gratuity thrown in, a mere miraculous windfall, the fruit of a tree he may not pretend to have shaken. Against reflection, against discrimination, in his interest, all earth and air conspire. Wherefore it is that, as I say, he must in many a case have schooled himself from the first to work but for a living wage. The living wage is the reader's grant of the least possible quantity of attention required for consciousness of a spell. The occasional charming tip 
is an act of his intelligence over and beyond this, a golden apple for the writer's lap, straight from the wind-stirred tree. The artist may, of course, in wanton moods, dream of some paradise, for art, where the direct appeal to the intelligence might be legalized, for to such extravagances as these his yearning mind can scarce hope ever completely to close itself. The most he can do is to remember that they are extravagances. All of which is perhaps but a gracefully devious way of saying that Henrietta Stackpole was a good example, in the portrait, of the truth to which I just adverted, as good an example as I could name were it not that Maria Gostry, in The Ambassadors, then in the bosom of time, may be mentioned as a better. Each of these persons is but wheels to the coach, neither belongs to the body of that vehicle, or is for a moment accommodated with the seat inside. There the subject alone is ensconced in the form of its hero and heroine, and of the privileged high officials, say, who ride with the king and queen. There are reasons why one would have liked this to be felt, as in general one would like almost anything to be felt in one's work that one has self-contributively felt. We have seen, however, how idle is that pretension, which I should be sorry to make too much of. Maria Gostry and Miss Stackpole, then, are cases, each, of the light ficelle, not of the true agent. They may run beside the coach for all they are worth. They may cling to it till they are out of breath, as poor Miss Stackpole also visibly does. But neither, all the while, so much as gets her foot on the step, neither ceases for a moment to tread the dusty road. Put it even that they are like the fishwives who helped to bring back to Paris from Versailles, on that most ominous day of the first half of the French Revolution, the carriage of the royal family. The only thing is that I may well be asked, I acknowledged, why, then, in the present fiction, I have suffered Henrietta, of whom we have indubitably too much, so officiously, so strangely, so almost inexplicably to pervade. I will presently say what I can for that anomaly, and in the most conciliatory fashion. A point I wish still more to make is that if my relation of confidence with the actors in my drama, who were, unlike Miss Stackpole, true agents, was an excellent one to have arrived at, there still remained my relation with the reader, which was another affair altogether, and as to which I felt no one to be trusted but myself. That solicitude was to be accordingly expressed in the artful patience with which, as I have said, I piled brick upon brick. The bricks, for the whole counting over, putting for bricks little touches and inventions and enhancements by the way, affect me in truth as well-nigh innumerable and as ever so scrupulously fitted together and packed in. It is an effective detail of the minutest, though if one were in this connection to say all, one would express the hope that the general, the ampler air of the modest monument, still survives. I do at least seem to catch the key to a part of this abundance of small, anxious, ingenious illustration, as I recollect putting my finger in my young woman's interest on the most obvious of her predicates. What will she do? Why, the first thing she'll do will be to come to Europe, which in fact will form, and all inevitably, no small part of her principal adventure. Coming to Europe is even for the frail vessels in this wonderful age a mild adventure, but what is truer than that on one side, the side of their independence of flood and field, of the moving accident, of battle and murder and sudden death, her adventures are to be mild. Without her sense of them, her sense for them, as one may say, they are next to nothing at all. But isn't the beauty and the difficulty just in showing their mystic conversion by that sense, conversion into the stuff of drama, or even more delightful words still, of story? It was all as clear, my contention, as a silver bell. Two very good instances, I think, of this effect of conversion, two cases of the rare chemistry, are the pages in which Isabel, coming into the drawing-room at Garden Court, coming in from a wet walk, or whatever, that rainy afternoon, 
finds Madame Merle in possession of the place. Madame Merle seated, all absorbed, but all serene, at the piano, and deeply recognizes in the striking of such an hour, in the presence there, among the gathering shades of this personage, of whom a moment before she had never so much as heard, a turning point in her life. It is dreadful to have too much, for any artistic demonstration, to dot one's eyes and insist on one's intentions, and I am not eager to do it now. But the question here was that of producing the maximum of intensity with the minimum of strain. The interest was to be raised to its pitch, and yet the elements to be kept in their key, so that should the whole thing duly impress, I might show what an exciting inward life may do for the person leading it, even while it remains perfectly normal. And I cannot think of a more consistent application of that ideal unless it be in the long statement, just beyond the middle of the book, of my young woman's extraordinary meditative vigil on the occasion that was to become for her such a landmark. Reduced to its essence, it is but the vigil of searching criticism, but it throws the action further forward than twenty incidents might have done. It was designed to have all the vivacity of incident and all the economy of picture. She sits up by her dying fire, far into the night, under the spell of recognitions on which she finds the last sharpness suddenly wait. It is a representation simply of her motionlessly seeing, and an attempt withal to make the mere still lucidity of her act as interesting as the surprise of a caravan or the identification of a pirate. It represents, for that matter, one of the identifications dear to the novelist and even indispensable to him, but it all goes on without her being approached by another person and without her leaving her chair. It is obviously the best thing in the book but it is only a supreme illustration of the general plan. As to Henrietta, my apology for whom I just left incomplete, she exemplifies, I fear, in her superabundance, not an element of my plan, but only an excess of my zeal. So early was to begin my tendency to over-treat, rather than under-treat, when there was choice or danger, my subject. Many members of my craft, I gather, are far from agreeing with me, but I have always held over-treating the minor disservice. Treating, that of the portrait, amounted to never forgetting by any lapse that the thing was under a special obligation to be amusing. There was the danger of the noted thinness which was to be averted tooth and nail by the cultivation of the lively. That is, at least, how I see it today. Henrietta must have been, at that time, a part of my wonderful notion of the lively. And then there was another matter. I had, within the few preceding years, come to live in London, and the international light lay, in those days, to my sense, thick and rich upon the scene. It was the light in which so much of the picture hung. But that is another matter. There is really too much to say. Henry James End of Preface Chapter One of The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Under certain circumstances, there were few hours in life more agreeable than the hour dedicated to the ceremony known as afternoon tea. There are circumstances in which, whether you partake of the tea or not, some people of course never do, the situation is in itself delightful. Those that I have in mind in beginning to unfold this simple history offered an admirable setting to an innocent pastime. The implements of the little feast had been disposed upon the lawn of an old English country house in what I should call the perfect middle of a splendid summer afternoon. Part of the afternoon had waned, but much of it was left, and what was left was of the finest and rarest quality. Real dusk would not arrive for many hours, but the flood of summer light had begun to ebb, 
the air had grown mellow the shadows were long upon the smooth dense turf they lengthened slowly however and the scene expressed that sense of leisure still to come which is perhaps the chief source of one's enjoyment of such a scene at such an hour from five o'clock to eight is on certain occasions a little eternity but on such an occasion as this the interval could be only an eternity of pleasure the persons concerned in it were taking their pleasure quietly and they were not of the sex which is supposed to furnish the regular votaries of the ceremony i have mentioned the shadows on the perfect lawn were straight and angular they were the shadows of an old man sitting in a deep wicker chair near the low table on which the tea had been served and of two younger men strolling to and fro in desultory talk in front of him the old man had his cup in his hand it was an unusually large cup of a different pattern from the rest of the set and painted in brilliant colours he disposed of its contents with much circumspection holding it for a long time close to his chin with his face turned to the house his companions had either finished their tea or were indifferent to their privilege they smoked cigarettes as they continued to stroll one of them from time to time as he passed looked with a certain attention at the elder man who unconscious of observation rested his eyes upon the rich red front of his dwelling the house that rose beyond the lawn was a structure to repay such consideration and was the most characteristic object in the peculiarly english picture i have attempted to sketch it stood upon a low hill above the river the river being the thames at some forty miles from london a long gabled front of red brick with a complexion of which time and the weather had played all sorts of pictorial tricks only however to improve and refine it presented to the lawn its patches of ivy its clustered chimneys its windows smothered in creepers the house had a name and a history the old gentleman taking his tea would have been delighted to tell you these things how it had been built under edward the sixth had offered a night's hospitality to the great elizabeth whose august person had extended itself upon a huge magnificent and terribly angular bed which still formed the principal honour of the sleeping apartments had been a good deal bruised and defaced in cromwell's wars and then under the restoration repaired and much enlarged and how finally after having been remodelled and disfigured in the eighteenth century it had passed into the careful keeping of a shrewd american banker who had bought it originally because owing to circumstances too complicated to set forth it was offered at a great bargain bought it with much grumbling at its ugliness its antiquity its incommodity and who now at the end of twenty years had become conscious of a real aesthetic passion for it so that he knew all its points and would tell you just where to stand to see them in combination and just the hour when the shadows of its various protuberances which fell so softly upon the warm weary brickwork were of the right measure besides this as i have said he could have counted off most of the successive owners and occupants several of whom were known to general fame doing so however with an undemonstrative conviction that the latest phase of its destiny was not the least honourable the front of the house overlooking that portion of the lawn with which we are concerned was not the entrance front this was in quite another quarter privacy here reigned supreme and the wide carpet of turf that covered the level hilltop seemed but the extension of a luxurious interior the great still oaks and beeches flung down a shade as dense as that of velvet curtains and the place was furnished like a room with cushioned seats with rich coloured rugs with the books and papers that lay upon the grass the river was at some distance where the ground began to slope the lawn properly speaking ceased but it was none the less a charming walk down to the water the old gentleman at the tea-table who had come from america thirty years before had brought with him at the top of his baggage his american physiognomy 
and he had not only brought it with him, but had kept it in the best order, so that, if necessary, he might have taken it back to his own country with perfect confidence. At present, obviously, nevertheless, he was not likely to displace himself. His journeys were over, and he was taking the rest that precedes the great rest. He had a narrow, clean-shaven face, with features evenly distributed, and an expression of placid acuteness. It was evidently a face in which the range of representation was not large, so that the air of contented shrewdness was all the more of a merit. It seemed to tell that he had been successful in life, yet it seemed to tell also that his success had not been exclusive and invidious, but had had much of the inoffensiveness of failure. He had certainly had a great experience of men, but there was an almost rustic simplicity in the faint smile that played upon his lean, spacious cheek and lighted up his humorous eyes as he at last slowly and carefully deposited his big teacup upon the table. He was neatly dressed, in well-brushed black, but a shawl was folded upon his knees, and his feet were encased in thick, embroidered slippers. A beautiful collie dog lay upon the grass near his chair, watching the master's face almost as tenderly as the master took in the still more magisterial physiognomy of the house, and a little bristling, bustling terrier bestowed a desultory attendance upon the other gentleman. One of these was a remarkably well-made man of five-and-thirty, with a face as English as that of the old gentleman I have just sketched, with something else. A noticeably handsome face, fresh-coloured, fair and frank, with firm straight features, a lively grey eye, and the rich adornment of a chestnut beard. This person had a certain fortunate, brilliant, exceptional look, the air of a happy temperament fertilized by a high civilization, which would have made almost any observer envy him at a venture. He was booted and spurred, as if he had dismounted from a long ride. He wore a white hat, which looked too large for him. He held his two hands behind him, and in one of them, a large, white, well-shaped fist, was crumpled a pair of soiled dogskin gloves. His companion, measuring the length of the lawn beside him, was a person of quite a different pattern, who, although he might have excited grave curiosity, would not, like the other, have provoked you to wish yourself almost blindly in his place. Tall, lean, loosely and feebly put together, he had an ugly, sickly, witty, charming face, furnished but by no means decorated with a straggling moustache and whisker. He looked clever and ill, a combination by no means felicitous, and he wore a brown velvet jacket. He carried his hands in his pockets, and there was something in the way he did it that showed the habit was inveterate. His gait had a shambling, wandering quality. He was not very firm on his legs. As I have said, whenever he passed the old man in the chair, he rested his eyes upon him, and at this moment, with their faces brought into relation, you would easily have seen that they were father and son. The father caught his son's eye at last, and gave him a mild, responsive smile. "'I'm getting on well,' he said. "'Have you drunk your tea?' asked the son. "'Yes, and enjoyed it. Shall I give you some more?' The old man considered placidly. "'Well, I guess I'll wait and see.' He had, in speaking, the American tone. "'Are you cold?' the son inquired. The father slowly rubbed his legs. "'Well, I don't know. I can't tell till I feel.' "'Perhaps someone might feel for you,' said the younger man, laughing. "'Oh, I hope someone will always feel for me. Don't you feel for me, Lord Warburton?' "'Oh, yes, immensely,' said the gentleman, addressed as Lord Warburton promptly. I'm bound to say you look wonderfully comfortable. Well, I suppose I am in most respects. And the old man looked down at his green shawl and smoothed it over his knees. The fact is, I've been comfortable so many years that I suppose I've got so used to it I don't know it. Yes, that's the bore of comfort, said Lord Warburton, 
We only know when we're uncomfortable. It strikes me we're rather peculiar, his companion remarked. Oh, yes, there's no doubt we're peculiar, Lord Warburton murmured. And then the three men remained silent a while, the two younger ones standing looking down at the other, who presently asked for more tea. I should think you would be very unhappy with that shawl, Lord Warburton resumed, while his companion filled the old man's cup again. Oh, no, he must have the shawl, cried the gentleman in the velvet coat. Don't put such ideas as that into his head. It belongs to my wife, said the old man simply. Oh, if it's for sentimental reasons, and Lord Warburton made a gesture of apology. I suppose I must give it to her when she comes, the old man went on. You'll please do nothing of the kind. You'll keep it to cover your poor old legs. Well, you mustn't abuse my legs, said the old man. I guess they are as good as yours. Oh, you're perfectly free to abuse mine, his son replied, giving him his tea. Well, we're two lame ducks. I don't think there's much difference. I'm much obliged to you for calling me a duck. How's your tea? Well, it's rather hot. That's intended to be a merit. Ah, there's a great deal of merit, murmured the old man kindly. He's a very good nurse, Lord Warburton. Isn't he a bit clumsy? asked his lordship. Oh, no, he's not clumsy, considering that he's an invalid himself. He's a very good nurse for a sick nurse. I call him my sick nurse because he's sick himself. Oh, come, Daddy, the ugly young man exclaimed. Well, you are. I wish you weren't, but I suppose you can't help it. I might try. That's an idea, said the young man. Were you ever sick, Lord Warburton? his father asked. Lord Warburton considered a moment. Yes, sir, once, in the Persian Gulf. He's making light of you, Daddy, said the other young man. That's a sort of joke. Well, there seem to be so many sorts now, Daddy replied serenely. You don't look as if you had been sick anyway, Lord Warburton. He's sick of life. He was just telling me so, going on fearfully about it, said Lord Warburton's friend. "'Is that true, sir?' asked the old man gravely. "'If it is, your son gave me no consolation. "'He's a wretched fellow to talk to, a regular cynic. "'He doesn't seem to believe in anything.' "'That's another sort of joke,' said the person accused of cynicism. "'It's because his health is so poor,' his father explained to Lord Warburton. "'It affects his mind and colours his way of looking at things. "'He seems to feel as if he had never had a chance.' but it's almost entirely theoretical, you know. It doesn't seem to affect his spirits. I've hardly ever seen him when he wasn't cheerful, about as he is at present. He often cheers me up. The young man so described looked at Lord Warburton and laughed. Is it a glowing eulogy or an accusation of levity? Should you like me to carry out my theories, Daddy? By love, we should see some queer things, cried Lord Warburton. I hope you haven't taken up that sort of tone, said the old man. Warburton's tone is worse than mine. He pretends to be bored. I'm not in the least bored. I find life only too interesting. Ah, too interesting. You shouldn't allow it to be that, you know. I'm never bored when I come here, said Lord Warburton. One gets such uncommonly good talk. Is that another sort of joke? asked the old man. You've no excuse for being bored anywhere. When I was your age, I had never heard of such a thing. You must have developed very late. No, I developed very quick. That was just the reason. When I was twenty years old, I was very highly developed indeed. I was working tooth and nail. You wouldn't be bored if you had something to do. But all you young men are too idle. You think too much of your pleasure. You're too fastidious, and too indolent, and too rich. Oh, I say, cried Lord Warburton, you're hardly the person to accuse a fellow creature of being too rich. Do you mean because I'm a banker? asked the old man. Because of that, if you like, and because you have, haven't you, such unlimited means? He isn't very rich, the other young man mercifully pleaded. He has given away an immense deal of money. 
"'Well, I suppose it was his own,' said Lord Warburton. "'And in that case could there be a better proof of wealth? "'Let not a public benefactor talk of one's being too fond of pleasure.' Daddy's very fond of pleasure, of other people's. The old man shook his head. I don't pretend to have contributed anything to the amusement of my contemporaries. My dear father, you're too modest. That's a kind of joke, sir, said Lord Warburton. You young men have too many jokes. When there are no jokes, you've nothing left. Fortunately, there are always more jokes, the ugly young man remarked. I don't believe it. I believe things are getting more serious. You young men will find that out. The increasing seriousness of things, then, that's the great opportunity of jokes. They'll have to be grim jokes, said the old man. I'm convinced there will be great changes, and not all for the better. I quite agree with you, sir, Lord Warburton declared. I'm very sure there will be great changes, and that all sorts of queer things will happen. That's why I find so much difficulty in applying your advice. You know, you told me the other day that I ought to take hold of something. One hesitates to take hold of a thing that may the next moment be knocked sky high. You ought to take hold of a pretty woman, said his companion. He's trying hard to fall in love, he added, by way of explanation to his father. The pretty women themselves may be sent flying, Lord Warburton exclaimed. No, no, they'll be firm, the old man rejoined. They'll not be affected by the social and political changes I just referred to. You mean they won't be abolished? Very well, then, I'll lay my hands on one as soon as possible and tie her around my neck as a life preserver. The ladies will save us, said the old man. That is, the best of them will, for I make a difference between them. Make up to a good one and marry her, and your life will become much more interesting. A momentary silence marked, perhaps, on the part of his auditors, a sense of the magnanimity of this speech, for it was a secret neither for his son nor for his visitor that his own experiment in matrimony had not been a happy one. As he said, however, he made a difference, and these words may have been intended as a confession of personal error, though of course it was not in place for either of his companions to remark that apparently the lady of his choice had not been one of the best. "'If I marry an interesting woman, I shall be interested. Is that what you say?' Lord Warburton asked. "'I'm not at all keen about marrying. Your son misrepresented me. But there's no knowing what an interesting woman might do with me.' "'I should like to see your idea of an interesting woman,' said his friend." My dear fellow, you can't see ideas, especially such highly ethereal ones as mine. If I could only see it myself, that would be a great step in advance. Well, you may fall in love with whomsoever you please, but you mustn't fall in love with my niece, said the old man. His son broke into a laugh. He'll think you mean that as a provocation. My dear father, you've lived with the English for thirty years, and you've picked up a good many of the things they say, but you've never learned the things they don't say. I say what I please, the old man returned with all his serenity. I haven't the honour of knowing your niece, Lord Warburton said. I think it's the first time I've heard of her. She's a niece of my wife's. Mrs. Touchett brings her to England. Then young Mr. Touchett explained, my mother, you know, has been spending the winter in America, and we're expecting her back. She writes that she has discovered a niece, and that she has invited her to come out with her. I see, very kind of her, said Lord Warburton. Is the young lady interesting? We hardly know more about her than you. My mother has not gone into details. She chiefly communicates with us by means of telegrams, and her telegrams are rather inscrutable. They say women don't know how to write them, but my mother has thoroughly mastered the art of condensation. Tired America, hot weather awful, return England with niece, first steamer decent cabin. That's the sort of message we get from her. That was the last that came. But there had been another one before, which I think contained the first mention of the niece. Changed hotel, very bad, impudent clerk, address here. Taken sister's girl, died last year, go to Europe, two sisters, quite independent. 
Over that my father and I have scarcely stopped puzzling. It seems to admit of so many interpretations. There's one thing very clear in it, said the old man. She has given the hotel clerk a dressing. I'm not sure even of that, since he has driven her from the field. We thought at first that the sister mentioned might be the sister of the clerk, but the subsequent mention of a niece seems to prove that the allusion is to one of my aunts. Then there was a question as to whose the two other sisters were. They are probably two of my late aunt's daughters. But who's quite independent, and in what sense is the term used? That point's not yet settled. Does the expression apply more particularly to the young lady my mother has adopted, or does it characterize her sisters equally, and is it used in a moral or in a financial sense? Does it mean that they've been left well off, or that they wish to be under no obligations? Or does it simply mean that they're fond of their own way? Whatever else it means, it's pretty sure to mean that, Mr. Touchett remarked. You'll see for yourself, said Lord Warburton. When does Mrs. Touchett arrive? We're quite in the dark, as soon as she can find a decent cabin. She may be waiting for it yet. On the other hand, she may already have disembarked in England. In that case, she would probably have telegraphed to you. She never telegraphs when you would expect it, only when you don't, said the old man. She likes to drop in on me suddenly. She thinks she'll find me doing something wrong. She has never done so yet, but she's not discouraged. Is her share in the family trait, the independence she speaks of? Her son's appreciation of the matter was more favourable. Whatever the high spirit of those young ladies may be, her own is a match for it. She likes to do everything for herself and has no belief in anyone's power to help her. She thinks me of no more use than a postage stamp without gum, and she would never forgive me if I should presume to go to Liverpool to meet her. "'Will you at least let me know when your cousin arrives?' Lord Warburton asked. "'Only on the condition I've mentioned that you don't fall in love with her,' Mr. Touchett replied. "'That strikes me as hard. Don't you think me good enough?' "'I think you're too good, because I shouldn't like her to marry you. She hasn't come here to look for a husband, I hope. So many young ladies are doing that as if there were no good ones at home. Then she's probably engaged. American girls are usually engaged, I believe. Moreover, I'm not sure, after all, that you'd be a remarkable husband. Very likely she's engaged. I've known a good many American girls, and they always were. But I could never see that it made any difference upon my word. As for my being a good husband, Mr. Touch's visitor pursued, I'm not sure of that either. One can but try. Try as much as you please, but don't try it on my niece, smiled the old man, whose opposition to the idea was broadly humorous. Ah, oh, well, said Lord Warburton, with a humor broader still, perhaps after all she's not worth trying on. End of chapter 1《Chapter s Two and Three of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. While this exchange of pleasantries took place between the two, Ralph Touchett wandered away a little, with his usual slouching gait, his hands in his pockets, and his little rowdyish terrier at his heels. His face was turned toward the house, but his eyes were bent musingly on the lawn so that he had been an object of observation to a person who had just made her appearance in the ample doorway for some moments before he perceived her. His attention was called to her by the conduct of his dog, who had suddenly darted forward with a little volley of shrill barks, in which the note of welcome, however, was more sensible than that of defiance. The person in question was a young lady, who seemed immediately to interpret the greeting of the small beast. He advanced with great rapidity and stood at her feet, looking up and barking hard, whereupon, without hesitation, she stooped and caught him in her hands, holding him face to face while he continued his quick chatter. His master now had had time to follow and see that Bunchy's new friend was a tall girl in a black dress, who at first sight looked pretty. 
She was bareheaded, as if she were staying in the house, a fact which conveyed perplexity to the son of its master, conscious of that immunity from visitors which had for some time been rendered necessary by the latter's ill health. Meanwhile, the two other gentlemen had also taken note of the newcomer. "'Dear me, who's that strange woman?' Mr. Touchett had asked. "'Perhaps it's Mrs. Touchett's niece, the independent young lady,' Lord Warburton suggested. "'I think she must be, from the way she handles the dog.' The collie, too, had now allowed his attention to be diverted, and he trotted toward the young lady in the doorway, slowly setting his tail in motion as he went. "'But where's my wife, then?' murmured the old man. "'I suppose the young lady has left her somewhere. That's a part of the independence.' The girl spoke to Ralph, smiling, while she still held up the terrier. "'Is this your little dog, sir?' "'He was mine a moment ago, but you've suddenly acquired a remarkable air of property in him.' "'Couldn't we share him?' asked the girl. "'He's such a perfect little darling.' Ralph looked at her a moment. She was unexpectedly pretty. "'You may have him altogether,' he then replied. The young lady seemed to have a great deal of confidence, both in herself and in others, but this abrupt generosity made her blush. "'I ought to tell you that I'm probably your cousin,' she brought out, putting down the dog. "'And here's another,' she added quickly, as the collie came up. "'Probably,' the young man exclaimed, laughing. "'I supposed it was quite settled. Have you arrived with my mother?' "'Yes, half an hour ago. And has she deposited you and departed again?' "'No, she went straight to her room, and she told me that if I should see you, I was to say to you that you must come to her there at a quarter to seven. The young man looked at his watch. "'Thank you very much. I shall be punctual.' And then he looked at his cousin. "'You're very welcome here. I'm delighted to see you.' She was looking at everything with an eye that denoted clear perception, at her companion, at the two dogs, at the two gentlemen under the trees, at the beautiful scene that surrounded her. "'I've never seen anything so lovely as this place. I've been all over the house. It's too enchanting.' "'I'm sorry you should have been here so long without our knowing it.' "'Your mother told me that in England people arrived very quietly, so I thought it was all right. Is one of those gentlemen your father?' "'Yes, the elder one, the one sitting down,' said Ralph. The girl gave a laugh. "'I don't suppose it's the other. Who's the other?' "'He's a friend of ours, Lord Warburton. "'Oh, I hoped there would be a lord. It's just like a novel.' And then, "'Oh, you adorable creature!' she suddenly cried, stooping down and picking up the small dog again. She remained standing where they had met, making no offer to advance or to speak to Mr. Touchett, and while she lingered so near the threshold, slim and charming, her interlocutor wondered if she expected the old man to come and pay her his respects. American girls were used to a great deal of deference, and it had been intimated that this one had a high spirit. Indeed, Ralph could see that in her face. "'Won't you come and make acquaintance with my father?' he nevertheless ventured to ask. He's old and infirm. He doesn't leave his chair. "'Ah, poor man, I'm very sorry,' the girl exclaimed, immediately moving forward. "'I got the impression from your mother that he was rather, rather intensely active.' Ralph Touchett was silent a moment. "'She hasn't seen him for a year.' "'Well, he has a lovely place to sit. Come along, little hound.' "'It's a dear old place,' said the young man, looking sidewise at his neighbour. "'What's his name?' she asked, her attention having again reverted to the terrier. "'My father's name?' "'Yes,' said the young lady with amusement. "'But don't tell him I asked you.' They had come by this time to where old Mr. Touchett was sitting, and he slowly got up from his chair to introduce himself. "'My mother has arrived,' said Ralph, "'and this is Miss Archer.' The old man placed his two hands on her shoulders, looked at her a moment with extreme benevolence, and then gallantly kissed her. "'It's a great pleasure for me to see you here, but I wish you had given us a chance to receive you.' "'Oh, we were received,' said the girl. There were about a dozen servants in the hall, and there was an old woman curtsying at the gate. 
"'We can do better than that, if we have notice.' And the old man stood there, smiling, rubbing his hands, and slowly shaking his head at her. "'But Mrs. Touchett doesn't like receptions.' "'She went straight to her room.' "'Yes, and locked herself in. She always does that. "'Well, I suppose I shall see her next week.' And Mrs. Touchett's husband slowly resumed his former posture. "'Before that,' said Miss Archer, "'she's coming down to dinner at eight o'clock. "'Don't you forget a quarter to seven, she added, turning with a smile to Ralph. "'What's to happen at a quarter to seven? "'I'm to see my mother,' said Ralph. "'Ah, happy boy,' the old man commented. "'You must sit down, you must have some tea,' he observed to his wife's niece. "'They gave me some tea in my room the moment I got here,' this young lady answered. "'I'm sorry you're out of health,' she added, resting her eyes upon her venerable host. "'Oh, I'm an old man, my dear. It's time for me to be old, but I shall be the better for having you here.' She had been looking all around her again, at the lawn, the great trees, the reedy, silvery Thames, the beautiful old house, and while engaged in this survey she had made room for it in her companions, a comprehensiveness of observation easily conceivable on the part of a young woman who was evidently both intelligent and excited. She had seated herself and had put away the little dog. Her white hands in her lap were folded upon her black dress. Her head was erect, her eye lighted, her flexible figure turned itself easily this way and that, in sympathy with the alertness with which she evidently caught impressions. Her impressions were numerous, and they were all reflected in a clear, still smile. I've never seen anything so beautiful as this. It's looking very well, said Mr. Touchett. I know the way it strikes you. I've been through all that. But you're very beautiful yourself, he added, with a politeness by no means crudely jocular, and with a happy consciousness that his advanced age gave him the privilege of saying such things, even to young persons who might possibly take alarm at them. What degree of alarm this young person took need not be exactly measured. She instantly rose, however, with a blush which was not a refutation. Oh, yes, of course I'm lovely, she returned with a quick laugh. How old is your house? Is it Elizabethan? "'It's early Tudor,' said Ralph Touchett. She turned toward him, watching his face. "'Early Tudor? How very delightful! And I suppose there are a great many others.' "'There are many much better ones.' "'Don't say that, my son,' the old man protested. "'There's nothing better than this.' "'I've got a very good one. I think in some respects it's rather better,' said Lord Warburton, who as yet had not spoken, but who had kept an attentive eye upon Miss Archer. He slightly inclined himself, smiling. He had an excellent manner with women. The girl appreciated it in an instant. She had not forgotten that this was Lord Warburton. "'I should very much like to show it to you,' he added. "'Don't you believe him?' cried the old man. "'Don't look at it. It's a wretched old barrack, not to be compared with this.' "'I don't know. I can't judge,' said the girl, smiling at Lord Warburton. In this discussion Ralph Touchett took no interest whatever. He stood with his hands in his pockets, looking greatly as if he should like to renew his conversation with his new-found cousin. "'Are you very fond of dogs?' he inquired, by way of beginning. He seemed to recognize that it was an awkward beginning for a clever man. "'Very fond of them, indeed.' "'You must keep the terrier, you know,' he went on, still awkwardly. "'I'll keep him while I'm here with pleasure.' "'That will be for a long time, I hope.' "'You're very kind. I hardly know. My aunt must settle that.' "'I'll settle it with her at a quarter to seven. and Ralph looked at his watch again. "'I'm glad to be here at all,' said the girl. "'I don't believe you allow things to be settled for you.' "'Oh, yes, if they're settled as I like them.' "'I shall settle this as I like it,' said Ralph. "'It's most unaccountable that we should have never known you.' "'I was there. You had only to come and see me.' "'There? Where do you mean?' "'In the United States, in New York and Albany and other American places.' "'I've been there all over, but I never saw you. I can't make it out.' 
Miss Archer just hesitated. It was because there had been some disagreement between your mother and my father, after my mother's death, which took place when I was a child. In consequence of it, we never expected to see you. Ah, but I don't embrace all my mother's quarrels. Heaven forbid, the young man cried. You've lately lost your father, he went on more gravely. Yes, more than a year ago. After that, my aunt was very kind to me. She came to see me and proposed that I should come with her to Europe. I see, said Ralph. She has adopted you. Adopted me? The girl stared and her blush came back to her, together with a momentary look of pain, which gave her interlocutor some alarm. He had underestimated the effect of his words. Lord Warburton, who appeared constantly desirous of a nearer view of Miss Archer, strolled toward the two cousins at the moment, and as he did so, she rested her wider eyes on him. Oh, no, she has not adopted me. I'm not a candidate for adoption. I beg a thousand pardons, Ralph murmured. I meant, I meant, he hardly knew what he meant. You meant she has taken me up. Yes, she likes to take people up. She has been very kind to me, but, she added with a certain visible eagerness of desire to be explicit, I'm very fond of my liberty. Are you talking about Mrs. Touchett? the old man called out from his chair. Come here, my dear, and tell me about her. I'm always thankful for information. The girl hesitated again, smiling. She's really very benevolent, she answered, after which she went over to her uncle, whose mirth was excited by her words. Lord Warburton was left standing with Ralph Touchett, to whom in a moment he said, You wished a while ago to see my idea of an interesting woman. There it is. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3. Mrs. Touchett was certainly a person of many oddities, of which her behaviour on returning to her husband's house after many months was a notable specimen. She had her own way of doing all that she did, and this is the simplest description of a character which, although by no means without liberal motions, rarely succeeded in giving an impression of suavity. Mrs. Touchett might do a great deal of good, but she never pleased. This way of her own, of which she was so fond, was not intrinsically offensive. It was just unmistakably distinguished from the ways of others. The edges of her conduct were so very clear-cut that for susceptible persons it sometimes had a knife-like effect. The hard fineness came out in her deportment during the first hours of her return from America under circumstances in which it might have seemed that her first act would have been to exchange greetings with her husband and son. Mrs. Touchett, for reasons which she deemed excellent, always retired on such occasions into impenetrable seclusion, postponing the more sentimental ceremony until she had repaired the disorder of dress with a completeness which had the less reason to be of high importance as neither beauty nor vanity were concerned in it. She was a plain-faced old woman, without graces and without any great elegance, but with an extreme respect for her own motives. She was usually prepared to explain these, when the explanation was asked as a favour, and in such a case they proved totally different from those that had been attributed to her. She was virtually separated from her husband, but she appeared to perceive nothing irregular in the situation. It had become clear at an early stage of their community that they should never desire the same thing at the same moment, and this appearance had prompted her to rescue disagreement from the vulgar realm of accident. She did what she could to erect it into a law, a much more edifying aspect of it, by going to live in Florence, where she bought a house and established herself, and by leaving her husband to take care of the English branch of his bank. This arrangement greatly pleased her. It was so felicitously definite. It struck her husband in the same light, in a foggy square in London, where it was at times the most definite fact he discerned. But he would have preferred that such unnatural things should have a greater vagueness. To agree to disagree had cost him an effort. He was ready to agree to almost anything but that, and saw no reason why either assent or dissent should be so terribly consistent. Mrs. Touchett indulged in no regrets nor speculations, 
and usually came once a year to spend a month with her husband, a period during which she apparently took pains to convince him that she had adopted the right system. She was not fond of the English style of life, and had three or four reasons for it to which she currently alluded. They bore upon minor points of that ancient order, but for Mrs. Touchett they amply justified non-residence. She detested bread sauce, which, as she said, looked like a poultice and tasted like soap. She objected to the consumption of beer by her maidservants, and she affirmed that the British laundress, Mrs. Touchett was very particular about the appearance of her linen, was not a mistress of her art. At fixed intervals she paid a visit to her own country, but this last had been longer than any of its predecessors. She had taken up her niece, there was little doubt of that. One wet afternoon, some four months earlier than the occurrence lately narrated, this young lady had been seated alone with a book. To say she was so occupied is to say that her solitude did not press upon her, for her love of knowledge had a fertilizing quality, and her imagination was strong. There was at this time, however, a want of fresh taste in her situation, which the arrival of an unexpected visitor did much to correct. The visitor had not been announced. The girl heard her at last walking about the adjoining room. It was an old house at Albany, a large square double house with a notice of sale in the windows of one of the lower apartments. There were two entrances, one of which had long been out of use, but had never been removed. They were exactly alike, large white doors, with an arched frame and wide side lights, perched upon little stoops of red stone, which descended sidewise to the brick pavements of the street. The two houses together formed a single dwelling, the party wall having been removed and the rooms placed in communication. These rooms above stairs were extremely numerous, and were painted all over exactly alike in a yellowish white which had grown sallow with time. On the third floor there was a sort of arched passage connecting the two sides of the house, which Isabel and her sisters used in their childhood to call the tunnel, and which, though it was short and well lighted, always seemed to the girl to be strange and lonely, especially on winter afternoons. She had been in the house at different periods as a child. In those days her grandmother lived there. Then there had been an absence of ten years, followed by a return to Albany before her father's death. Her grandmother, old Mrs. Archer, had exercised chiefly within the limits of the family a large hospitality in the early period, and the little girls often spent weeks under her roof, weeks of which Isabel had the happiest memory. The manner of life was different from that of her own home, larger, more plentiful, practically more festal. The discipline of the nursery was delightfully vague, and the opportunity of listening to the conversation of one's elders, which with Isabel was a highly valued pleasure, almost unbounded. There was a constant coming and going. Her grandmother's sons and daughters and their children appeared to be in the enjoyment of standing invitations to arrive and remain, so that the house offered to a certain extent the appearance of a bustling provincial inn kept by a gentle old landlady who sighed a great deal and never presented a bill. Isabel, of course, knew nothing about bills, but even as a child she thought her grandmother's home romantic. There was a covered piazza behind it, furnished with a swing which was a source of tremulous interest, and beyond this was a long garden sloping down to the stable and containing peach trees of barely credible familiarity. Isabel had stayed with her grandmother at various seasons, but somehow all her visits had a flavour of peaches. On the other side, across the street, was an old house that was called the Dutch House, a peculiar structure dating from the earliest colonial times, composed of bricks that had been painted yellow, crowned with a gable that was pointed out to strangers, defended by a rickety wooden paling, and standing sidewise to the street. It was occupied by a primary school for children of both sexes, kept or rather let go by a demonstrative lady of whom Isabel's chief recollection was that her hair was fastened with strange bedroomy combs at the temples, and that she was the widow of someone of consequence. 
the little girl had been offered the opportunity of laying a foundation of knowledge in this establishment but having spent a single day in it she had protested against its laws and had been allowed to stay at home where in the september days when the windows of the dutch house were open she used to hear the hum of childish voices repeating the multiplication table an incident in which the elation of liberty and the pain of exclusion were indistinguishably mingled the foundation of her knowledge was really laid in the idleness of her grandmother's house where as most of the other inmates were not reading people she had uncontrolled use of a library full of books with frontispieces which she used to climb upon a chair to take down when she had found one to her taste she was guided in the selection chiefly by the frontispiece she carried it into a mysterious apartment which lay beyond the library and which was called traditionally no one ever knew why the office whose office it had been and at what period it had flourished she never learned it was enough for her that it contained an echo and a pleasant musty smell and that it was a chamber of disgrace for old pieces of furniture whose infirmities were not always apparent so that the disgrace seemed unmerited and rendered them victims of injustice and with which in the manner of children she had established relations almost human certainly dramatic there was an old haircloth sofa in especial to which she had confided a hundred childish sorrows the place owed much of its mysterious melancholy to the fact that it was properly entered from the second floor of the house the door that had been condemned and that it was secured by bolts which a particularly slender little girl found it impossible to slide she knew that this silent motionless portal opened into the street if the side lights had not been filled with green paper she might have looked out upon the little brown stoop and the well-worn brick pavement but she had no wish to look out for this would have interfered with her theory that there was a strange unseen place on the other side a place which became to the child's imagination according to its different moods a region of delight or of terror it was in the office still that isabel was sitting on that melancholy afternoon of early spring which i have just mentioned at this time she might have had the whole house to choose from and the room she had selected was the most depressed of its scenes she had never opened the bolted door nor removed the green paper renewed by other hands from its side lights she had never assured herself that the vulgar street lay beyond a crude cold rain fell heavily the springtime was indeed an appeal and it seemed a cynical insincere appeal to patience isabel however gave as little heed as possible to cosmic treacheries she kept her eyes on her book and tried to fix her mind it had lately occurred to her that her mind was a good deal of a vagabond and she had spent much ingenuity in training it to a military step and teaching it to advance to halt to retreat to perform even more complicated manoeuvres at the word of command just now she had given it marching orders and had been trudging over the sandy plains of a history of german thought suddenly she became aware of a step very different from her own intellectual pace she listened a little and perceived that someone was moving in the library which communicated with the office it struck her first as the step of a person from whom she was looking for a visit then almost immediately announced itself as the tread of a woman and a stranger her possible visitor being neither it had an inquisitive experimental quality which suggested that it would not stop short of the threshold of the office and in fact the doorway of this apartment was presently occupied by a lady who paused there and looked very hard at our heroine she was a plain elderly woman dressed in a comprehensive waterproof mantle she had a face with a good deal of rather violent point oh she began is that where you usually sit she looked about at the heterogeneous chairs and tables not when i have visitors said isabel getting up to receive the intruder she directed their course back to the library while the visitor continued to look about her you seem to have plenty of other rooms they're in rather better condition but everything's immensely worn have you come to look at the house isabel asked the servant will show it to you 
Send her away. I don't want to buy it. She has probably gone to look for you and is wandering about upstairs. She didn't seem at all intelligent. You had better tell her it's no matter. And then, since the girl stood there hesitating and wondering, this unexpected critic said to her abruptly, "'I suppose you're one of the daughters?' Isabel thought she had very strange manners. "'It depends upon whose daughters you mean.' "'The late Mr. Archer's, and my poor sister's.' "'Ah,' said Isabel slowly, "'you must be our crazy Aunt Lydia.' "'Is that what your father told you to call me? "'I'm your Aunt Lydia, but I'm not at all crazy. "'I haven't a delusion. "'And which of the daughters are you?' I'm the youngest of the three, and my name's Isabel. Yes, the others are Lillian and Edith. And are you the prettiest? I haven't the least idea, said the girl. I think you must be. And in this way the aunt and the niece made friends. The aunt had quarrelled years before with her brother-in-law, after the death of her sister, taking him to task for the manner in which he brought up his three girls. Being a high-tempered man, he had requested her to mind her own business, and she had taken him at his word. For many years she held no communication with him, and after his death had addressed not a word to his daughters, who had been bred in that disrespectful view of her which we have just seen Isabel betray. Mrs. Touchett's behaviour was, as usual, perfectly deliberate. She intended to go to America to look after her investments with which her husband, in spite of his great financial position, had nothing to do, and would take advantage of this opportunity to inquire into the condition of her nieces. There was no need of writing, for she should attach no importance to any account of them she should elicit by letter. She believed, always, in seeing for oneself. Isabel found, however, that she knew a good deal about them, and knew about the marriage of the two elder girls knew that their poor father had left very little money, but that the house in Albany, which had passed into his hands, was to be sold for their benefit. Knew, finally, that Edmund Ludlow, Lillian's husband, had taken upon himself to attend to this matter, in consideration of which the young couple, who had come to Albany during Mr. Archer's illness, were remaining there for the present, and, as well as Isabel herself, occupying the old place. "'How much money do you expect for it?' Mrs. Touchett asked of her companion, who had brought her to sit in the front parlour, which she had inspected without enthusiasm. "'I haven't the least idea,' said the girl. "'That's the second time you've said that to me,' her aunt rejoined. "'And yet you don't look at all stupid.' "'I'm not stupid, but I don't know anything about money.' "'Yes, that's the way you were brought up, as if you were to inherit a million.' What have you, in point of fact, inherited? I really can't tell you. You must ask Edmund and Lillian. They'll be back in half an hour. In Florence we should call it a very bad house, said Mrs. Touchett, but here, I dare say, it will bring a high price. It ought to make a considerable sum for each of you. In addition to that, you must have something else. It's most extraordinary you're not knowing. The positions of value and they'll probably pull it down and make a row of shops. I wonder you don't do that yourself. You might let the shops to great advantage. Isabel stared. The idea of letting shops was new to her. I hope they won't pull it down, she said. I'm extremely fond of it. I don't see what makes you fond of it. Your father died here. Yes, but I don't dislike it for that, the girl rather strangely returned. I like places in which things have happened, even if they're sad things. A great many people have died here. The place has been full of life. Is that what you call being full of life? I mean, full of experience, of people's feelings and sorrows, and not of their sorrows only, for I've been very happy here as a child. You should go to Florence if you like houses in which things have happened, especially deaths. I live in an old palace in which three people have been murdered, three that were known, and I don't know how many more besides. In an old palace, Isabel repeated. Yes, my dear, a very different affair from this. This is very bourgeois. Isabel felt some emotion, for she had always thought highly of her grandmother's house. But the emotion was of a kind which led her to say, I should like very much to go to Florence. 
"'Well, if you'll be good and do everything I tell you, I'll take you there,' Mrs. Touchett declared. Our young woman's emotion deepened. She flushed a little and smiled at her aunt in silence. "'Do everything you tell me. I don't think I can promise that.' "'No, you don't look like a person of that sort. You're fond of your own way, but it's not for me to blame you.' "'And yet to go to Florence,' the girl exclaimed in a moment, "'I'd promise almost anything.' Edmund and Lillian were slow to return, and Mrs. Touchett had an hour's uninterrupted talk with her niece, who found her a strange and interesting figure, a figure essentially almost the first she had ever met. She was as eccentric as Isabel had always supposed, and hitherto, whenever the girl had heard people described as eccentric, she had thought of them as offensive or alarming. The term had always suggested to her something grotesque and even sinister. But her aunt made it a matter of high but easy irony or comedy, and led her to ask herself if the common tone, which was all she had known, had ever been as interesting. No one certainly had on any occasion so held her as this little, thin-lipped, bright-eyed, foreign-looking woman, who retrieved an insignificant appearance by a distinguished manner, and sitting there in a well-worn waterproof, talked with striking familiarity of the courts of Europe. There was nothing flighty about Mrs. Touchett, but she recognized no social superiors, and judging the great ones of the earth in a way that spoke of this, enjoyed the consciousness of making an impression on a candid and susceptible mind. Isabel at first had answered a good many questions, and it was from her answers, apparently, that Mrs. Touchett derived a high opinion of her intelligence. But after this she had asked a good many, and her aunt's answers, whatever turn they took, struck her as food for deep reflection. Mrs. Touchett waited for the return of the other niece as long as she thought reasonable, but as at six o'clock Mrs. Ludlow had not come in, she prepared to take her departure. "'Your sister must be a great gossip. Is she accustomed to staying out so many hours?' "'You've been out almost as long as she,' Isabel replied. "'She can have left the house but a short time before you came in.' Mrs. Touchett looked at the girl without resentment. She appeared to enjoy a bold retort, and to be disposed to be gracious. "'Perhaps she hasn't had so good an excuse as I. Tell her, at any rate, that she must come and see me this evening at that horrid hotel. She may bring her husband if she likes, but she needn't bring you. I shall see plenty of you later.'" End of chapter 3《Chapters Four and Five of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Four Mrs. Ludlow was the eldest of the three sisters, and was usually thought the most sensible, the classification being in general that Lillian was the practical one, Edith the beauty, and Isabel the intellectual superior. Mrs. Keyes, in the second of the group, was the wife of an officer of the United States Engineers, and, as our history is not further concerned with her, it will suffice that she was indeed very pretty, and that she formed the ornament of those various military stations, chiefly in the unfashionable West, to which, to her deep chagrin, her husband was successively relegated. Lillian had married a New York lawyer, a young man with a loud voice, and an enthusiasm for his profession. The match was not brilliant any more than Edith's, but Lillian had occasionally been spoken of as a young woman who might be thankful to marry at all. She was so much plainer than her sisters. She was, however, very happy, and now, as the mother of two peremptory little boys, and the mistress of a wedge of brownstone violently driven into 53rd Street, seemed to exult in her condition as in a bold escape. She was short and solid, and her claim to figure was questioned, but she was conceded presence, though not majesty. She had, moreover, as people said, improved since her marriage, and the two things in life of which she was most distinctly conscious were her husband's force in argument and her sister Isabel's originality. I've never kept up with Isabel. 
it would have taken all my time she had often remarked in spite of which however she held her rather wistfully in sight watching her as a motherly spaniel might watch a free greyhound i want to see her safely married that's what i want to see she frequently noted to her husband well i must say i should have no particular desire to marry her edmund ludlow was accustomed to answer in an extremely audible tone i know you say that for argument you always take the opposite ground i don't see what you've got against her except that she's so original well i don't like originals i like translations mr ludlow had more than once replied isabel's written in a foreign tongue i can't make her out she ought to marry an armenian or a portuguese that's just what i'm afraid she'll do cried lillian who thought isabel capable of anything she listened with great interest to the girl's account of mrs touchett's appearance and in the evening prepared to comply with their aunt's commands of what isabel then said no report has remained but her sister's words had doubtlessly prompted a word spoken to her husband as the two were making ready for their visit i do hope immensely she'll do something handsome for isabel she has evidently taken a great fancy to her what is it you wish her to do edmund ludlow asked make her a big present no indeed nothing of the sort but take an interest in her sympathize with her she's evidently just the sort of person to appreciate her she has lived so much in foreign society she told isabel all about it you know you've always thought isabel rather foreign you want her to give her a little foreign sympathy eh don't you think she gets enough at home well she ought to go abroad said mrs ludlow she's just the person to go abroad and you want the old lady to take her is that it she has offered to take her she's dying to have isabel go but what i want her to do when she gets her there is to give her all the advantages i'm sure all we've got to do said mrs ludlow is to give her a chance a chance for what a chance to develop oh moses edmund ludlow exclaimed i hope she isn't going to develop any more if i were not sure you only said that for an argument i should feel very badly his wife replied but you know you love her do you know i love you the young man said jocosely to isabel a little later while he brushed his hat i'm sure i don't care whether you do or not exclaimed the girl whose voice and smile however were less haughty than her words oh she feels so grand since mrs touchett's visit said her sister but isabel challenged this assertion with a good deal of seriousness you must not say that lily i don't feel grand at all i'm sure there's no harm said the conciliatory lily ah but there's nothing in mrs touchett's visit to make one feel grand oh exclaimed ludlow she's grander than ever whenever i feel grand said the girl it will be for a better reason whether she felt grand or no she at any rate felt different felt as if something had happened to her left to herself for the evening she sat a while under the lamp her hands empty her usual avocations unheeded then she rose and moved about the room and from one room to another preferring the places where the vague lamplight expired she was restless and even agitated at moments she trembled a little the importance of what had happened was out of proportion to its appearance there had really been a change in her life what it would bring with it was as yet extremely indefinite but isabel was in a situation that gave a value to any change she had a desire to leave the past behind her and as she said to herself to begin afresh this desire indeed was not a birth of the present occasion it was as familiar as the sound of the rain upon the window and it had led her to beginning afresh a great many times she closed her eyes as she sat in one of the dusky corners of the quiet parlour but it was not with a desire for dozing forgetfulness it was on the contrary because she felt too wide-eyed and wished to check the sense of seeing too many things at once 
Her imagination was by habit ridiculously active. When the door was not open, it jumped out of the window. She was not accustomed, indeed, to keep it behind bolts, and, at important moments, when she would have been thankful to make use of her judgment alone, she paid the penalty of having given undue encouragement to the faculty of seeing without judging. At present, with her sense that the note of change had been struck, came gradually a host of images of the things she was leaving behind her. The years and hours of her life came back to her, and for a long time, in a stillness broken only by the ticking of the big bronze clock, she passed them in review. It had been a very happy life, and she had been a very fortunate person. This was the truth that seemed to emerge most vividly. She had had the best of everything, and in a world in which the circumstances of so many people made them unenviable, it was an advantage never to have known anything particularly unpleasant. It appeared to Isabel that the unpleasant had been even too absent from her knowledge for she had gathered from her acquaintance with literature that it was often a source of interest and even of instruction. Her father had kept it away from her, her handsome, much-loved father, who always had such an aversion to it. It was a great felicity to have been his daughter. Isabel rose even to pride in her parentage. Since his death she had seemed to see him as turning his braver side to his children, and as not having managed to ignore the ugly quite so much in practice as in aspiration. But this only made her tenderness for him greater. It was scarcely even painful to have to suppose him too generous, too good-natured, too indifferent to sordid considerations. Many persons had held that he carried this indifference too far, especially the large number of those to whom he owed money. Of their opinions, Isabel was never very definitely informed, but it may interest the reader to know that, while they had recognized in the late Mr. Archer a remarkably handsome head and a very taking manner, indeed, as one of them had said, he was always taking something, they had declared that he was making a very poor use of his life. He had squandered a substantial fortune, he had been deplorably convivial, he was known to have gambled freely. A few very harsh critics went so far to say that he had not even brought up his daughters. They had had no regular education and no permanent home. They had been at once spoiled and neglected. They had lived with nursemaids and governesses, usually very bad ones, or had been sent to superficial schools kept by the French, from which, at the end of a month, they had been removed in tears. This view of the matter would have excited Isabel's indignation, for to her own sense her opportunities had been large. Even when her father had left his daughters for three months at Neuchâtel with a French bonne who had eloped with a Russian nobleman staying at the same hotel, even in this irregular situation, an incident of the girl's eleventh year, she had been neither frightened nor ashamed but had thought it a romantic episode in a liberal education. Her father had a large way of looking at life, of which his restlessness and even his occasional incoherency of conduct had been only a proof. He wished his daughters, even his children, to see as much of the world as possible, and it was for this purpose that before Isabel was fourteen he had transported them three times across the Atlantic giving them on each occasion, however, but a few months' view of the subject proposed, a course which had whetted our heroine's curiosity without enabling her to satisfy it. She ought to have been a partisan of her father, for she was the member of his trio who most made up to him for the disagreeables he didn't mention. In his last days, his general willingness to take leave of a world in which the difficulty of doing so as one liked appeared to increase as one grew older, had been sensibly modified by the pain of separation from his clever, his superior, his remarkable girl. Later, when the journeys to Europe had ceased, he still had shown his children all sorts of indulgence, 
and if he had been troubled about money matters, nothing ever disturbed their irreflective consciousness of many possessions. Isabel, though she danced very well, had not the recollection of having been in New York a successful member of the choreographic circle. Her sister Edith was, as everyone said, so very much more fetching. Edith was so striking an example of success that Isabel could have no illusions as to what constituted this advantage, or as to the limits of her own power to frisk and jump and shriek, above all with rightness of effect. Nineteen persons out of twenty, including the younger sister herself, pronounced Edith infinitely the prettier of the two. But the twentieth, besides reversing this judgment, had the entertainment of thinking all the others aesthetic Bulgarians. Isabel had, in the depths of her nature, an even more unquenchable desire to please than Edith. But the depths of this young lady's nature were a very out-of-the-way place, between which and the surface communication was interrupted by a dozen capricious forces. She saw the young men who came in large numbers to see her sister, but as a general thing they were afraid of her. They had a belief that some special preparation was required for talking with her. Her reputation of reading a great deal hung about her like the cloudy envelope of a goddess in an epic. It was supposed to engender difficult questions and to keep the conversation at a low temperature. The poor girl liked to be thought clever, but she hated to be thought bookish. She used to read in secret, and though her memory was excellent, to abstain from showy reference. She had a great desire for knowledge, but she really preferred almost any source of information to the printed page. She had an immense curiosity about life, and was constantly staring and wondering. She carried within herself a great fund of life, and her deepest enjoyment was to feel the continuity between the movements of her own soul and the agitations of the world. For this reason she was fond of seeing great crowds and large stretches of country, of reading about revolutions and wars, of looking at historical pictures, a class of efforts as to which she had often committed the conscious solecism of forgiving them much bad painting for the sake of the subject. While the Civil War was on, she was still a very young girl, but she passed months of this long period in a state of almost passionate excitement, in which she felt herself at times, to her extreme confusion, stirred almost indiscriminately by the valour of either army. Of course the circumspection of suspicious swains had never gone the length of making her a social proscript, for the number of those whose hearts, as they approached her, beat only just fast enough to remind them they had heads as well, had kept her unacquainted with the supreme disciplines of her sex and age. She had had everything a girl could have, kindness, admiration, bonbons, bouquets, the sense of exclusion from none of the privileges of the world she lived in, abundant opportunity for dancing, plenty of new dresses, the London Spectator, the latest publications, the music of Gounod, the poetry of Browning, the prose of George Eliot. These things now, as memory played over them, resolved themselves into a multitude of scenes and figures. Forgotten things came back to her. Many others, which she had lately thought of great moment, dropped out of sight. The result was kaleidoscopic, but the movement of the instrument was checked at last by the servants coming in with the name of a gentleman. The name of the gentleman was Caspar Goodwood. He was a straight young man from Boston, who had known Miss Archer for the last twelve months, and who, thinking her the most beautiful young woman of her time, had pronounced the time, according to the rule I have hinted at, a foolish period of history. He sometimes wrote to her, and had within a week or two written from New York, she had thought it very possible he would come in, had indeed all the rainy day been vaguely expecting him. Now that she learned he was there, nevertheless, she felt no eagerness to receive him. He was the finest young man she had ever seen, and indeed quite a splendid young man. He inspired her with a sentiment of high, of rare respect. 
she had never felt equally moved to it by any other person he was supposed by the world in general to wish to marry her but this of course was between themselves it at least may be affirmed that he had travelled from new york to albany expressly to see her having learned in the former city where he was spending a few days and where he had hoped to find her that she was still at the state capital isabel delayed for some minutes to go to him she moved about the room with a new sense of complications but at last she presented herself and found him standing near the lamp he was tall strong and somewhat stiff he was also lean and brown he was not romantically he was much rather obscurely handsome but his physiognomy had an air of requesting your attention which it rewarded according to the charm you found in the blue eyes of remarkable fixedness the eyes of a complexion other than his own and a jaw of the somewhat angular mould which is supposed to bespeak resolution isabel said to herself that it bespoke resolution to-night in spite of which in half an hour Caspar Goodwood, who had arrived hopeful as well as resolute, took his way back to his lodging with the feeling of a man defeated. He was not, it may be added, a man weakly to accept defeat. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Ralph Touchett was a philosopher, but nevertheless he knocked at his mother's door, at a quarter to seven, with a good deal of eagerness even philosophers have their preferences and it must be admitted that of his progenitors his father ministered most to his sense of the sweetness of filial dependence his father as he had often said to himself was the more motherly his mother on the other hand was paternal and even according to the slang of the day gubernatorial she was nevertheless very fond of her only child and had always insisted on his spending three months of the year with her ralph rendered perfect justice to her affection and knew that in her thoughts and her thoroughly arranged and servanted life his turn always came after the other nearest subjects of her solicitude the various punctualities of performance of the workers of her will he found her completely dressed for dinner but she embraced her boy with her gloved hands and made him sit on the sofa beside her she inquired very scrupulously about her husband's health and about the young man's own and receiving no very brilliant account of either remarked that she was more than ever convinced of her wisdom in not exposing herself to the english climate in this case she also might have given way ralph smiled at the idea of his mother's giving way but made no point of reminding her that his own infirmity was not the result of the english climate from which he absented himself for a considerable part of each year he had been a very small boy when his father daniel tracy touchett a native of rutland in the state of vermont came to england a subordinate partner in a banking-house where some ten years later he gained preponderant control daniel touchett saw before him a lifelong residence in his adopted country of which from the first he took a simple sane and accommodating view but as he said to himself he had no intention of disamericanizing nor had he a desire to teach his only son any such subtle art it had been for himself so very soluble a problem to live in england assimilated yet unconverted that it seemed to him equally simple his lawful heir should after his death carry on the grey old bank in the white american light he was at pains to intensify this light however by sending the boy home for his education ralph spent several terms at an american school and took a degree at an american university after which as he struck his father on his return as even redundantly native he was placed for some three years in residence at oxford oxford swallowed up harvard and ralph became at last english enough his outward conformity to the manners that surrounded him was none the less the mask of a mind that greatly enjoyed its independence on which nothing long imposed itself and which naturally inclined to adventure and irony indulged in a boundless liberty of appreciation 
He began with being a young man of promise. At Oxford he distinguished himself to his father's ineffable satisfaction, and the people about him said it was a thousand pities so clever a fellow should be shut out from a career. He might have had a career by returning to his own country, though this point is shrouded in uncertainty, and even if Mr. Touchett had been willing to part with him, which was not the case, it would have gone hard with him to put a watery waste permanently between himself and the old man whom he regarded as his best friend. Ralph was not only fond of his father, he admired him. He enjoyed the opportunity of observing him. Daniel Touchett, to his perception, was a man of genius, and though he himself had no aptitude for the banking mystery, he made a point of learning enough of it to measure the great figure his father had played. It was not this, however, he mainly relished. It was the fine ivory surface, polished as by the English air, that the old man had opposed to possibilities of penetration. Daniel Touchett had been neither at Harvard nor at Oxford, and it was his own fault if he had placed in his son's hands the key to modern criticism. Ralph, whose head was full of ideas, which his father had never guessed, had a high esteem for the latter's originality. Americans, rightly or wrongly, are commended for the ease with which they adapt themselves to foreign conditions, but Mr. Touchett had made of the very limits of his pliancy half the ground of his general success. He had retained in their freshness most of his marks of primary pressure. His tone, as his son always noted with pleasure, was that of the more luxuriant parts of New England. At the end of his life he had become, on his own ground, as mellow as he was rich. He combined consummate shrewdness with the disposition superficially to fraternize, and his social position, on which he had never wasted a care, had the firm perfection of an unthumbed fruit. It was perhaps his want of imagination and of what is called the historic consciousness, but to many of the impressions usually made by English life upon the cultivated stranger, his sense was completely closed. There were certain differences he had never perceived, certain habits he had never formed, certain obscurities he had never sounded. As regards these latter, on the day he had sounded them, his son would have thought less well of him. Ralph, on leaving Oxford, had spent a couple of years in travelling, after which he had found himself perched on a high stool in his father's bank. The responsibility and honour of such positions is not, I believe, measured by the height of the stool, which depends upon other considerations. Ralph, indeed, who had very long legs, was fond of standing, and even of walking about at his work. To this exercise, however, he was obliged to devote but a limited period, for at the end of some eighteen months he had become aware of his being seriously out of health. He had caught a violent cold which fixed itself on his lungs, and threw them into dire confusion. He had to give up work and apply to the letter the sorry injunction to take care of himself. At first he slighted the task. It appeared to him it was not himself in the least he was taking care of, but an uninteresting and uninterested person with whom he had nothing in common. This person, however, improved on acquaintance, and Ralph grew at last to have a certain grudging tolerance, even an undemonstrative respect for him. Misfortune makes strange bedfellows, and our young man, feeling that he had something at stake in the matter, it usually struck him as his reputation for ordinary wit, devoted to his graceless charge an amount of attention of which note was duly taken, and which had at least the effect of keeping the poor fellow alive. One of his lungs began to heal, the other promised to follow its example, and he was assured that he might outweather a dozen winters if he would betake himself to those climates in which consumptives chiefly congregate. As he had grown extremely fond of London, he cursed the flatness of exile, but at the same time that he cursed, he conformed, and gradually, when he found his sensitive organ grateful even for grim favours, he conferred them with a lighter hand. He wintered abroad, as the phrase is, 
basked in the sun, stopped at home when the wind blew, went to bed when it rained, and once or twice when it had snowed overnight, almost never got up again. A secret hoard of indifference, like a thick cake a fond old nurse might have slipped into his first school outfit, came to his aid and helped to reconcile him to sacrifice, since at best he was too ill for aught but that arduous game. As he said to himself, there was really nothing he had wanted very much to do, so that he had at least not renounced the field of valour. At present, however, the fragrance of forbidden fruit seemed occasionally to float past him and remind him that the finest of pleasures is the rush of action. Living as he now lived was like reading a good book in a poor translation, a meagre entertainment for a young man who felt that he might have been an excellent linguist. He had good winters and poor winters, and while the former lasted he was sometimes the sport of a vision of virtual recovery. But this vision was dispelled some three years before the occurrence of the incidents with which this history opens. He had on that occasion remained later than usual in England, and had been overtaken by bad weather before reaching Algiers. He arrived more dead than alive, and lay there for several weeks between life and death. His convalescence was a miracle, but the first use he made of it was to assure himself that such miracles happened but once. He said to himself that his hour was in sight, and that it behooved him to keep his eyes upon it, yet that it was also open to him to spend the interval as agreeably as might be consistent with such a preoccupation. With the prospect of losing them, the simple use of his faculties became an exquisite pleasure. It seemed to him the joys of contemplation had never been sounded. He was far from the time when he had found it hard that he should be obliged to give up the idea of distinguishing himself, an idea nonetheless importunate for being vague, and nonetheless delightful for having had to struggle in the same breast with bursts of inspiring self-criticism. His friends at present judged him more cheerful, and attributed to a theory, over which they shook their heads knowingly, that he would recover his health. His serenity was but the array of wild flowers niched in his ruin. It was very probably this sweet-tasting property of the observed thing in itself that was mainly concerned in Ralph's quickly stirred interest in the advent of a young lady who was evidently not insipid. If he was consideringly disposed, something told him, here was occupation enough for a succession of days. It may be added, in summary, that the imagination of loving, as distinguished from that of being loved, had still a place in his reduced sketch. He had only forbidden himself the riot of expression. However, he shouldn't inspire his cousin with a passion, nor would she be able, even should she try, to help him to one. And now, tell me about the young lady, he said to his mother. What do you mean to do with her? Mrs. Touchett was prompt. I mean to ask your father to invite her to stay three or four weeks at Garden Court. You needn't stand on any such ceremony as that, said Ralph. My father will ask her as a matter of course. I don't know about that. She's my niece. She's not his. Good Lord, dear mother, what a sense of property! That's all the more reason for his asking her. But after that, I mean after three months, for it's absurd asking the poor girl to remain but for three or four paltry weeks, what do you mean to do with her? I mean to take her to Paris. I mean to get her clothing. Ah, yes, that's of course. But independently of that? I shall invite her to spend the autumn with me in Florence. You don't rise above detail, dear mother, said Ralph. I should like to know what you mean to do with her in a general way. My duty, Mrs. Touchett declared. I suppose you pity her very much, she added. No, I don't think I pity her. She doesn't strike me as inviting compassion. I think I envy her. Before being sure, however, give me a hint of where you see your duty. In showing her four European countries, I shall leave her the choice of two of them, and in giving her the opportunity of perfecting herself in French, 
which he already knows very well. Ralph frowned a little. That sounds rather dry, even allowing her the choice of two of the countries. If it's dry, said his mother with a laugh, you can leave Isabel alone to water it. She is as good as a summer rain any day. Do you mean she's a gifted being? I don't know whether she's a gifted being, but she's a clever girl, with a strong will and a high temper. She has no idea of being bored. I can imagine that, said Ralph. And then he added abruptly, How do you two get on? Do you mean by that that I'm a bore? I don't think she finds me one. Some girls might, I know, but Isabel's too clever for that. I think I greatly amuse her. We get on because I understand her. I know the sort of girl she is. She's very frank, and I'm very frank. We know just what to expect of each other. Ah, dear mother, Ralph exclaimed, one always knows what to expect of you. You've never surprised me but once, and that's today, in presenting me with a pretty cousin whose existence I had never suspected. Do you think her so very pretty? Very pretty indeed, but I don't insist upon that. It's her general air of being someone in particular that strikes me. Who is this rare creature, and what is she? Where did you find her, and how did you make her acquaintance? I found her in an old house at Albany, sitting in a dreary room on a rainy day, reading a heavy book and boring herself to death. She didn't know she was bored, but when I left her no doubt of it, she seemed very grateful for the service. You may say I shouldn't have enlightened her. I should have let her alone. There's a good deal in that, but I acted conscientiously. I thought she was meant for something better. It occurred to me that it would be a kindness to take her about and introduce her to the world. She thinks she knows a great deal of it, like most American girls. But like most American girls, she's ridiculously mistaken. If you want to know, I thought she would do me credit. I like to be well thought of, and for a woman of my age there's no greater convenience in some ways than an attractive niece. You know I had seen nothing of my sister's children for years. I disapproved entirely of the father. But I always meant to do something for them when he should have gone to his reward. I ascertained where they were to be found, and without any preliminaries, went and introduced myself. There were two others of them, both of whom are married, but I saw only the elder, who has, by the way, a very uncivil husband. The wife, whose name is Lily, jumped at the idea of my taking an interest in Isabel. She said it was just what her sister needed, that someone should take an interest in her. She spoke of her as you might speak of some young person of genius, in want of encouragement and patronage. It may be that Isabel's a genius, but in that case I've not yet learned her special line. Mrs. Ludlow was especially keen about my taking her to Europe. They all regard Europe over there as the land of emigration, of rescue, a refuge for their superfluous population. Isabel herself seemed very glad to come, and the thing was easily arranged. There was a little difficulty about the money question, as she seemed averse to being under pecuniary obligations. But she has a small income, and she supposes herself to be travelling at her own expense. Ralph had listened attentively to this judicious report, by which his interest in the subject of it was not impaired. Ah, if she's a genius, he said, we must find out her special line. Is it by chance for flirting? I don't think so. You may suspect that at first, but you'll be wrong. You won't, I think, in any way, be easily right about her. Warburton's wrong, then. Ralph rejoicingly exclaimed. He flatters himself that he has made that discovery. His mother shook her head. Lord Warburton won't understand her. He needn't try. He's very intelligent, said Ralph, but it's right he should be puzzled once in a while. Isabel will enjoy puzzling a lord, Mrs. Touchett remarked. Her son frowned a little. What does she know about lords? Nothing at all. That will puzzle him all the more. Ralph greeted these words with a laugh and looked out the window. Then, 
"'Are you not going down to see my father?' he asked. "'At a quarter to eight, said Mrs. Touchett. Her son looked at his watch. "'You've another quarter of an hour, then. Tell me some more about Isabel.' After which, as Mrs. Touchett declined his invitation, declaring that he must find out for himself, well, he pursued, she'll certainly do you credit, but won't she also give you trouble? I hope not, but if she does, I shall not shrink from it. I never do that. She strikes me as very natural, said Ralph. Natural people are not the most trouble. No, said Ralph, you yourself are a proof of that. You're extremely natural, and I'm sure you have never troubled anyone. It takes trouble to do that. But tell me this. It just occurs to me. Is Isabel capable of making herself disagreeable? Ah, cried his mother, you ask too many questions. Find that out for yourself. His questions, however, were not exhausted. All this time, he said, you've not told me what you intend to do with her. Do with her? You talk as if she were a yard of calico. I shall do absolutely nothing with her, and she herself will do everything she chooses. She gave me notice of that. What you meant, then, in your telegram, was that her character's independent. I never know what I mean in my telegrams, especially those I send from America. Clearness is too expensive. Come down to your father. It's not yet a quarter to eight, said Ralph. I must allow for his impatience, Mrs. Touchett answered. Ralph knew what to think of his father's impatience, but making no rejoinder, he offered his mother his arm. This put it in his power, as they descended together, to stop her a moment on the middle landing of the staircase, the broad, low, wide-armed staircase of time-blackened oak, which was one of the most striking features of Garden Court. You've no plan of marrying her, he smiled. Marrying her? I should be sorry to play her such a trick. But apart from that, she's perfectly able to marry herself. She has every facility. Do you mean to say she has a husband picked out? I don't know about a husband, but there's a young man in Boston. Ralph went on. He had no desire to hear about the young man in Boston. As my father says, they're always engaged. His mother had told him that he must satisfy his curiosity at the source, and it soon became evident he should not want for occasion. He had a good deal of talk with his young kinswoman when the two had been left together in the drawing-room. Lord Warburton, who had ridden over from his own house some ten miles distant, remounted and took his departure before dinner, and an hour after this meal was ended, Mr. and Mrs. Touchett, who appeared to have quite emptied the measure of their forms, withdrew, under the valid pretext of fatigue, to their respective apartments. The young man spent an hour with his cousin. Though she had been travelling half the day, she appeared in no degree spent. She was really tired, she knew it, and knew she should pay for it on the morrow. But it was her habit at this period to carry exhaustion to its furthest point, and confessed to it only when dissimulation broke down. A fine hypocrisy was for the present possible. She was interested. She was, as she said to herself, floated. She asked Ralph to show her the pictures. There were a great many in the house, most of them of his own choosing. The best were arranged in an oaken gallery of charming proportions, which had a sitting-room at either end of it, and which in the evening was usually lighted. The light was insufficient to show the pictures to advantage, and the visit might have stood over to the morrow. This suggestion Ralph had ventured to make, but Isabel looked disappointed, smiling still, however, and said, "'If you please, I should like to see them just a little.' She was eager, she knew she was eager, and now seemed so. She couldn't help it. "'She doesn't take suggestions,' Ralph said to himself, but he said it without irritation. Her pressure amused and even pleased him. The lamps were on brackets at intervals, and if the light was imperfect it was genial. It fell upon the vague squares of rich colour, and on the faded gilding of heavy frames. It made a sheen on the polished floor of the gallery. Ralph took a candlestick, and moved about, pointing out the things he liked. 
Isabel, inclining to one picture after another, indulged in little exclamations and murmurs. She was evidently a judge. She had a natural taste. He was struck with that. She took a candlestick herself and held it slowly here and there. She lifted it high, and as she did so, he found himself pausing in the middle of the place and bending his eyes much less upon the pictures than on her presence. He lost nothing in truth by these wandering glances, for she was better worth looking at than most works of art. She was undeniably spare, unponderably light, and provably tall. When people had wished to distinguish her from the other two Miss Archers, they had always called her the willowy one. Her hair, which was dark even to blackness, had been an object of envy to many women. Her light grey eyes, a little too firm perhaps in her graver moments, had an enchanting range of concession. They walked slowly up one side of the gallery and down the other, and then she said, Well, now I know more than I did when I began. You apparently have a great passion for knowledge, her cousin returned. I think I have. Most girls are horridly ignorant. You strike me as different from most girls. Ah, some of them would, but the way they're talked about, murmured Isabel, who preferred not to dilate just yet on herself. Then, in a moment, to change the subject, please tell me, isn't there a ghost? She went on. A ghost? A castle spectre, a thing that appears. We call them ghosts in America. So we do here when we see them. You do see them, then? You ought to in this romantic old house. It's not a romantic old house, said Ralph. You'll be disappointed if you count on that. It's a dismally prosaic one. There's no romance here, but what you may have brought with you. I've brought a great deal, but it seems to me I've brought it to the right place. To keep it out of harm, certainly. Nothing will ever happen to it here, between my father and me. Isabel looked at him for a moment. Is there never any one here but your father and you? Uh, my mother, of course. Oh, I know your mother. She's not romantic. Haven't you other people? Very few. I'm sorry for that. I like so much to see people. Oh, we'll invite all the county to amuse you, said Ralph. Now you're making fun of me, the girl answered rather gravely. Who was the gentleman on the lawn when I arrived? A uh, county neighbor. He doesn't come very often. I'm sorry for that. I liked him, said Isabel. Why, it seemed to me that you barely spoke to him, Ralph objected. Never mind. I like him all the same. I like your father, too, immensely. You can't do better than that. He's the dearest of the dear. I'm so sorry he's ill, said Isabel. You must help me to nurse him. You ought to be a good nurse. I don't think I am. I've been told I'm not. I'm said to have too many theories. But you haven't told me about the ghost, she added. Ralph, however, gave no heed to this observation. You like my father, and you like Lord Warburton. I infer also that you like my mother. I like your mother very much, because, because, and Isabel found herself attempting to assign a reason for her affection for Mrs. Touchett. Ah, we never know why, said her companion, laughing. I always know, the girl answered. It's because she doesn't expect one to like her. She doesn't care whether one does or not. So you adore her, out of perversity? Well, I take greatly after my mother, said Ralph. I don't believe you do at all. You wish people to like you, and you try to make them do it. Good heavens, how you see through one, he cried, with a dismay that was not altogether jocular. But I like you all the same, his cousin went on. The way to clinch the matter will be to show me the ghost. Ralph shook his head sadly. I might show it to you, but you'd never see it. The privilege isn't given to every one. It's not enviable. It has never been seen by a young, happy, innocent person like you. You must have suffered first, have suffered greatly, have gained some miserable knowledge. In that way, your eyes are open to it. I saw it long ago, said Ralph. I told you just now I'm very fond of knowledge, Isabel answered. 
Yes, of happy knowledge, of pleasant knowledge. But you haven't suffered, and you're not made to suffer. I hope you'll never see the ghost. She had listened to him attentively, with a smile on her lips, but with a certain gravity in her eyes. Charming as he found her, she had struck him as rather presumptuous. Indeed, it was a part of her charm, and he wondered what she would say. "'I'm not afraid, you know,' she said, which seemed quite presumptuous enough. "'You're not afraid of suffering?' "'Yes, I'm afraid of suffering, but I'm not afraid of ghosts. And I think people suffer too easily,' she said. "'I don't believe you do,' said Ralph, looking at her with his hands in his pockets. "'I don't think that's a fault,' she answered. "'It's not absolutely necessary to suffer. We were not made for that.' "'You were not, certainly.' "'I'm not speaking of myself,' and she wandered off a little. "'No, it isn't a fault,' said her cousin. "'It's a merit to be strong.' "'Only, if you don't suffer, they call you hard,' Isabel remarked. They passed out of the smaller drawing-room, into which they had returned from the gallery, and paused in the hall at the foot of the staircase. Here Ralph presented his companion with her bedroom candle, which he had taken from a niche. "'Never mind what they call you. When you do suffer, they call you an idiot. The great point's to be as happy as possible.' She looked at him a little. She had taken her candle and placed her foot on the oaken stair. "'Well,' she said, "'that's what I came to Europe for, to be as happy as possible. Good night.' "'Good night. I wish you all success, and shall be very glad to contribute to it.' She turned away, and he watched her as she slowly ascended. Then, with his hands always in his pockets, he went back to the empty drawing-room. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 and 7 of Portrait of a Lady by Henry James》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Isabel Archer was a young person of many theories. Her imagination was remarkably active. It had been her fortune to possess a finer mind than most of the persons among whom her lot was cast, to have a larger perception of surrounding facts, and to care for knowledge that was tinged with the unfamiliar. It was true that among her contemporaries she passed for a young woman of extraordinary profundity, for these excellent people never withheld their admiration from a reach of intellect of which they themselves were not conscious, and spoke of Isabel as a prodigy of learning, a creature reported to have read the classic authors, in translations. Her paternal aunt, Mrs. Varian, once spread the rumour that Isabel was writing a book, Mrs. Varian having a reverence for books, and averred that the girl would distinguish herself in print. Mrs. Varian thought highly of literature, for which she entertained that esteem that is connected with a sense of privation. Her own large house, remarkable for its assortment of mosaic tables and decorated ceilings, was unfurnished with a library, and in the way of printed volumes contained nothing but half a dozen novels and paper on a shelf in the apartment of one of the Miss Varians. Practically, Mrs. Varian's acquaintance with literature was confined to the New York interviewer. As she very justly said, after you had read the interviewer, you had lost all faith in culture. Her tendency with this was rather to keep the interviewer out of the way of her daughters. She was determined to bring them up properly, and they read nothing at all. Her impression with regard to Isabel's labours was quite illusory. The girl had never attempted to write a book, and had no desire for the laurels of authorship. She had no talent for expression, and too little of the consciousness of genius. She only had a general idea that people were right when they treated her as if she were rather superior. Whether or no she were superior, people were right in admiring her if they thought her so, for it seemed to her often that her mind moved more quickly than theirs, and this encouraged an impatience that might easily be confounded with superiority. It may be affirmed without delay that Isabel was probably very liable to the sin of self-esteem. She often surveyed with complacency the field of her own nature. 
she was in the habit of taking for granted on scanty evidence that she was right she treated herself to occasions of homage meanwhile her errors and delusions were frequently such as a biographer interested in preserving the dignity of his subject must shrink from specifying her thoughts were a tangle of vague outlines which had never been corrected by the judgment of people speaking with authority in matters of opinion she had had her own way and it had led her into a thousand ridiculous zigzags at moments she discovered she was grotesquely wrong and then she treated herself to a week of passionate humility after this she held her head higher than ever again for it was of no use she had an unquenchable desire to think well of herself she had a theory that it was only under this provision life was worth living that one should be one of the best should be conscious of a fine organization she couldn't help knowing her organization was fine should move in a realm of light of natural wisdom of happy impulse of inspiration gracefully chronic it was almost as necessary to cultivate doubt of one's self as to cultivate doubt of one's best friend one should try to be one's own best friend and to give one's self in this manner distinguished company the girl had a certain nobleness of imagination which rendered her a good many services and played her a great many tricks she spent half her time in thinking of beauty and bravery and magnanimity she had a fixed determination to regard the world as a place of brightness of free expansion of irresistible action she held it must be detestable to be afraid or ashamed she had an infinite hope that she should never do anything wrong she had resented so strongly after discovering them her mere errors of feeling the discovery always made her tremble as if she had escaped from a trap which might have caught her and smothered her that the chance of inflicting a sensible injury upon another person presented only as a contingency caused her at moments to hold her breath that always struck her as the worst thing that could happen to her on the whole reflectively she was in no uncertainty about the things that were wrong she had no love of their look but when she fixed them hard she recognized them it was wrong to be mean to be jealous to be false to be cruel she had seen very little of the evil of the world but she had seen women who lied and who tried to hurt each other seeing such things had quickened her high spirit it seemed indecent not to scorn them of course the danger of a high spirit was the danger of inconsistency the danger of keeping up the flag after the place is surrendered a sort of behaviour so crooked as to be almost a dishonour to the flag but isabel who knew little of the sorts of artillery to which young women are exposed flattered herself that such contradictions would never be noted in her own conduct her life should always be in harmony with the most pleasing impression she should produce she would be what she appeared and she would appear what she was sometimes she went so far as to wish that she might find herself some day in a difficult position so that they should have the pleasure of being as heroic as the occasion demanded altogether with her meagre knowledge her inflated ideals her confidence at once innocent and dogmatic her temper at once exacting and indulgent her mixture of curiosity and fastidiousness of vivacity and indifference her desire to look very well and to be if possible even better her determination to see to try to know her combination of the delicate desultory flame-like spirit and the eager and personal creature of conditions she would be an easy victim of scientific criticism if she were not intended to awaken on the reader's part an impulse more tender and more purely expectant it was one of her theories that isabel archer was very fortunate in being independent and that she ought to make some very enlightened use of that state she never called it the state of solitude much less of singleness she thought such descriptions weak and besides her sister lily constantly urged her to come and abide she had a friend whose acquaintance she had made shortly before her father's death who offered so high an example of useful activity that isabel always thought of her as a model henrietta stackpole 
had the advantage of an admired ability, she was thoroughly launched in journalism, and her letters to the interviewer, from Washington, Newport, the White Mountains, and other places, were universally quoted. Isabel pronounced them with confidence ephemeral, but she esteemed the courage, energy, and good humor of the writer, who, without parents and without property, had adopted three of the children of an infirm and widowed sister, and was paying their school bills out of the proceeds of her literary labor. Henrietta was in the van of progress and had clear-cut ideas on most subjects. Her cherished desire had long been to come to Europe, and to write a series of letters to the interviewer from the radical point of view. An enterprise the less difficult, as she knew perfectly in advance what her opinions would be, and to how many objections most European institutions lay open. When she heard that Isabel was coming, she wished to start at once thinking naturally that it would be delightful the two should travel together she had been obliged however to postpone this enterprise she thought isabel a glorious creature and had spoken of her covertly in some of her letters though she never mentioned the fact to her friend who would not have taken pleasure in it and was not a regular student of the interviewer henrietta for isabel was chiefly a proof that a woman might suffice to herself and be happy her resources were of the obvious kind, but even if one had not the journalistic talent and a genius for guessing, as Henrietta said, what the public was going to want, one was not therefore to conclude that one had no vocation, no beneficent aptitude of any sort, and resign oneself to being frivolous and hollow. Isabel was stoutly determined not to be hollow. If one should wait with the right patience, one would find some happy work to one's hand. Of course, among her theories, this young lady was not without a collection of views on the subject of marriage. The first on the list was a conviction of the vulgarity of thinking too much of it. From lapsing into eagerness on this point, she earnestly prayed she might be delivered. She held that a woman ought to be able to live to herself, in the absence of exceptional flimsiness, and that it was perfectly possible to be happy without the society of a more or less coarse-minded person of another sex. The girl's prayer was very sufficiently answered. Something pure and proud that there was in her, something cold and dry, an unappreciated suitor with a taste for analysis might have called it, had hitherto kept her from any great vanity of conjecture on the article of possible husbands. Few of the men she saw seemed worth a ruinous expenditure, and it made her smile to think that one of them should present himself as an incentive to hope and a reward of patience. Deep in her soul, it was the deepest thing there, lay a belief that if a certain light should dawn, she could give herself completely, but this image on the whole was too formidable to be attractive. Isabel's thoughts hovered about it, but they seldom rested on it long. After a little, it ended in alarms. It often seemed to her that she thought too much about herself. You could have made her color any day in the year by calling her a rank egoist. She was always planning out her development, desiring her perfection, observing her progress. Her nature had, in her conceit, a certain garden-like quality, a suggestion of perfume and murmuring boughs, of shady bowers and lengthening vistas, which made her feel that introspection was, after all, an exercise in the open air, and that a visit to the recesses of one's spirit was harmless when one returned from it with a lapful of roses. But she was often reminded that there were other gardens in the world than those of her remarkable soul, and that there were moreover a great many places which were not gardens at all, only dusky pestiferous tracts, planted thick with ugliness and misery. In the current of that repaid curiosity on which he had lately been floating, which had conveyed her to this beautiful old England, and might carry her much further still, she often checked herself with the thought of the thousands of people who were less happy than herself a thought which for the moment made her fine, full consciousness appear a kind of immodesty. What should one do with the misery of the world in a scheme of the agreeable for oneself? 
it must be confessed that this question never held her long she was too young too impatient to live too unacquainted with pain she always returned to her theory that a young woman whom after all every one thought clever should begin by getting a general impression of life this impression was necessary to prevent mistakes and after it should be secured she might make the unfortunate condition of others a subject of special attention england was a revelation to her and she found herself as diverted as a child at a pantomime in her infantine excursions to europe she had seen only the continent and had seen it from the nursery window paris not london was her father's mecca and into many of interests there his children had naturally not entered the images of that time moreover had grown faint and remote and the old world quality in everything that she now saw had all the charm of strangeness her uncle's house seemed a picture made real no refinement of the agreeable was lost upon isabel the rich perfection of garden court at once revealed a world and gratified a need the large low rooms with brown ceilings and dusky corners the deep embrasures and curious casements the quiet light on dark polished panels the deep greenness outside that seemed always peeping in the sense of well-ordered privacy in the centre of a property a place where sounds were felicitously accidental where the tread was muffled by the earth itself and in the thick mild air all friction dropped out of contact and all shrillness out of talk these things were much to the taste of our young lady whose taste played a considerable role in her emotions she formed a fast friendship with her uncle and often sat by his chair when he had had it moved out to the lawn he passed hours in the open air sitting with folded hands like a placid homely household god a god of service who had done his work and received his wages and was trying to grow used to weeks and months made up only of off days isabel amused him more than she suspected the effect she produced upon people was often different from what she supposed and he frequently gave himself the pleasure of making her chatter it was by this term that he qualified her conversation which had much of the point observable in that of the young ladies of her country to whom the ear of the world is more directly presented than to their sisters in other lands like the mass of american girls isabel had been encouraged to express herself her remarks had been attended to she had been expected to have emotions and opinions many of her opinions had doubtless but a slender value many of her emotions passed away in the utterance but they had left a trace in giving her the habit of seeming at least to feel and think and in imparting moreover to her words when she was really touched that prompt vividness which so many people had regarded as a sign of superiority mr touchett used to think that she reminded him of his wife when his wife was in her teens it was because she was fresh and natural and quick to understand to speak so many characteristics of her niece that he had fallen in love with mrs touchett he never expressed this analogy to the girl herself however for if mrs touchett had once been like isabel isabel was not at all like mrs touchett the old man was full of kindness for her it was a long time as he said since they had had any young life in the house and our rustling quickly moving clear-voiced heroine was as agreeable to his sense as the sound of flowing water he wanted to do something for her and wished she would ask it of him she would ask nothing but questions it is true that of these she asked a quantity her uncle had a great fund of answers though her pressure sometimes came in forms that puzzled him she questioned him immensely about england about the british constitution the english character the state of politics the manners and customs of the royal family the peculiarities of the aristocracy the way of living and thinking of his neighbours and in begging to be enlightened on these points she usually inquired whether they corresponded with the descriptions in the books 
The old man always looked at her a little with his fine dry smile, while he smoothed down the shawl spread across his legs. The books, he once said, well, I don't know much about the books. You must ask Ralph about that. I've always ascertained for myself, got my information in the natural form. I never asked many questions, even. I just kept quiet and took notice. Of course, I've had very good opportunities, better than what a young lady would naturally have. I'm of an inquisitive disposition, though you mightn't think it if you were to watch me. However much you might watch me, I should be watching you more. I've been watching these people for upwards of thirty-five years, and I don't hesitate to say that I've acquired considerable information. It's a very fine country on the whole, finer perhaps than what we give it credit for on the other side. There are several improvements I should like to see introduced, but the necessity of them doesn't seem to be generally felt as yet. When the necessity of a thing is generally felt, they usually manage to accomplish it, but they seem to feel pretty comfortable about waiting till then. I certainly feel more at home among them than I expected to when I first came over. I suppose it's because I've had a considerable degree of success. When you're successful, you naturally feel more at home. Do you suppose that if I'm successful, I shall feel at home? Isabel asked. I should think it very probable, and you certainly will be successful. They like American young ladies very much over here. They show them a great deal of kindness. But you mustn't feel too much at home, you know. Oh, I'm by no means sure it will satisfy me, Isabel judicially emphasized. I like the place very much, but I'm not sure I shall like the people. The people are very good people, especially if you like them. I've no doubt they're good, Isabel rejoined. But are they pleasant in society? They won't rob me nor beat me, but will they make themselves agreeable to me? That's what I like people to do. I don't hesitate to say so, because I always appreciate it. I don't believe they're very nice to girls. They're not nice to them in the novels. I don't know about the novels, said Mr. Touchett. I believe the novels have a great deal of ability, but I don't suppose they're very accurate. We once had a lady who wrote novels staying here. She was a friend of Ralph's, and he asked her down. She was very positive, quite up to everything, but she was not the sort of person you could depend on for evidence. Too free a fancy, I suppose that was it. She afterwards published a work of fiction in which she was understood to have given a representation, something in the nature of a caricature, as you might say, of my unworthy self. I didn't read it but Ralph just handed me the book with the principal passages marked. It was understood to be a description of my conversation. American peculiarities, nasal twang, Yankee notions, stars and stripes. Well, it was not at all accurate. She couldn't have listened very attentively. I had no objection to her giving a report of my conversation if she liked, but I didn't like the idea that she hadn't taken the trouble to listen to it. Of course, I talk like an American. I can't talk like a Hottentot. However I talk, I've made them understand me pretty well over here. But I don't talk like the old gentleman in that lady's novel. He wasn't an American. We wouldn't have him over there at any price. I just mention that fact to show you that they're not always accurate. Of course, as I've no daughters, and as Mrs. Touchett resides in Florence, I haven't had much chance to notice about the young ladies. It sometimes appears as if the young women in the lower class were not very well treated, but I guess their position is better in the upper, and even to some extent in the middle. Gracious, Isabel exclaimed. How many classes have they? About fifty, I suppose. Well, I don't know that I ever counted them. I never took much notice of the classes. That's the advantage of being an American here. You don't belong to any class. I hope so, said Isabel. Imagine one's belonging to an English class. Well, I guess some of them are pretty comfortable, especially towards the top. But for me, there are only two classes, the people I trust and the people I don't. Of those two, my dear Isabel, you belong to the first. I'm much obliged to you, said the girl quickly. Her way of taking compliments seemed sometimes rather dry. She got rid of them as rapidly as possible. But as regards this she was sometimes misjudged. 
she was thought insensible to them whereas in fact she was simply unwilling to show how infinitely they pleased her to show that was to show too much i'm sure the english are very conventional she added they've got everything pretty well fixed mr touchett admitted it's all settled beforehand they don't leave it to the last moment i don't like to have everything settled beforehand said the girl i like more unexpectedness her uncle seemed amused at her distinctness of preference well it's settled beforehand that you'll have great success he rejoined i suppose you'll like that i shall not have success if they're too stupidly conventional i'm not in the least stupidly conventional i'm just the contrary that's what they won't like no no you're all wrong said the old man you can't tell what they'll like they're very inconsistent that's their principal interest ah well said isabel standing before her uncle with her hands clasped about the belt of her black dress and looking up and down the lawn that will suit me perfectly end of chapter six chapter seven the two amused themselves time and time again with talking of the attitude of the british public as if the young lady had been in a position to appeal to it but in fact the british public remained for the present profoundly indifferent to miss isabel archer whose fortune had dropped her as her cousin said into the dullest house in england her gouty uncle received very little company and mrs touchett not having cultivated relations with her husband's neighbours was not warranted in expecting visits from them she had however a peculiar taste she liked to receive cards for what is usually called social intercourse she had very little relish but nothing pleased her more than to find her hall table whitened with oblong morsels of symbolic pasteboard she flattered herself that she was a very just woman and had mastered the sovereign truth that nothing in this world is got for nothing she had played no social part as mistress of garden court and it was not to be supposed that in the surrounding country a minute account should be kept of her comings and goings but it is by no means certain that she did not feel it to be wrong that so little notice was taken of them and that her failure really very gratuitous to make herself important in the neighbourhood had not much to do with the acrimony of her allusions to her husband's adopted country isabel presently found herself in the singular situation of defending the british constitution against her aunt mrs touchett having formed the habit of sticking pins into this venerable instrument isabel always felt an impulse to pull out the pins not that she imagined they inflicted any damage on the tough old parchment but because it seemed to her her aunt might make better use of her sharpness she was very critical herself it was incidental to her age her sex and her nationality but she was very sentimental as well and there was something in mrs touchett's dryness that set her own moral fountains flowing now what's your point of view she asked of her aunt when you criticize everything here you should have a point of view yours doesn't seem to be american you thought everything over there so disagreeable when i criticize i have mine it's thoroughly american my dear young lady said mrs touchett there are as many points of view in the world as there are people of sense to take them you may say that doesn't make them very numerous american never in the world that's shockingly narrow my point of view thank god is personal isabel thought this a better answer than she admitted it was a tolerable description of her own manner of judging but it would not have sounded well for her to say so on the lips of a person less advanced in life and less enlightened by experience than mrs touchett such a declaration would savour of immodesty even of arrogance she risked it nevertheless in talking with ralph with whom she talked a great deal and with whom her conversation was of a sort that gave a large license to extravagance her cousin used as the phrase is to chaff her he very soon established with her a reputation for treating everything as a joke and he was not a man to neglect the privileges such a reputation conferred she accused him of an odious want of seriousness 
of laughing at all things, beginning with himself. Such slender faculty of reverence as he possessed centred wholly upon his father. For the rest, he exercised his wit indifferently upon his father's son, this gentleman's weak lungs, his useless life, his fantastic mother, his friends, Lord Warburton in special, his adopted and his native country, his charming new-found cousin. "'I keep a band of music in my ante-room,' he once said to her. "'It has orders to play without stopping. It renders me two excellent services. It keeps the sounds of the world from reaching the private apartments, and it makes the world think that dancing's going on within.' It was dance music, indeed, that you usually heard when you came within earshot of Ralph's band. The liveliest waltzes seemed to float upon the air. Isabel often found herself irritated by this perpetual fiddling. She would have liked to pass through the ante-room, as her cousin called it, and enter the private apartments. It mattered little that he had assured her they were a very dismal place. She would have been glad to undertake to sweep them and set them in order. It was but half hospitality to let her remain outside, to punish him for which Isabel administered innumerable taps with the ferrule of her straight young wit. It must be said that her wit was exercised to a large extent in self-defence, for her cousin amused himself with calling her Columbia, and accusing her of a patriotism so heated that it scorched. He drew a caricature of her, in which she was represented as a very pretty young woman, dressed on the lines of the prevailing fashion, in the folds of the national banner. Isabel's chief dread in life, at this period of her development, was that she should appear narrow-minded. What she feared next afterwards was that she should really be so. But she nevertheless made no scruple of abounding in her cousin's sense, and pretending to sigh for the charms of her native land. She would be as American as it pleased him to regard her, and if he chose to laugh at her, she would give him plenty of occupation. She defended England against his mother, but when Ralph sang its praises, on purpose, as she said, to work her up, she found herself able to differ from him on a variety of points. In fact, the quality of this small, ripe country seemed as sweet to her as the taste of an October pear, and her satisfaction was at the root of the good spirits which enabled her to take her cousin's chaff and return it in kind. If her good humour flagged at moments, it was not because she thought herself ill-used, but because she suddenly felt sorry for Ralph. It seemed to her he was talking as a blind and had little heart in what he said. "'I don't know what's the matter with you,' she observed to him once, "'but I suspect you're a great humbug.' "'That's your privilege,' Ralph answered, who had not been used to being so crudely addressed. "'I don't know what you care for. I don't think you care for anything. You don't really care for England when you praise it. You don't care for America even when you pretend to abuse it.' "'I care for nothing but you, dear cousin,' said Ralph. If I could believe even that, I should be very glad. Ah, well, I should hope so, the young man exclaimed. Isabel might have believed it, and not have been far from the truth. He thought a great deal about her. She was constantly present to his mind. At a time when his thoughts had been a good deal of a burden to him, her sudden arrival, which promised nothing, and was an open-handed gift of fate, had refreshed and quickened them, given them wings and something to fly for. Poor Ralph had been for many weeks steeped in melancholy. His outlook, habitually sombre, lay under the shadow of a deeper cloud. He had grown anxious about his father, whose gout, hitherto confined to his legs, had begun to ascend into regions more vital. The old man had been gravely ill in the spring, and the doctors had whispered to Ralph that another attack would be less easy to deal with. Just now he appeared disburdened of pain, but Ralph could not rid himself of a suspicion that this was a subterfuge of the enemy who was waiting to take him off his guard. If the manoeuvre should succeed, there would be little hope of any great resistance. Ralph had always taken for granted that his father would survive him, that his own name would be the first grimly called. 
The father and son had been close companions, and the idea of being left alone with the remnant of a tasteless life on his hands was not gratifying to the young man, who had always and tacitly counted upon his elder's help in making the best of a poor business. At the prospect of losing his great motive, Ralph lost indeed his one inspiration. If they might die at the same time, it would be all very well, but without the encouragement of his father's society, he should barely have patience to await his own turn. He had not the incentive of feeling that he was indispensable to his mother. It was a rule with his mother to have no regrets. He bethought himself, of course, that it had been a small kindness to his father to wish that, of the two, the active rather than the passive party should know the felt wound. He remembered that the old man had always treated his own forecast of an early end as a clever fallacy, which he should be delighted to discredit so far as he might by dying first. But of the two triumphs, that of refuting a sophistical son, and that of holding on a while longer in a state of being which, with all abatements he enjoyed, Ralph deemed it no sin to hope the latter might be vouchsafed to Mr. Touchett. These were nice questions, but Isabel's arrival put a stop to his puzzling over them. It even suggested that there might be a compensation for the intolerable ennui of surviving his genial sire. He wondered whether he were harbouring love for this spontaneous young woman from Albany, but he judged that on the whole he was not. After he had known her for a week he quite made up his mind to this, and every day he felt a little more sure. Lord Warburton had been right about her. She was a really interesting little figure. Ralph wondered how their neighbour had found it out so soon, and then he said it was only another proof of his friend's high abilities which he had always greatly admired. If his cousin were to be nothing more than an entertainment to him, Ralph was conscious she was an entertainment of a high order. A character like that, he said to himself, a real little passionate force to see at play, is the finest thing in nature. It's finer than the finest work of art, than a Greek bas-relief, than a great Titian, than a Gothic cathedral. It's very pleasant to be so well treated where one had least looked for it. I had never been more blue, more bored, than for a week before she came. I had never expected less that anything pleasant would happen. Suddenly I receive a titian by the post to hang on my wall, a Greek bas-relief to stick over my chimney-piece. The key of a beautiful edifice is thrust into my hand, and I am told to walk in and admire. My poor boy, you've been sadly ungrateful, and now you had better keep very quiet and never grumble again. The sentiment of these reflections was very just, but it was not exactly true that Ralph Touchett had had a key put into his hand. His cousin was a very brilliant girl, who would take, as he said, a good deal of knowing, but she needed the knowing, and his attitude with regard to her, though it was contemplative and critical, was not judicial. He surveyed the edifice from the outside and admired it greatly. He looked in at the windows and received an impression of proportions equally fair. But he felt that he saw it only by glimpses and that he had not yet stood under the roof. The door was fastened and though he had keys in his pocket, he had a conviction that none of them would fit. She was intelligent and generous. It was a fine free nature but what was she going to do with herself? The question was irregular, for with most women one had no occasion to ask it. Most women did with themselves nothing at all. They waited, in attitudes more or less gracefully passive, for a man to come that way and furnish them with a destiny. Isabel's originality was that she gave one an impression of having intentions of her own. Whenever she executes them, said Ralph, May I be there to see? It devolved upon him, of course, to do the honours of the place. Mr. Touchett was confined to his chair, and his wife's position was that of a rather grim visitor, so that in the line of conduct that opened itself to Ralph, duty and inclination were harmoniously mixed. He was not a great walker, but he strolled about the grounds with his cousin, 
a pastime for which the weather remained favourable, with a persistency not allowed for in Isabel's somewhat lugubrious prevision of the climate. And in the long afternoons, of which the length was but the measure of her gratified eagerness, they took a boat on the river, the dear little river, as Isabel called it, where the opposite shore seemed still a part of the foreground of the landscape, or drove over the country in a phaeton, a low, capacious, thick-wheeled phaeton, formerly much used by Mr. Touchett, but which he had now ceased to enjoy. Isabel enjoyed it largely, and handling the reins in a manner which approved itself to the groom as knowing, was never weary of driving her uncle's capital horses through winding lanes and byways full of the rural incidents she had confidently expected to find, past cottages thatched and timbered, past alehouses latticed and sanded, past patches of ancient common and glimpses of empty parks, between hedgerows made thick by midsummer. When they reached home they usually found tea had been served on the lawn, and that Mrs. Touchett had not shrunk from the extremity of handing her husband his cup. But the two for the most part sat silent, the old man with his head back and his eyes closed, his wife occupied with her knitting and wearing that appearance of rare profundity with which some ladies consider the movement of their needles. One day, however, a visitor had arrived. The two young persons, after spending an hour on the river, strolled back to the house and perceived Lord Warburton sitting under the trees and engaged in conversation, of which, even at a distance, the desultory character was appreciable with Mrs. Touchett. He had driven over from his own place with a portmanteau and had asked, as the father and son often invited him to do, for a dinner and a lodging. Isabel, seeing him for half an hour on the day of her arrival, had discovered in this brief space that she liked him. He had indeed rather sharply registered himself on her fine sense, and she had thought of him several times. She had hoped she should see him again, hoped, too, that she should see a few others. Garden Court was not dull. The place itself was sovereign, her uncle was more and more a sort of golden grandfather, and Ralph was unlike any cousin she had ever encountered, her idea of cousins having tended to gloom. Then her impressions were still so fresh and so quickly renewed that there was as yet hardly a hint of vacancy in the view. But Isabel had need to remind herself that she was interested in human nature, and that her foremost hope in coming abroad had been that she should see a great many people. When Ralph said to her, as he had done several times, I wonder you find this endurable. You ought to see some of the neighbours and some of our friends, because we have really got a few, though you would never suppose it. When he offered to invite what he called a lot of people and make her acquainted with English society, she encouraged the hospitable impulse and promised in advance to hurl herself into the fray. Little, however, for the present had come of his offers, and it may be confided to the reader that if the young man delayed to carry them out, it was because he found the labour of providing for his companion by no means so severe as to require extraneous help. Isabel had spoken to him very often about specimens. It was a word that played a considerable part in her vocabulary. She had given him to understand that she wished to see English society illustrated by eminent cases. "'Well, now, there's a specimen,' he said to her, as they walked up from the riverside, and he recognized Lord Warburton. "'A specimen of what?' asked the girl. "'A specimen of an English gentleman. "'Do you mean they're all like him?' "'Oh, no, they're not all like him.' "'He's a favourable specimen, then,' said Isabel, "'because I'm sure he's nice.' "'Yes, he's very nice, and he's very fortunate.' The fortunate Lord Warburton exchanged a handshake with our heroine and hoped she was very well. "'But I needn't ask that,' he said, "'since you've been handling the oars.' "'I've been rowing a little,' Isabel answered. "'But how should you know it?' "'Oh, I know he doesn't row. "'He's too lazy,' said his lordship, "'indicating Ralph Touchett with a laugh. "'He has a good excuse for his laziness,' Isabel rejoined, "'lowering her voice a little.' 
ah he has a good excuse for everything cried lord warburton still with this sonorous mirth my excuse for not rowing is that my cousin rows so well said ralph she does everything well she touches nothing that she doesn't adorn it makes one want to be touched miss archer lord warburton declared be touched in the right sense and you'll never look the worse for it said isabel who if it pleased her to hear it said that her accomplishments were numerous was happily able to reflect that such complacency was not the indication of a feeble mind inasmuch as there were several things in which she excelled her desire to think well of herself had at least the element of humility that it always needed to be supported by proof lord warburton not only spent the night at garden court but he was persuaded to remain over the second day and when the second day was ended he determined to postpone his departure till the morrow during this period he addressed many of his remarks to isabel who accepted this evidence of his esteem with a very good grace she found herself liking him extremely the first impression he had made on her had had weight but at the end of an evening spent in his society she scarce fell short of seeing him though quite without luridity as a hero of romance she retired to rest with a sense of good fortune with a quickened consciousness of possible felicities it's very nice to know two such charming people as those she said meaning by those her cousin and her cousin's friend it must be added moreover that an incident had occurred which might have seemed to put her good humour to the test mr touchett went to bed at half-past nine o'clock but his wife remained in the drawing-room with the other members of the party she prolonged her vigil for something less than an hour and then rising observed to isabel that it was time they should bid the gentlemen good night isabel had as yet no desire to go to bed the occasion wore to her sense a festive character and feasts were not in the habit of terminating so early so without further thought she replied very simply need i go dear aunt i'll come up in half an hour it's impossible i should wait for you mrs touchett answered ah you needn't wait ralph will light my candle isabel gaily engaged i'll light your candle do let me light your candle miss archer lord warburton exclaimed only i beg it shall not be before midnight mrs touchett fixed her bright little eyes upon him a moment and transferred them coldly to her niece you can't stay alone with the gentleman you're not uh, you're not at your blessed albany my dear isabel rose blushing i wish i were she said oh i say mother ralph broke out my dear mrs touchett lord warburton murmured i didn't make your country my lord mrs touchett said majestically i must take it as i find it can't i stay with my own cousin isabel inquired i'm not aware that lord warburton is your cousin perhaps i had better go to bed the visitor suggested that will arrange it mrs touchett gave a little look of despair and sat down again oh if it's necessary i'll stay up till midnight ralph meanwhile handed isabel her candlestick he had been watching her it had seemed to him her temper was involved an accident that might be interesting but if he had expected anything of a flare he was disappointed for the girl simply laughed a little nodded good night and withdrew accompanied by her aunt for himself he was annoyed at his mother though he thought she was right above stairs the two ladies separated at mrs touchett's door isabel had said nothing on her way up of course you're vexed at my interfering with you said mrs touchett isabel considered i'm not vexed but i'm surprised and a good deal mystified wasn't it proper i should remain in the drawing-room not in the least young girls here in decent houses don't sit alone with the gentleman late at night you were very right to tell me then said isabel i don't understand it but i'm very glad to know it i shall always tell you her aunt answered whenever i see you taking what seems to me too much liberty pray do but i don't say i shall always think your remonstrance just very likely not 
You're too fond of your own ways. Yes, I think I'm very fond of them, but I always want to know the things one shouldn't do. So as to do them? asked her aunt. So as to choose, said Isabel. End of chapter 7《Chapters Eight and Nine of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As she was devoted to romantic effects, Lord Warburton ventured to express a hope that she would come some day and see his house, a very curious old place. He extracted from Mrs. Touchett a promise that she would bring her niece to Lockley, and Ralph signified his willingness to attend the ladies if his father should be able to spare him. Lord Warburton assured our heroine that in the meantime his sisters would come and see her. She knew something about his sisters, having sounded him during the hours they spent together while he was at Garden Court, on many points connected with his family. When Isabel was interested, she asked a great many questions, and as her companion was a copious talker, she urged him on this occasion by no means in vain. He told her he had four sisters and two brothers, and had lost both his parents. The brothers and sisters were very good people. Not particularly clever, you know, he said, but very decent and pleasant. And he was so good as to hope Miss Archer might know them well. One of the brothers was in the church, settled in the family living, that of Lockley, which was a heavy, sprawling parish, and was an excellent fellow in spite of his thinking differently from himself on every conceivable topic. And then Lord Warburton mentioned some of the opinions held by his brother, which were opinions Isabel had often heard expressed, and that she supposed to be entertained by a considerable portion of the human family. Many of them, indeed, she supposed she had held herself, till he assured her she was quite mistaken, that it was really impossible, that she had doubtless imagined she entertained them, but that she might depend that, if she thought about them over a little, she would find there was nothing in them. When she answered that she had already thought several of the questions involved over very attentively, he declared that she was only another example of what he had often been struck with, the fact that of all the people in the world, the Americans were the most grossly superstitious. They were rank Tories and bigots, every one of them, there were no conservatives like American conservatives. Her uncle and her cousin were there to prove it. Nothing could be more medieval than many of their views. They had ideas that people in England nowadays were ashamed to confess to. And they had the impudence, moreover, said his lordship, laughing, to pretend they knew more about the needs and dangers of this poor, dear, stupid old England than he who was born in it and owned a considerable slice of it the more shame to him. From all of which Isabel gathered that Lord Warburton was a nobleman of the newest pattern, a reformer, a radical, a contemner of ancient ways. His other brother, who was in the army in India, was rather wild and pig-headed, and had not been of much use as yet but to make debts for Warburton to pay, one of the most precious privileges of an elder brother. "'I don't think I shall pay any more,' said her friend. "'He lives a monstrous deal better than I do, "'enjoys unheard of luxuries, "'and thinks himself a much finer gentleman than I. "'As I'm a consistent radical, "'I go in only for equality. "'I don't go in for the superiority of the younger brothers.' Two of his four sisters, the second and the fourth, were married, one of them having done very well, as they said, the other only so-so. The husband of the elder, Lord Haycock, was a very good fellow, but unfortunately a horrid Tory, and his wife, like all good English wives, was worse than her husband. The other had espoused a smallish squire in Norfolk, and though married but the other day, had already five children. This information and much more Lord Warburton imparted to his young American listener, taking pains to make many things clear and to lay bare to her apprehension the peculiarities of English life. Isabel was often amused at his explicitness, and at the small allowance he seemed to make, either for her own experience 
or for her imagination. "'He thinks I'm a barbarian,' she said, "'and that I've never seen forks and spoons.' and she used to ask him artless questions for the pleasure of hearing him answer seriously. Then, when he had fallen into the trap, "'It's a pity you can't see me in my war-paint and feathers,' she remarked. "'If I had known how kind you are to the poor savages, I would have brought over my native costume.' Lord Warburton had travelled through the United States and knew much more about them than Isabel. He was so good as to say that America was the most charming country in the world, but his recollections of it appeared to encourage the idea that Americans in England would need to have a great many things explained to them. "'If I had only had you to explain things to me in America,' he said. "'I was rather puzzled in your country. In fact, I was quite bewildered, and the trouble was that the explanations only puzzled me more. You know, I think they often gave me the wrong ones on purpose. They're rather clever about that over there.' but when I explain you can trust me. About what I tell you there's no mistake. There was no mistake at least about his being very intelligent and cultivated and knowing almost everything in the world. Although he gave the most interesting and thrilling glimpses, Isabel felt he never did it to exhibit himself, and though he had had rare chances and had tumbled in, as she put it, for high prizes, he was as far as possible from making a merit of it. He had enjoyed the best things of life, but they had not spoiled his sense of proportion. His quality was a mixture of the effect of rich experience, oh, so easily come by, with a modesty at times almost boyish, the sweet and wholesome savour of which, it was as agreeable as something tasted, lost nothing from the addition of a tone of responsible kindness. "'I like your specimen English gentleman very much,' Isabel said to Ralph, after Lord Warburton had gone. "'I like him, too. I love him well,' Ralph returned. "'But I pity him more.' Isabel looked at him askance. "'Why, that seems to me his only fault. One can't pity him a little. He appears to have everything, to know everything, to be everything.' "'Oh, he's in a bad way,' Ralph insisted. "'I suppose you don't mean in health.' No, as to that, he's detestably sound. What I mean is that he's a man with a great position who's playing all sorts of tricks with it. He doesn't take himself seriously. Does he regard himself as a joke? Much worse, he regards himself as an imposition, as an abuse. Well, perhaps he is, said Isabel. Perhaps he is, though on the whole I don't think so. But in that case, what's more pitiable than a sentient, self-conscious abuse planted by other hands, deeply rooted, but aching with a sense of its injustice? For me, in his place, I could be as solemn as a statue of Buddha. He occupies a position that appeals to my imagination. Great responsibilities, great opportunities, great consideration, great wealth, great power— a natural share in the public affairs of a great country, but he's all in a muddle about himself, his position, his power, and indeed about everything in the world. He's the victim of a critical age. He has ceased to believe in himself, and he doesn't know what to believe in. When I attempt to tell him, because if I were he, I know very well what I should believe in, he calls me a pampered bigot. I believe he seriously thinks me an awful Philistine. He says I don't understand my time. I understand it certainly better than he, who could neither abolish himself as a nuisance nor maintain himself as an institution. He doesn't look very wretched, Isabel observed. Possibly not, though, being a man of a good deal of charming taste, I think he often has uncomfortable hours. But what is it to say of a being of his opportunities that he's not miserable? Besides, I believe he is. I don't, said Isabel. Well, her cousin rejoined, if he isn't, he ought to be. In the afternoon she spent an hour with her uncle on the lawn, where the old man sat, as usual, with his shawl over his legs and his large cup of diluted tea in his hands. In the course of conversation, he asked her what she thought of their late visitor. Isabel was prompt. I think he's charming. 
He's a nice person, said Mr. Touchett, but I don't recommend you to fall in love with him. I shall not do it, then. I shall never fall in love but on your recommendation. Moreover, Isabel added, my cousin gives me a rather sad account of Lord Warburton. Oh, indeed? I don't know what there may be to say, but you must remember that Ralph must talk. He thinks your friends too subversive, or not subversive enough. I don't quite understand which, said Isabel. The old man shook his head slowly, smiled, and put down his cup. I don't know which either. He goes very far, but it's quite possible he doesn't go far enough. He seems to want to do away with a good many things, but he seems to want to remain himself. I suppose that's natural, but it's rather inconsistent. Oh, I hope he'll remain himself, said Isabel. If he were to be done away, his friends would miss him sadly. Well, said the old man, I guess he'll stay and amuse his friends. I should certainly miss him very much here at Garden Court. He always amuses me when he comes over, and I think he amuses himself as well. There's a considerable number like him round in society. They're very fashionable just now. I don't know what they're trying to do whether they're trying to get up a revolution. I hope, at any rate, they'll put it off till after I'm gone. You see, they want to disestablish everything, but I'm a pretty big landowner here, and I don't want to be disestablished. I wouldn't have come over if I had thought that they were going to behave like that, Mr. Touchett went on, with expanding hilarity. I came over because I thought England was a safe country. I call it a regular fraud, if they're going to introduce any considerable changes. There'll be a large number disappointed in that case. Oh, I do hope they'll make a revolution, Isabel exclaimed. I should delight in seeing a revolution. Let me see, said her uncle, with a humorous intention. I forget whether you're on the side of the old or on the side of the new. I've heard you take such opposite views. I'm on the side of both. I guess I'm a little on the side of everything. In a revolution, after it was well begun, I think I should be a high, proud loyalist. One sympathizes more with them, and they've a chance to behave so exquisitely, I mean, so picturesquely. I don't know that I understand what you mean by behaving picturesquely, but it seems to me that you do that always, my dear. Oh, you lovely man, if I could believe that, the girl interrupted. I'm afraid, after all, you won't have the pleasure of going gracefully to the guillotine here just now, Mr. Touchett went on. If you want to see a big outbreak, you must pay us a long visit. You see, when you come to the point, it wouldn't suit them to be taken at their word. Of whom are you speaking? Well, I mean Lord Warburton and his friends, the radicals of the upper class. Of course, I only know the way it strikes me. They talk about the changes, but I don't think they quite realize. You and I, you know, we know what it is to have lived under democratic institutions. I always thought them very comfortable, but I was used to them from the first. And then, I ain't a lord. You're a lady, my dear, but I ain't a lord. Now, over here, I don't think it quite comes home to them. It's a matter of every day and every hour and I don't think many of them would find it as pleasant as what they've got. Of course, if they want to try, it's their own business, but I expect they won't try very hard. Don't you think they're sincere? Isabel asked. Well, they want to feel earnest, Mr. Touchett allowed, but it seems as if they took it out in theories mostly. Their radical views are a kind of amusement. They've got to have some amusement, and they might have coarser tastes than that. You see, they're very luxurious, and these progressive ideas are about their biggest luxury. They make them feel moral, and yet don't damage their position. They think a great deal of their position. Don't let one of them ever persuade you he doesn't, for if you were to proceed on that basis, you'd be pulled up very short. Isabel followed her uncle's argument, which he unfolded with his quaint distinctness, most attentively, and though she was unacquainted with the British aristocracy, she found it in harmony with her general impressions of human nature. But she felt moved to put in a protest on Lord Warburton's behalf. 
I don't believe Lord Warburton's a humbug. I don't care what the others are. I should like to see Lord Warburton put to the test. Heaven deliver me from my friends, Mr. Touchett answered. Lord Warburton's a very amiable young man, a very fine young man. He has a hundred thousand a year. He owns fifty thousand acres of the soil of this little island, and ever so many other things besides. He has half a dozen houses to live in. He has a seat in Parliament, as I have one at my own dinner-table. He has elegant tastes, cares for literature, for art, for science, for charming young ladies. The most elegant is his taste for the new views. It affords him a great deal of pleasure, more perhaps than anything else, except the young ladies. His old house over there, what does he call it, Lockley, is very attractive, but I don't think it's as pleasant as this. That doesn't matter, however, he has so many others. His views don't hurt anyone as far as I can see. They certainly don't hurt himself. And if there were to be a revolution, he would come off very easily. They wouldn't touch him. They'd leave him as he is. He's too much liked. Ah, he couldn't be a martyr even if he wished, Isabel sighed. That's a very poor position. He'll never be a martyr unless you make him one, said the old man. Isabel shook her head. There might have been something laughable in the fact that she did it with a touch of melancholy. I shall never make any one a martyr. You'll never be one, I hope. I hope not. But you don't pity Lord Warburton, then, as Ralph does? Her uncle looked at her a while with genial acuteness. Yes, I do, after all. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 the two Mrs. Molyneux, this nobleman's sisters, came presently to call upon her, and Isabel took a fancy to the young ladies, who appeared to her to show a most original stamp. It is true that when she described them to her cousin by that term, he declared that no epithet could be less applicable than this to the two Mrs. Molyneux, since there were fifty thousand young women in England who exactly resembled them. Deprived of this advantage, however, Isabel's visitors retained that of an extreme sweetness and shyness of demeanour, and of having, as she thought, eyes like the balanced basins, the circles of ornamental water, set in parterres among the geraniums. "'They're not morbid, at any rate, whatever they are,' our heroine said to herself, and she deemed this a great charm for two or three of the friends of her girlhood had been regrettably open to the charge, they would have been so nice without it, to say nothing of Isabel's having occasionally suspected it as a tendency of her own. The Mrs. Molyneux were not in their first youth, but they had bright, fresh complexions, and something of the smile of childhood. Yes, their eyes, which Isabel admired, were round, quiet, and contented, and their figures, also of a generous roundness, were encased in sealskin jackets. Their friendliness was great, so great that they were almost embarrassed to show it. They seemed somewhat afraid of the young lady from the other side of the world, and rather looked than spoke their good wishes. But they made it clear to her that they hoped she would come to luncheon at Lockley, where they lived with their brother, and then they might see her very, very often. They wondered if she wouldn't come over some day and sleep. They were expecting some people on the twenty-ninth, so perhaps she would come while the people were there. "'I'm afraid it isn't any one very remarkable,' said the elder sister, "'but I dare say you'll take us as you find us.' "'I shall find you delightful. I think you're enchanting just as you are,' replied Isabel, who often praised profusely. Her visitors flushed, and her cousin told her, after they were gone, that if she said such things to those poor girls, they would think she was in some wild, free manner practising on them. He was sure it was the first time they had been called enchanting. "'I can't help it,' Isabel answered. "'I think it's lovely to be so quiet and reasonable and satisfied. I should like to be like that.' "'Heaven forbid!' cried Ralph with ardour. "'I mean to try and imitate them,' said Isabel. "'I want very much to see them at home.' She had this pleasure a few days later, when, with Ralph and his mother, she drove over to Lockley. She found the Mrs. Molyneux sitting in a vast drawing-room, she perceived afterwards it was one of several, in a wilderness of faded chintz. 
They were dressed on this occasion in black velveteen. Isabel liked them even better at home than she had done at Garden Court, and was more than ever struck with the fact that they were not morbid. It had seemed to her before that if they had a fault it was a want of play of mind, but she presently saw they were capable of deep emotion. Before luncheon she was alone with them for some time on one side of the room, while Lord Warburton, at a distance, talked to Mrs. Touchett. "'Is it true your brother's such a great radical?' Isabel asked. She knew it was true, but we have seen that her interest in human nature was keen, and she had a desire to draw the Mrs. Molyneux out. "'Oh, dear, yes, he's immensely advanced,' said Mildred, the younger sister." At the same time, Warburton's very reasonable, Miss Molyneux observed. Isabel watched him a moment at the other side of the room. He was clearly trying hard to make himself agreeable to Mrs. Touchett. Ralph had met the frank advances of one of the dogs before the fire that the temperature of an English August in the ancient expanses had not made an impertinence. Do you suppose your brother's sincere? Isabel inquired with a smile. "'Oh, he must be, you know,' Mildred exclaimed quickly, while the elder sister gazed at our heroine in silence. "'Do you think he would stand the test?' "'The test?' "'I mean, for instance, having to give up all this.' "'Having to give up Lockley?' said Miss Molyneux, finding her voice. "'Yes, and the other places. What are they called?' The two sisters exchanged an almost frightened glance. "'Do you mean, do you mean on account of the expense?' the younger one asked. "'I dare say he might let one or two of his houses,' said the other. "'Let them for nothing?' Isabel demanded. "'I can't fancy his giving up his property,' said Miss Molyneux. "'Ah, I'm afraid he is an impostor. Isabel returned. "'Don't you think it's a false position?' Her companions evidently had lost themselves. "'My brother's position?' Miss Molyneux inquired. "'It's thought a very good position,' said the younger sister. "'It's the first position in this part of the country.' "'I dare say you think me very irreverent,' Isabel took occasion to remark. "'I suppose you revere your brother and are rather afraid of him.' "'Of course one looks up to one's brother,' said Miss Molyneux simply. "'If you do that, he must be very good.' because you, evidently, are beautifully good. He's most kind. It will never be known the good he does. His ability is known, Mildred added. Everyone thinks it's immense. Oh, I can see that, said Isabel. But if I were he, I should wish to fight to the death. I mean, for the heritage of the past. I should hold it tight. I think one ought to be liberal, Mildred argued gently. We've always been so, even from the earliest times. Ah, well, said Isabel, you've made a great success of it. I don't wonder you like it. I see you're very fond of cruels. When Lord Warburton showed her the house after luncheon, it seemed to her a matter of course that it should be a noble picture. Within, it had been a good deal modernized. Some of the best points had lost their purity, but as they saw it from the gardens, a stout grey pile of the softest, deepest, most weather-fretted hue, rising from a broad, still moat, it affected the young visitor as a castle in a legend. The day was cool and rather lustreless. The first note of autumn had been struck, and the watery sunshine rested on the walls in blurred and desultory gleams, washing them, as it were, in places tenderly chosen, where the ache of antiquity was the keenest. Her host's brother, the vicar, had come to luncheon, and Isabel had had five minutes' talk with him, time enough to institute a search for a rich ecclesiasticism and give it up as vain. The marks of the vicar of Lockley were a big athletic figure, a candid natural countenance, a capacious appetite, and a tendency to indiscriminate laughter. Isabel learned afterwards from her cousin that before taking orders he had been a mighty wrestler, and that he was still, on occasion, in the privacy of the family circle, as it were, quite capable of flooring his man. Isabel liked him. She was in the mood for liking everything, but her imagination was a good deal taxed to think of him as a source of spiritual aid. The whole party, on leaving lunch, went to walk in the grounds, 
but Lord Warburton exercised some ingenuity in engaging his least familiar guest in a stroll apart from the others. "'I wish you to see the place properly, seriously,' he said. "'You can't do it if your attention is distracted by irrelevant gossip.' His own conversation, though he told Isabel a good deal about the house, which had a very curious history, was not purely archaeological. He reverted at intervals to matters more personal, matters personal to the young lady as well as to himself. But at last, after a pause of some duration, returning for a moment to their ostensible theme, "'Ah, well,' he said, "'I'm very glad indeed you like the old barrack. I wish you could see more of it.' that you could stay here a while. My sisters have taken an immense fancy to you, if that would be any inducement. There's no want of inducements, Isabel answered, but I'm afraid I can't make engagements. I'm quite in my aunt's hands. Ah, pardon me if I say I don't exactly believe that. I'm pretty sure you can do whatever you want. I'm sorry if I make that impression on you. I don't think it's a nice impression to make. It has the merit of permitting me to hope, and Lord Warburton paused a moment. To hope what? That in future I may see you often? Ah, said Isabel, to enjoy that pleasure I needn't be so terribly emancipated. Doubtless not, and yet at the same time I don't think your uncle likes me. You're very much mistaken. I've heard him speak very highly of you. "'I'm glad you have talked about me,' said Lord Warburton. "'But I nevertheless don't think he'd like me to keep coming to Garden Court.' "'I can't answer for my uncle's tastes,' the girl rejoined, "'though I ought as far as possible to take them into account. "'But for myself I shall be very glad to see you.' "'Now that's what I like to hear you say. "'I'm charmed when you say that.' "'You're easily charmed, my lord,' said Isabel.' "'No, I'm not easily charmed.' And then he stopped a moment. "'But you've charmed me, Miss Archer.' These words were uttered with an indefinable sound which startled the girl. It struck her as the prelude to something grave. She had heard the sound before, and she recognized it. She had no wish, however, that for the moment such a prelude should have a sequel. And she said as gaily as possible— and as quickly as an appreciable degree of agitation would allow her, I'm afraid there's no prospect of my being able to come here again. Never, said Lord Warburton. I won't say never. I should feel very melodramatic. May I come and see you then some day next week? Most assuredly. What is there to prevent it? Nothing tangible. But with you I never feel safe. I've a sort of sense that you're always summing people up. You don't of necessity lose by that. It's very kind of you to say so. But even if I gain, stern justice is not what I most love. Is Mrs. Touchett going to take you abroad? I hope so. Is England not good enough for you? That's a very Machiavellian speech. It doesn't deserve an answer. I want to see as many countries as I can. "'Then you'll go on judging, I suppose. "'Enjoying, I hope, too. "'Yes, that's what you enjoy most. "'I can't make out what you're up to,' said Lord Warburton. "'You strike me as having mysterious purposes, vast designs. "'You're so good as to have a theory about me "'which I don't at all fill out. "'Is there anything mysterious in a purpose entertained "'and executed every year in the most public manner by fifty thousand of my fellow countrymen, the purpose of improving one's mind by foreign travel? You can't improve your mind, Miss Archer, her companion declared. It's already a most formidable instrument. It looks down on us all. It despises us. Despises you? You're making fun of me, said Isabel seriously. Well, you think us quaint. That's the same thing. I won't be thought quaint to begin with. I'm not so in the least. I protest. That protest is one of the quaintest things I've ever heard, Isabel answered with a smile. Lord Warburton was briefly silent. You judge only from the outside. You don't care, he said presently. You only care to amuse yourself. The note she had heard in his voice a moment before reappeared, 
and mixed with it now was an audible strain of bitterness a bitterness so abrupt and inconsequent that the girl was afraid she had hurt him she had often heard that the english are a highly eccentric people and she had even read in some ingenious author that they are at bottom the most romantic of races was lord warburton suddenly turning romantic was he going to make her a scene in his own house only the third time they had met she was reassured quickly enough by her sense of his great good manners which was not impaired by the fact that he had already touched the furthest limits of good taste in expressing his admiration of a young lady who had confided in his hospitality. She was right in trusting to his good manners, for he presently went on, laughing a little, and without a trace of the accent that had discomposed her. I don't mean, of course, that you amuse yourself with trifles. You select great materials, the foibles, the afflictions of human nature, the peculiarities of nations. As regards that, said Isabel, I should find in my own nation entertainment for a lifetime. But we've a long drive, and my aunt will soon wish to start. She turned back toward the others, and Lord Warburton walked beside her in silence. But before they reached the others, I shall come and see you next week, he said. She had received an appreciable shock, but as it died away she felt she couldn't pretend to herself that it was altogether a painful one. Nevertheless she made answer to his declaration coldly enough. Just as you please. And her coldness was not the calculation of her effect, a game she played in a much smaller degree than would have seemed probable to many critics. It came from a certain fear. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Portrait of a Lady》by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The day after her visit to Lockley, she received a note from her friend Miss Stackpole, a note of which the envelope, exhibiting in conjunction the postmark of Liverpool and the neat calligraphy of the quick-fingered Henrietta, caused her some liveliness of emotion. "Here I am, my lovely friend," Miss Stackpole wrote. I managed to get off at last. I decided only the night before I left New York, the interviewer having come round to my figure. I put a few things into a bag like a veteran journalist and came down to the steamer in a street car. Where are you and where can we meet? I suppose you are visiting at some castle or other and have already acquired the correct accent. Perhaps even you have married a lord. I almost hope you have for I want some introductions to the first people, and shall count on you for a few. The interviewer wants some light on the nobility. My first impressions, of the people at large, are not rose-coloured, but I wish to talk them over with you, and you know that, whatever I am, at least I'm not superficial. I've also something very particular to tell you. Do appoint a meeting as quickly as you can, Come to London, I should like so much to visit the sights with you, or else let me come to you wherever you are. I will do so with pleasure, for you know everything interests me, and I wish to see as much as possible of the inner life. Isabel judged best not to show this letter to her uncle, but she acquainted him with its purport, and, as she expected, he begged her instantly to assure Miss Stackpole, in his name, that he should be delighted to receive her at Garden Court. Though she's a literary lady, he said, I suppose that being an American she won't show me up, as that other one did. She has seen others like me. She has seen no other so delightful, Isabel answered, but she was not altogether at ease about Henrietta's reproductive instincts, which belonged to that side of her friend's character which she regarded with the least complacency. She wrote to Miss Stackpole, however, that she would be very welcome under Mr. Touchett's roof, and this alert young woman lost no time in announcing her prompt approach. She had gone up to London, and it was from that centre that she took the train for the station nearest to Garden Court, where Isabel and Ralph were in waiting to receive her. "'Shall I love her or shall I hate her?' Ralph asked, 
while they moved along the platform. "'Whichever you do will matter very little to her,' said Isabel. "'She doesn't care a straw what men think of her.' "'As a man, I'm bound to dislike her, then. "'She must be some kind of a monster. "'Is she very ugly?' "'No, she's decidedly pretty.' A female interviewer? A reporter in petticoats? I'm very curious to see her, Ralph conceded. It's very easy to laugh at her, but it is not easy to be as brave as she. I should think not. Crimes of violence and attacks on the person require more or less pluck. Do you suppose she'll interview me? Never in the world. She'll not think you of enough importance. You'll see, said Ralph. She'll send a description of us all, including Bunchy, to her newspaper. I shall ask her not to, Isabel answered. You think she's capable of it, then? Perfectly. And yet you've made her your bosom friend? I've not made her my bosom friend, but I like her in spite of her faults. Ah, well, said Ralph, I'm afraid I shall dislike her in spite of her merits. You'll probably fall in love with her at the end of three days. "'And have my love-letters published in the interviewer? "'Never!' cried the young man. "'The train presently arrived, "'and Miss Stackpole, promptly descending, "'proved, as Isabel had promised, quite delicately, "'even though rather provincially, fair. "'She was a neat, plump person, of medium stature, "'with a round face, a small mouth, a delicate complexion, "'a bunch of light brown ringlets at the back of her head, and a peculiarly open, surprised-looking eye. The most striking point in her appearance was the remarkable fixedness of this organ, which rested without impudence or defiance, but as if in conscientious exercise of a natural right, upon every object it happened to encounter. It rested in this manner upon Ralph himself, a little arrested by Miss Stackpole's gracious and comfortable aspect, which hinted that it wouldn't be so easy as he had assumed to disapprove of her. She rustled, she shimmered, in fresh, dove-coloured draperies, and Ralph saw at a glance that she was as crisp and new and comprehensive as a first issue before the folding. From top to toe she had probably no misprint. She spoke in a clear, high voice, a voice not rich but loud. Yet after she had taken her place with her companions in Mr. Touchett's carriage, she struck him as not at all in the large type, the type of horrid headings that he had expected. She answered the inquiries made of her by Isabel, however, and in which the young man ventured to join with copious lucidity. And later, in the library at Garden Court, when she had made the acquaintance of Mr. Touchett, his wife not having thought it necessary to appear, did more to give the measure of her confidence in her powers. "'Well, I should like to know whether you consider yourselves American or English,' she broke out. "'If once I knew, I could talk to you accordingly.' "'Talk to us anyhow, and we shall be thankful,' Ralph liberally answered. She fixed her eyes on him, and there was something in their character that reminded him of large polished buttons— buttons that might have fixed the elastic loops of some tense receptacle. He seemed to see the reflection of surrounding objects on the pupil. The expression of a button is not usually deemed human, but there was something in Miss Stackpole's gaze that made him, as a very modest man, feel vaguely embarrassed, less inviolate, more dishonoured than he liked. This sensation, it must be added, after he had spent a day or two in her company, sensibly diminished though it never wholly lapsed. "'I don't suppose that you're going to undertake to persuade me that you're an American,' she said. "'To please you, I'll be an Englishman, I'll be a Turk.' "'Well, if you can change about that way, you're very welcome,' Miss Stackpole returned. "'I'm sure you understand everything, and that differences of nationality are no barrier to you,' Ralph went on. Miss Stackpole gazed at him still. "'Do you mean the foreign languages?' "'The languages are nothing. I mean the spirit, the genius.' "'I'm not sure that I understand you,' said the correspondent of the interviewer. "'But I expect I shall before I leave.' "'He's what's called a cosmopolite,' Isabel suggested. "'That means he's a little of everything and not much of any. 
I must say, I think patriotism is like charity. It begins at home. Ah, but where does home begin, Miss Stackpole? Ralph inquired. I don't know where it begins, but I know where it ends. It ended a long time before I got here. Don't you like it over here? asked Mr. Touchett, with his aged, innocent voice. Well, sir, I haven't quite made up my mind what ground I shall take. I feel a good deal cramped. I felt it on the journey from Liverpool to London. Perhaps you were in a crowded carriage, Ralph suggested. Yes, but it was crowded with friends, a party of Americans whose acquaintance I had made upon the steamer, a lovely group from Little Rock, Arkansas. In spite of that, I felt cramped. I felt something pressing upon me. I couldn't tell what it was. I felt at the very commencement as if I were not going to accord with the atmosphere. But I suppose I shall make my own atmosphere. That's the true way. Then you can breathe. Your surroundings seem very attractive. Ah, we too are a lovely group, said Ralph. Wait a little and you'll see. Miss Stackpole showed every disposition to wait and evidently was prepared to make a considerable stay at Garden Court. She occupied herself in the mornings with literary labour, but in spite of this Isabel spent many hours with her friend, who, once her daily task performed, deprecated, in fact, defied isolation. Isabel speedily found occasion to desire her to desist from celebrating the charms of their common sojourn in print, having discovered, on the second morning of Miss Stackpole's visit, that she was engaged on a letter to the interviewer, of which the title, in her exquisitely neat and legible hand, exactly that of the copy-books which our heroine remembered at school, was Americans and Tudors, Glimpses of Garden Court. Miss Stackpole, with the best conscience in the world, offered to read her letter to Isabel, who immediately put in her protest. I don't think you ought to do that. I don't think you ought to describe the place. Henrietta gazed at her as usual. Why, it's just what the people want, and it's a lovely place. It's too lovely to be put in the newspapers, and it's not what my uncle wants. Don't you believe that, cried Henrietta. They're always delighted afterwards. My uncle won't be delighted, nor my cousin either. They'll consider it a breach of hospitality. Miss Stackpole showed no sense of confusion. She simply wiped her pen very neatly upon an elegant little implement which she kept for the purpose, and put away her manuscript. Of course, if you don't approve, I won't do it. But I sacrifice a beautiful subject. There are plenty of other subjects. There are subjects all round you. We'll take some drives. I'll show you some charming scenery. Scenery's not my department. I always need a human interest. You know, I'm deeply human, Isabel. I always was, Miss Stackpole rejoined. I was going to bring in your cousin, the alienated American. There's a great demand just now for the alienated American, and your cousin's a beautiful specimen. I should have handled him severely. He would have died of it, Isabel exclaimed. Not of the severity, but of the publicity. Well, I should have liked to kill him a little, and I should have delighted to do your uncle, who seems to be a much nobler type, the American faithful still. He's a grand old man. I don't see how he can object to my paying him honour. Isabel looked at her companion in much wonderment. It struck her as strange that a nature in which she found so much to esteem should break down so in spots. My poor Henrietta, she said, you've no sense of privacy. Henrietta coloured deeply, and for a moment her brilliant eyes were suffused, while Isabel found her more than ever inconsequent. You do me great injustice, said Miss Stackpole with dignity. I've never written a word about myself. I'm very sure of that, but it seems to me one should be modest for others also. Ah, that's very good, cried Henrietta seizing her pen again. Just let me make a note of it, and I'll put it in somewhere. She was a thoroughly good-natured woman, and half an hour later she was in as cheerful a mood as should have been looked for in a newspaper lady in want of matter. 
"'I've promised to do the social side,' she said to Isabel, "'and how can I do it unless I get ideas? "'If I can't describe this place, "'don't you know some place I can describe?' Isabel promised she would bethink herself, and the next day, in conversation with her friend, she happened to mention her visit to Lord Warburton's ancient house. "'Ah, you must take me there. That's just the place for me,' Miss Stackpole cried. "'I must get a glimpse of the nobility.' "'I can't take you,' said Isabel, "'but Lord Warburton's coming here, and you'll have a chance to see him and observe him.' Only, if you intend to repeat his conversation, I shall certainly give him warning. Don't do that, her companion pleaded. I want him to be natural. An Englishman's never so natural as when he's holding his tongue, Isabel declared. It was not apparent at the end of three days that her cousin had, according to her prophecy, lost his heart to their visitor, though he had spent a good deal of time in her society. They strolled about the park together, and sat under the trees, and in the afternoon, when it was delightful to float along the Thames, Miss Stackpole occupied a place in the boat, in which hitherto Ralph had had but a single companion. Her presence proved somewhat less irreducible to soft particles than Ralph had expected in the natural perturbation of his sense of the perfect solubility of that of his cousin for the correspondent of the interviewer prompted mirth in him, and he had long since decided that the crescendo of mirth should be the flower of his declining days. Henrietta, on her side, failed a little to justify Isabel's declaration with regard to her indifference to masculine opinion, for poor Ralph appeared to have presented himself to her as an irritating problem which it would be almost immoral not to work out. "'What does he do for a living?' she asked of Isabel, the evening of her arrival. "'Does he go round all day with his hands in his pockets?' "'He does nothing,' smiled Isabel. "'He's a gentleman of large leisure.' "'Well, I call that a shame, when I have to work like a car conductor,' Miss Stackpole replied. "'I should like to show him up.' "'He's in wretched health. He's quite unfit for work,' Isabel urged. "'Pshaw! Don't you believe it?' "'I work when I'm sick,' cried her friend. Later, when she stepped into the boat on joining the water-party, she remarked to Ralph that she supposed he hated her and would like to drown her. "'Ah, no,' said Ralph. "'I keep my victims for a slower torture, and you'd be such an interesting one.' "'Well, you do torture me, I may say that. But I shock all your prejudices. That's one comfort.' "'My prejudices?' I haven't a prejudice to bless myself with. There's intellectual poverty for you. The more shame to you. I've some delicious ones. Of course I spoil your flirtation, or whatever it is you call it, with your cousin. But I don't care for that, as I render her the service of drawing you out. She'll see how thin you are. Ah, do draw me out, Ralph exclaimed. So few people will take the trouble." Miss Stackpole, in this undertaking, appeared to shrink from no effort, resorting largely, whenever the opportunity offered, to the natural expedient of interrogation. On the following day the weather was bad, and in the afternoon the young man, by way of providing indoor amusement, offered to show her the pictures. Henrietta strolled through the long gallery in his society, while he pointed out its principal ornaments and mentioned the painters and subjects. Miss Stackpole looked at the pictures in perfect silence, committing herself to no opinion, and Ralph was gratified by the fact that she delivered herself of none of the little ready-made ejaculations of delight of which the visitors to Garden Court were so frequently lavish. This young lady, indeed, to do her justice, was but little addicted to the use of conventional terms. There was something earnest and inventive in her tone, which at times, in its strained deliberation, suggested a person of high culture speaking a foreign language. Ralph Touchett subsequently learned that she had at one time officiated as art critic to a journal of the other world, but she appeared, in spite of this fact, to carry in her pocket none of the small change of admiration. Suddenly, just after he had called her attention to a charming constable, she turned and looked at him as if he himself had been a picture. 
"'Do you always spend your time like this?' she demanded. "'I seldom spend it so agreeably.' "'Well, you know what I mean. Without any regular occupation?' "'Ah,' said Ralph, "'I'm the idlest man living.' Miss Stackpole directed her gaze to the constable again, and Ralph bespoke her attention for a small lancre hanging near it, which represented a gentleman in pink doublet and hose, and a ruff, leaning against the pedestal of the statue of a nymph in a garden, and playing the guitar to two ladies seated on the grass. "'That's my ideal of a regular occupation,' he said. Miss Stackpole turned to him again, and though her eyes had rested upon the picture, he saw that she had missed the subject. She was thinking of something much more serious. "'I don't see how you can reconcile it to your conscience.' "'My dear lady, I have no conscience.' "'Well, I advise you to cultivate one. You'll need it the next time you go to America.' "'I shall probably never go again.' "'Are you ashamed to show yourself?' Ralph meditated with a mild smile. "'I suppose that if one has no conscience, one has no shame.' "'Well, you've got plenty of assurance,' Henrietta declared. "'Do you consider it right to give up your country?' "'Ah, one doesn't give up one's country any more than one gives up one's grandmother. They're both antecedent to choice, elements of one's composition that are not to be eliminated.' "'I suppose that means that you've tried and been worsted. What do they think of you over here?' "'They delight in me.' "'That's because you truckle to them.' "'Ah, set it down a little to my natural charm,' Ralph sighed. "'I don't know anything about your natural charm. "'If you've got any charm, it's quite unnatural. "'It's wholly acquired, or at least you've tried hard to acquire it living over here. "'I don't say you've succeeded. "'It's a charm that I don't appreciate anyway. "'Make yourself useful in some way, and then we'll talk about it.' "'Well, now, tell me what I shall do,' said Ralph. "'Go right home to begin with.' "'Yes, I see. And then?' "'Take right hold of something.' "'Well, now, what sort of thing?' "'Anything you please, so long as you take hold. Some new idea, some big work.' "'Is it very difficult to take hold?' Ralph inquired. "'Not if you put your heart into it.' "'Ah, my heart,' said Ralph. "'If it depends upon my heart.' "'Haven't you got a heart?' I had one a few days ago, but I've lost it since. You're not serious, Miss Stackpole remarked. That's what's the matter with you. But for all this in a day or two, she again permitted him to fix her attention, and on the later occasion assigned a different cause to her mysterious perversity. I know what's the matter with you, Mr. Touchett, she said. You think you're too good to get married. "'I thought so till I knew you, Miss Stackpole,' Ralph answered, "'and then I suddenly changed my mind.' "'Oh, sure,' Harriet groaned. "'Then it seemed to me,' said Ralph, "'that I was not good enough.' "'It would improve you. Besides, it's your duty.' "'Ah!' cried the young man. "'One has so many duties. Is that a duty, too?' "'Of course it is. Did you never know that before? "'It's everyone's duty to get married.' Ralph meditated a moment. He was disappointed. There was something in Miss Stackpole he had begun to like. It seemed to him that if she was not a charming woman, she was at least a very good sort. She was wanting in distinction, but as Isabel had said, she was brave, she went into the cages, she flourished lashes like a spangled lion-tamer. He had not supposed her to be capable of vulgar arts, but these last words struck him as a false note. When a marriageable young woman urges matrimony on an unencumbered young man, the most obvious explanation of her conduct is not the altruistic impulse. "'Ah, well, now, there's a good deal to be said about that,' Ralph rejoined. "'There may be, but that's the principal thing. I must say I think it looks very exclusive going round all alone, as if you thought no woman was good enough for you.' Do you think you're better than anyone else in the world? In America, it's usual for people to marry. If it's my duty, Ralph asked, is it not, by analogy, yours as well? Mrs. Stackpole's ocular surfaces unwinkingly caught the sun. 
Have you the fond hope of finding a flaw in my reasoning? Of course, I've as good a right to marry as any one else. Well, then, said Ralph, I won't say it vexes me to see you single. It delights me, rather. You're not serious yet. You never will be. Shall you not believe me to be so on the day, I tell you, I desire to give up the practice of going around alone? Miss Stackpole looked at him for a moment, in a manner which seemed to announce a reply that might technically be called encouraging. But to his great surprise this expression suddenly resolved itself into an appearance of alarm and even of resentment. No, not even then, she answered dryly. After which she walked away. "'I've not conceived a passion for your friend,' Ralph said that evening to Isabel, though we talked some time this morning about it. "'And you said something she didn't like?' the girl replied. Ralph stared. "'Has she complained of me?' "'She told me she thinks there's something very low in the tone of Europeans towards women.' "'Does she call me a European?' "'One of the worst.' She told me you had said to her something that an American never would have said, but she didn't repeat it. Ralph treated himself to a luxury of laughter. She's an extraordinary combination. Did she think I was making love to her? No, I believe even Americans do that. But she apparently thought you mistook the intention of something she had said and put an unkind construction on it. I thought she was proposing marriage to me and I accepted her. Was that unkind? Isabel smiled. It was unkind to me. I don't want you to marry. My dear cousin, what's one to do among you all? Ralph demanded. Miss Stackpole tells me it's my bounden duty, and that it's hers in general to see I do mine. She has a great sense of duty, said Isabel gravely. She has indeed, and it's the motive of everything she says. That's what I like her for. She thinks it's unworthy of you to keep so many things to yourself. That's what she wanted to express. If you thought she was trying to... to attract you, you were very wrong. It's true it was an odd way, but I did think she was trying to attract me. Forgive my depravity. You're very conceited. She had no interested views, and never supposed you would think she had. One must be very modest, then, to talk with such women, Ralph said humbly. But it's a very strange type. She's too personal, considering that she expects other people not to be. She walks in without knocking at the door. Yes, Isabel admitted. She doesn't sufficiently recognize the existence of knockers. And indeed, I'm not sure that she doesn't think them rather a pretentious ornament. She thinks one's door should stand ajar but I persist in liking her. I persist in thinking her too familiar, Ralph rejoined, naturally somewhat uncomfortable under the sense of having been doubly deceived in Miss Stackpole. Well, said Isabel, smiling, I'm afraid it's because she's rather vulgar that I like her. She would be flattered by your reason. If I should tell her, I wouldn't express it in that way. I should say it's because there's something of the people in her. What do you know about the people, and what does she, for that matter? She knows a great deal, and I know enough to feel that she's a kind of emanation of the great democracy, of the continent, the country, the nation. I don't say that she sums it all up, that it would be too much to ask of her, but she suggests it, she vividly figures it. You like her, then, for patriotic reasons. I'm afraid it's on those very grounds I object to her. Ah, said Isabel, with a kind of joyous sigh, I like so many things. If a thing strikes me with a certain intensity, I accept it. I don't want to swagger, but I suppose I'm rather versatile. I like people to be totally different from Henrietta, in the style of Lord Warburton's sisters, for instance. So long as I look at the Mrs. Molyneux, they seem to me to answer a kind of ideal. Then Henrietta presents herself and I'm straight away convinced by her, not so much in respect to herself as in respect to what mass is behind her. Ah, you mean the back view of her, Ralph suggested. What she says is true, his cousin answered. You'll never be serious. 
I like the great country stretching away beyond the rivers and across the prairies, blooming and smiling, and spreading till it stops at the green Pacific. A strong, sweet, fresh odour seems to rise from it, and Henrietta, pardon my simile, has something of that odour in her garments. Isabel blushed a little as she concluded this speech, and the blush, together with the momentary ardour she had thrown into it, was so becoming to her, that Ralph stood smiling at her for a moment after she had ceased speaking. "'I'm not sure the Pacific's so green as that,' he said, "'but you're a young woman of imagination. Henrietta, however, does smell of the future. It almost knocks one down.'" End of chapter 10「Eleven and Twelve of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. He took a resolve after this not to misinterpret her words, even when Miss Stackpole appeared to strike the personal note most strongly. He bethought himself that persons, in her view, were simple and homogeneous organisms, and that he, for his own part, was too perverted a representative of the nature of man to have a right to deal with her in strict reciprocity. He carried out his resolve with a great deal of tact, and the young lady found in renewed contact with him no obstacle to the exercise of her genius for unshrinking inquiry, the general application of her confidence. Her situation at Garden Court, therefore, appreciated as we have seen her to be by Isabel, and full of appreciation herself, of that free play of intelligence which, to her sense, rendered Isabel's character a sister spirit, and of the easy venerableness of Mr. Touchett, whose noble tone, as she said, met with her full approval, her situation at Garden Court would have been perfectly comfortable had she not conceived an irresistible mistrust of the little lady for whom she had at first supposed herself obliged to allow as mistress of the house. She presently discovered, in truth, that this obligation was of the lightest, and that Mrs. Touchett cared very little how Miss Stackpole behaved. Mrs. Touchett had defined her to Isabel as both an adventuress and a bore, adventuress as usually giving one more of a thrill. She had expressed some surprise at her niece's having selected such a friend, yet had immediately added that she knew Isabel's friends were her own affair, and that she had never undertaken to like them all, or to restrict the girl to those she liked. "'If you could see none but the people I like, my dear, you'd have a very small society,' Mrs. Touchett frankly admitted, "'and I don't think I like any man or woman well enough to recommend them to you. When it comes to recommending, it's a serious affair. I don't like Miss Stackpole. Everything about her displeases me. She talks so much too loud, and looks at one as if one wanted to look at her, which one doesn't. I'm sure she has lived all her life in a boarding-house, and I detest the manners and the liberties of such places. If you ask me if I prefer my own manners, which you doubtless think very bad, I'll tell you that I prefer them immensely. Miss Stackpole knows I detest boarding-house civilization, and she detests me for detesting it, because she thinks it the highest in the world. She'd like Garden Court a great deal better, if it were a boarding-house. For me, I find it almost too much of one. We shall never get on together, therefore, and there's no use trying." Mrs. Touchett was right in guessing that Henrietta disapproved of her, but she had not quite put her finger on the reason. A day or two after Miss Stackpole's arrival, she had made some invidious reflections on American hotels, which excited a vein of counter-argument on the part of the correspondent of the interviewer, who, in the exercise of her profession, had acquainted herself in the Western world with every form of caravansary. Henrietta expressed the opinion that American hotels were the best in the world, and Mrs. Touchett, fresh from a renewed struggle with them, recorded a conviction that they were the worst. Ralph, with his experimental geniality, suggested, by way of healing the breach, that the truth lay between the two extremes, and that the establishments in question ought to be described as fair middling. 
This contribution to the discussion, however, Miss Stackpole rejected with scorn. Middling, indeed. If they were not the best in the world, they were the worst, but there was nothing middling about an American hotel. "'We judge from different points of view, evidently,' said Mrs. Touchett. "'I like to be treated as an individual. You like to be treated as a party.' "'I don't know what you mean,' Henrietta replied. "'I like to be treated as an American lady.' "'Poor American ladies!' cried Mrs. Touchett, with a laugh. "'They're the slaves of slaves.' "'They're the companions of freemen,' Henrietta retorted. "'They're the companions of their servants, "'the Irish chambermaid and the negro waiter. "'They share their work.' "'Do you call the domestics in an American household slaves?' "'Miss Stackpole inquired. "'If that's the way you desire to treat them, "'no wonder you don't like America.' "'If you've not got good servants, you're miserable,' Mrs. Touchett serenely said. "'They're very bad in America, but I have five perfect ones in Florence.' "'I don't see what you want with five. Henrietta couldn't help observing. "'I don't think I should like to see five persons surrounding me in that menial position.' "'I like them in that position better than in some others,' proclaimed Mrs. Touchett with much meaning.' "'Should you like me better if I were your butler, dear?' her husband asked. "'I don't think I should. You wouldn't at all have the tenue.' "'The companions of freemen. I like that, Miss Stackpole,' said Ralph. "'It's a beautiful description.' "'When I said freemen, I didn't mean you, sir.' And this was the only reward that Ralph got for his compliment. Miss Stackpole was baffled. She evidently thought there was something treasonable in Mrs. Touchett's appreciation of a class which she privately judged to be a mysterious survival of feudalism. It was perhaps because her mind was oppressed with this image that she suffered some days to elapse before she took occasion to say to Isabel, "'My dear friend, I wonder if you're growing faithless.' "'Faithless? Faithless to you, Henrietta?' "'No, that would be a great pain.' "'But it's not that. "'Faithless to my country, then?' "'Ah, that, I hope, will never be. "'When I wrote to you from Liverpool, "'I said I had something particular to tell you. "'You never asked me what it is. "'Is it because you've suspected?' "'Suspected what? "'As a rule, I don't think I suspect,' said Isabel. "'I remember now that phrase in your letter, "'but I confess I had forgotten it. "'What have you to tell me?' Henrietta looked disappointed, and her steady gaze betrayed it. "'You don't ask that right, as if you thought it important. You're changed. You're thinking of other things.' "'Tell me what you mean, and I'll think of that.' "'Will you really think of it? That's what I wish to be sure of.' "'I've not much control of my thoughts, but I'll do my best,' said Isabel. Henrietta gazed at her in silence for a period which tried Isabel's patience, so that our heroine added at last, "'Do you mean that you're going to be married?' "'Not till I've seen Europe,' said Miss Stackpole. "'What are you laughing at?' she went on. "'What I mean is that Mr. Goodwood came out in the steamer with me.' "'Ah!' Isabel responded. "'You say that right. I had a good deal of talk with him. He has come after you.' "'Did he tell you so?' "'No, he told me nothing. That's how I knew it.' said Henrietta cleverly. He said very little about you, but I spoke of you a good deal. Isabel waited. At the mention of Mr. Goodwood's name, she had turned a little pale. I'm very sorry you did that, she observed at last. It was a pleasure to me, and I liked the way he listened. I could have talked a long time to such a listener. He was so quiet, so intense. He drank it all in. "'What did you say about me?' Isabel asked. "'I said you were, on the whole, the finest creature I knew.' "'I'm very sorry for that. He thinks too well of me already. He oughtn't to be encouraged.' "'He's dying for a little encouragement. I see his face now, and his earnest, absorbed look, while I talked. I never saw an ugly man look so handsome.' "'He's very simple-minded,' said Isabel, "'and he's not so ugly.' There's nothing so simplifying as a grand passion. 
It's not a grand passion. I'm very sure it's not that. You don't say that as if you were sure. Isabel gave a rather cold smile. I shall say it better to Mr. Goodwood himself. He'll soon give you a chance, said Henrietta. Isabel offered no answer to this assertion, which her companion made with an air of great confidence. He'll find you changed, the latter pursued. You've been affected by your new surroundings. Very likely. I'm affected by everything. By everything but Mr. Goodwood, Miss Stackpole exclaimed, with a slightly harsh hilarity. Isabel failed even to smile back, and in a moment she said, Did he ask you to speak to me? Not in so many words, but his eyes asked it, and his handshake when he bade me good-bye. Thank you for doing so, and Isabel turned away. Yes, you're changed. You've got new ideas over here, her friend continued. I hope so, said Isabel. One should get as many new ideas as possible. Yes, but they shouldn't interfere with the old ones when the old ones have been the right ones. Isabel turned about again. If you mean that I had any idea with Mr. Goodwood, but she faltered before her friend's implacable glitter. My dear child, you certainly encouraged him. Isabel made for the moment as if to deny this charge, instead of which, however, she presently answered, it's very true, I did encourage him. And then she asked if her companion had learned from Mr. Goodwood what he intended to do. It was a concession to her curiosity, for she disliked discussing the subject and found Henrietta wanting in delicacy. I asked him, and he said he meant to do nothing, Miss Stackpole answered. But I don't believe that. He's not a man to do nothing. He is a man of high, bold action. Whatever happens to him, he'll always do something, and whatever he does will always be right. I quite believe that. Henrietta might be wanting in delicacy, but it touched the girl all the same to hear this declaration. Ah, you do care for him, her visitor rang out. Whatever he does will always be right, Isabel repeated. When a man's of that infallible mould, what does it matter to him what one feels? It may not matter to him, but it matters to oneself. Ah, what it matters to me, that's not what we're discussing, said Isabel with a cold smile. This time her companion was grave. Well, I don't care, you have changed. You're not the girl you were a few short weeks ago, and Mr. Goodwood will see it. I expect him here any day. I hope he'll hate me then, said Isabel. I believe you hope it about as much as I believe him capable of it. To this observation our heroine made no return. She was absorbed in the alarm given her by Henrietta's intimation that Caspar Goodwood would present himself at Garden Court. She pretended to herself, however, that she thought the event impossible, and later she communicated her disbelief to her friend. For the next forty-eight hours, nevertheless, she stood prepared to hear the young man's name announced. The feeling pressed upon her, it made the air sultry, as if there were to be a change of weather, and the weather, socially speaking, had been so agreeable during Isabel's stay at Garden Court that any change would be for the worse. Her suspense, indeed, was dissipated the second day. She had walked into the park in company with the sociable Bunchy, and after strolling about for some time, in a manner at once listless and restless, had seated herself on a garden bench within sight of the house beneath a spreading beech, where, in a white dress ornamented with black ribbons, she formed among the flickering shadows a graceful and harmonious image. She entertained herself for some moments with talking to the little terrier, as to whom the proposal of an ownership divided with her cousin had been applied as impartially as possible, as impartially as Bunchy's own somewhat fickle and inconstant sympathies would allow. But she was notified for the first time on this occasion of the finite character of Bunchy's intellect. Hitherto she had been mainly struck with its extent. It seemed to her at last that she would do well to take a book, Formerly, when heavy-hearted, she had been able, with the help of some well-chosen volume, 
to transfer the seat of consciousness to the organ of pure reason. Of late it was not to be denied, literature had seemed a fading light, and even after she had reminded herself that her uncle's library was provided with a complete set of those authors which no gentleman's collection should be without, she sat motionless and empty-handed, her eyes bent on the cool green turf of the lawn. Her meditations were presently interrupted by the arrival of a servant who handed her a letter. The letter bore the London postmark and was addressed in a hand she knew. That came into her vision, already so held by him, with the vividness of the writer's voice or his face. The document proved short and may be given entire. My dear Miss Archer, I don't know whether you will have heard of my coming to England, but even if you have not, it will scarcely be a surprise to you. You will remember that when you gave me my dismissal at Albany three months ago, I did not accept it. I protested against it. You, in fact, appeared to accept my protest, and to admit that I had the right on my side. I had come to see you with the hope that you would let me bring you over to my conviction. My reasons for entertaining this hope had been of the best. But you disappointed it. I found you changed, and you were able to give me no reason for the change. You admitted that you were unreasonable, and it was the only concession you would make, but it was a very cheap one, because that's not your character. No, you are not, and you never will be, arbitrary or capricious. Therefore it is that I believe you will let me see you again. You told me that I'm not disagreeable to you, and I believe it, for I don't see why that should be. I shall always think of you, I shall never think of anyone else. I came to England simply because you are here. I couldn't stay at home after you had gone. I hated the country because you were not in it. If I like this country at present, it is only because it holds you. I have been to England before, but have never enjoyed it much. May I not come and see you for half an hour? This at present is the dearest wish of yours faithfully, Caspar Goodwood. Isabel read this missive with such deep attention that she had not perceived an approaching tread on the soft grass. Looking up, however, as she mechanically folded it, she saw Lord Warburton standing before her. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 She put the letter into her pocket and offered her visitor a smile of welcome, exhibiting no trace of discomposure and half surprised at her coolness. They told me you were out here, said Lord Warburton, and as there was no one in the drawing-room, and it's really you that I wish to see, I came out with no more ado. Isabel had got up. She felt a wish for the moment that he should not sit down beside her. I was just going indoors. Please don't do that. It's much jollier here. I've ridden over from Lockley. It's a lovely day. His smile was peculiarly friendly and pleasing, and his whole person seemed to omit that radiance of good feeling and good fare which had formed the charm of the girl's first impression of him. It surrounded him like a zone of fine June weather. "'We'll walk about a little, then,' said Isabel, who could not divest herself of the sense of an intention on the part of her visitor, and who wished both to elude the intention and to satisfy her curiosity about it. It had flashed upon her vision once before, and it had given her on that occasion, as we know, a certain alarm. The alarm was composed of several elements, not all of which were disagreeable. She had indeed spent some days in analysing them, and had succeeded in separating the pleasant part of the idea of Lord Warburton's making up to her from the painful. It may appear to some readers that the young lady was both precipitate and unduly fastidious, but the latter of these facts, if the charge be true, may serve to exonerate her from the discredit of the former. She was not eager to convince herself that a territorial magnet, as she had heard Lord Warburton called, was smitten with her charms. The fact of a declaration from such a source carrying with it really more questions than it would answer. She had received a strong impression of his being a personage, and she had occupied herself in examining the image so conveyed. 
At the risk of adding to the evidence of her self-sufficiency, it must be said that there had been moments when this possibility of admiration by a personage represented to her an aggression almost to the degree of an affront, quite to the degree of an inconvenience. She had never yet known a personage. There had been no personages in this sense in her life. There were probably none such at all in her native land. When she had thought of individual eminence, she had thought of it on the basis of character and wit, of what one might like in a gentleman's mind and in his talk. She herself was a character, she couldn't help being aware of that, and hitherto her visions of a completed consciousness had connected themselves largely with moral images, things as to which the question would be whether they pleased her sublime soul. Lord Warburton loomed up before her, largely and brightly, as a collection of attributes and powers which were not to be measured by this simple rule, but which demanded a different sort of appreciation an appreciation that the girl, with her habit of judging quickly and freely, felt she lacked patience to bestow. He appeared to demand of her something that no one else, as it were, had presumed to do. What she felt was that a territorial, a political, a social magnet had conceived the design of drawing her into the system in which he rather invidiously lived and moved. A certain instinct, not imperious but persuasive, told her to resist, murmured to her that virtually she had a system and an orbit of her own. It told her other things besides, things which both contradicted and confirmed each other, that a girl might do much worse than trust herself to such a man, and that it would be very interesting to see something of his system from his own point of view, that on the other hand, however, there was evidently a great deal of it which she should regard only as a complication of every hour, and that even in the whole there was something stiff and stupid which would make it a burden. Furthermore, there was a young man lately come from America who had no system at all, but who had a character of which it was useless for her to try to persuade herself that the impression on her mind had been light. The letter she carried in her pocket all sufficiently reminded her of the contrary. Smile not, however, I venture to repeat, at this simple young woman from Albany, who debated whether she should accept an English peer before he had offered himself, and who was disposed to believe that on the whole she could do better. She was a person of great good faith, and if there was a great deal of folly in her wisdom, those who judge her severely may have the satisfaction of finding that, later, she became consistently wise only at the cost of an amount of folly which will constitute almost a direct appeal to charity. Lord Warburton seemed quite ready to walk, to sit, or to do anything that Isabel should propose, and he gave her this assurance with his usual air of being particularly pleased to exercise a social virtue but he was, nevertheless, not in command of his emotions, and as he strolled beside her for a moment, in silence, looking at her without letting her know it, there was something embarrassed in his glance and his misdirected laughter. Yes, assuredly, as we have touched on the point, we may return to it for a moment again. The English are the most romantic people in the world, and Lord Warburton was about to give an example of it. He was about to take a step which would astonish all his friends and displease a great many of them, and which had superficially nothing to recommend it. The young lady who trod the turf beside him had come from a queer country across the sea, which he knew a good deal about. Her antecedents, her associations, were very vague to his mind, except in so far as they were generic, and in this sense they showed as distinct and unimportant. Miss Archer had neither a fortune nor the sort of beauty that justifies a man to the multitude, and he calculated that he had spent about twenty-six hours in her company. He had summed up all this, the perversity of the impulse, which had declined to avail itself of the most liberal opportunities to subside, and the judgment of mankind as exemplified particularly in the more quickly judging half of it. He had looked these things well in the face, and then had dismissed them from his thoughts. He cared no more for them than for the rosebud in his buttonhole. 
It is the good fortune of a man who, for the greater part of a lifetime, has abstained without effort from making himself disagreeable to his friends, that when the need comes for such a course, it is not discredited by irritating associations. "'I hope you had a pleasant ride,' said Isabel, who observed her companion's hesitancy. "'It would have been pleasant, if for nothing else, than that it brought me here.' "'Are you so fond of Garden Court?' the girl asked, more and more sure that he meant to make some appeal to her, wishing not to challenge him if he hesitated, and yet to keep all the quietness of her reason if he proceeded. It suddenly came upon her that her situation was one which a few weeks ago she would have deemed deeply romantic, the park of an old English country house with the foreground embellished by a great, as she supposed, nobleman in the act of making love to a young lady who, on careful inspection, should be found to present remarkable analogies with herself. But if she was now the heroine of the situation, she succeeded scarcely the less in looking at it from the outside. "'I care nothing for Garden Court,' said her companion. "'I care only for you.' "'You've known me too short a time to have a right to say that, and I can't believe you're serious.' These words of Isabel's were not perfectly sincere, for she had no doubt whatever that he himself was. They were simply a tribute to the fact, of which he was perfectly aware, that those he had just uttered would have excited surprise on the part of a vulgar world. And moreover, if anything beside the sense she had already acquired, that Lord Warburton was not a loose thinker, had been needed to convince her, the tone in which he replied would quite have served the purpose. One's right in such a matter is not measured by the time, Miss Archer. It's measured by the feeling itself. If I were to wait three months, it would make no difference. I shall not be more sure of what I mean than I am to-day. Of course I've seen you very little, but my impression dates from the very first hour we met. I lost no time. I fell in love with you then. It was at first sight, as the novels say. I know now that's not a fancy phrase, and I shall think better of novels for evermore. Those two days I spent here settled it. I don't know whether you suspected I was doing so, but I paid, mentally speaking, I mean, the greatest possible attention to you. Nothing you said, nothing you did, was lost upon me. When you came to Lockley the other day, or rather when you went away, I was perfectly sure. Nevertheless, I made up my mind to think it over, and to question myself narrowly. I've done so. All these days I've done nothing else. I don't make mistakes about such things. I'm a very judicious animal. I don't go off easily, but when I'm touched, it's for life. It's for life, Miss Archer, it's for life, Lord Warburton repeated in the kindest, tenderest, pleasantest voice Isabel had ever heard, and looking at her with eyes charged with the light of a passion that had sifted itself clear of the baser parts of emotion, the heat, the violence, the unreason, and that burned as steadily as a lamp in a windless place. By tacit consent as he talked, they had walked more and more slowly, and at last they stopped and he took her hand. "'Ah, Lord Warburton, how little you know me,' Isabel said very gently. Gently, too, she drew her hand away. Don't taunt me with that. That I don't know you better makes me unhappy already. It's all my loss. But that's what I want, and it seems to me I'm taking the best way. If you'll be my wife, then I shall know you, and when I tell you all the good I think of you, you'll not be able to say it's from ignorance. If you know me little, I know you even less, said Isabel. You mean that, unlike yourself, I may not approve on acquaintance? Ah, of course that's very possible. But think, to speak to you as I do, how determined I must be to try and give satisfaction. You do like me rather, don't you? I like you very much, Lord Warburton, she answered, and at this moment she liked him immensely. I thank you for saying that. It shows you don't regard me as a stranger. I really believe I've filled all the other relations of life very creditably and I don't see why I shouldn't fill this one, in which I offer myself to you, seeing that I care so much more about it. 
Ask the people who know me well. I've friends who'll speak for me. I don't need the recommendation of your friends, said Isabel. Ah, now that's delightful of you. You believe in me yourself. Completely, Isabel declared. She quite glowed there, inwardly, with the pleasure of feeling she did. The light in her companion's eyes turned into a smile, and he gave a long exhalation of joy. If you're mistaken, Miss Archer, let me lose all I possess. She wondered whether he meant this for a reminder that he was rich, and on the instant felt sure that he didn't. He was thinking that, as he would have said himself, and indeed he might safely leave it to the memory of any interlocutor, especially of one to whom he was offering his hand. Isabel had prayed that she might not be agitated, and her mind was tranquil enough even while she listened and asked herself what it was best she should say, to indulge in this incidental criticism. What she should say, had she asked herself? Her foremost wish was to say something, if possible, not less kind than what he had said to her. His words had carried perfect conviction with them. She felt she did, also mysteriously, matter to him. "'I thank you more than I can say for your offer,' she returned at last. "'It does me great honor. "'Ah, don't say that,' he broke out. "'I was afraid you'd say something like that. "'I don't see what you've to do with that sort of thing.' I don't see why you should thank me. It's I who ought to thank you for listening to me. A man you know so little coming down to you with such a thumper. Of course, it's a great question. I must tell you that I'd rather ask it than have to answer myself. But the way you've listened, or at least your having listened at all, gives me some hope. Don't hope too much, Isabel said. Oh, Miss Archer, her companion murmured, smiling again in his seriousness, as if such a warning might perhaps be taken but as the play of high spirits, the exuberance of elation. "'Should you be greatly surprised if I were to beg you not to hope at all?' Isabel asked. "'Surprised? I don't know what you mean by surprise. It wouldn't be that. It would be a feeling very much worse.' Isabel walked on again. She was silent for some minutes. I'm very sure that, highly as I already think of you, my opinion of you, if I should know you well, would only rise. But I'm by no means sure that you wouldn't be disappointed. And I say that not in the least out of conventional modesty. It's perfectly sincere. I'm willing to risk it, Miss Archer, her companion replied. It's a great question, as you say. It's a very difficult question. I don't expect you, of course, to answer it outright. Think it over as long as it may be necessary. If I can gain by waiting, I'll gladly wait a long time. Only remember that in the end, my dearest happiness depends on your answer. I should be very sorry to keep you in suspense, said Isabel. Oh, don't mind. I'd much rather have got a good answer six months hence than a bad one today. But it's very probable that even six months hence I shouldn't be able to give you one that you think good. Why not, since you really like me? Ah, oh, you must never doubt that, said Isabel. Well, then, I don't see what more you can ask. It's not what I ask. It's what I can give. I don't think I should suit you. I really don't think I should. You needn't worry about that. That's my affair. You needn't be a better royalist than the king. It's not only that, said Isabel, but I'm not sure I wish to marry anyone. Very likely you don't. I've no doubt a great many women begin that way, said his lordship, who, be it averred, did not in the least believe in the axiom he thus beguiled his anxiety by uttering. But they're frequently persuaded. Ah, uh, that's because they want to be and Isabel lightly laughed. Her suitor's countenance fell, and he looked at her for a while in silence. "'I'm afraid it's my being an Englishman that makes you hesitate,' he said presently. "'I know your uncle thinks you ought to marry in your own country.' Isabel listened to this assertion with some interest. It had never occurred to her that Mr. Touchett was likely to discuss her matrimonial prospects with Lord Warburton. "'Has he told you that?' 
I remember his making the remark. He spoke, perhaps, of Americans generally. He appears himself to have found it very pleasant to live in England. Isabel spoke in a manner that might have seemed a little perverse, but which expressed both her constant perception of her uncle's outward felicity and her general disposition to elude any obligation to take a restricted view. It gave her companion hope, and he immediately cried with warmth, "'Ah, my dear Miss Archer, old England's a very good sort of country, you know, and it will be still better when we furbished it up a little.' "'Oh, don't furbish it, Lord Warburton. Leave it alone. I like it this way.' "'Well, then, if you like it, I'm more and more unable to see your objection to what I propose.' "'I'm afraid I can't make you understand.' "'You ought at least to try. I've a fair intelligence. "'Are you afraid? Afraid of the climate? "'We can easily live elsewhere, you know. "'You can pick out your climate the whole world over.' "'These words were uttered with a breadth of candour "'that was like the embrace of strong arms, "'that was like the fragrance straight in her face, "'and by his clean, breathing lips, "'of she knew not what strange gardens, "'what charged airs.' She would have given her little finger at that moment to feel strongly and simply the impulse to answer, Lord Warburton, it's impossible for me to do better in this wonderful world, I think, than commit myself very gratefully to your loyalty. But though she was lost in admiration of her opportunity, she managed to move back into the deepest shade of it, even as some wild caught creature in a vast cage. The splendid security so offered her was not the greatest she could conceive. What she finally bethought herself of saying was something very different, something that deferred the need of really facing her crisis. Don't think me unkind if I ask you to say no more about this today. Certainly, certainly, her companion cried. I wouldn't bore you for the world. You've given me a great deal to think about, and I promise you to do it justice. That's all I ask of you, of course, and that you'll remember how absolutely my happiness is in your hands. Isabel listened with extreme respect to this admonition, but she said after a minute, I must tell you that what I shall think about is some way of letting you know that what you ask is impossible, letting you know it without making you miserable. There's no way to do that, Miss Archer. I won't say that if you refuse me you'll kill me. I shall not die of it, but I shall do worse. I shall live to no purpose. You'll live to marry a better woman than I. Don't say that, please, said Lord Warburton very gravely. That's fair to neither of us. To marry a worse one, then. If there are better women than you, I prefer the bad ones. That's all I can say, he went on with the same earnestness. There's no accounting for tastes. His gravity made her feel equally grave, and she showed it by again requesting him to drop the subject for the present. I'll speak to you myself very soon. Perhaps I shall write to you. At your convenience, yes, he replied. Whatever time you take, it must seem to me long, and I suppose I must make the best of that. I shall not keep you in suspense. I only want to collect my mind a little. He gave a melancholy sigh, and stood looking at her a moment with his hands behind him, giving short nervous shakes to his hunting crop. Do you know I'm very much afraid of it, of that remarkable mind of yours? Our heroine's biographer can scarcely tell why, but the question made her start and brought a conscious blush to her cheek. She returned his look a moment, and then with a note in her voice that might almost have appealed to his compassion, So am I, my lord, she oddly exclaimed. His compassion was not stirred, however. All he possessed of the faculty of pity was needed at home. Ah, be merciful, be merciful, he murmured. I think you had better go, said Isabel. I'll write to you. Very good, but whatever you write, I'll come and see you, you know. And then he stood reflecting, his eyes fixed on the observant countenance of Bunchy, 
who had the air of having understood all that had been said and of pretending to carry off the indiscretion by a simulated fit of curiosity as to the roots of an ancient oak there's one thing more he went on you know if you don't like lockley if you think it's damp or anything of that sort you need never go within fifty miles of it it's not damp by the way i've had the house thoroughly examined it's perfectly safe and right but if you shouldn't fancy it you needn't dream of living in it there's no difficulty whatever about that there are plenty of houses i thought i'd just mention it some people don't like a moat you know good-bye i adore a moat said isabel good-bye he held out his hand and she gave him hers a moment a moment long enough for him to bend his handsome bared head and kiss it then still agitating in his mastered emotion his implement of the chase he walked rapidly away he was evidently much upset isabel herself was upset but she had not been affected as she would have imagined what she felt was not a great responsibility a great difficulty of choice it appeared to her that there had been no choice in the question she couldn't marry lord warburton the idea failed to support any enlightened prejudice in favour of the free exploration of life that she had hitherto entertained or was now capable of entertaining she must write this to him she must convince him and that duty was comparatively simple but what disturbed her in the sense that it struck her with wonderment was this very fact that it cost her so little to refuse a magnificent chance with whatever qualifications one would lord warburton had offered her a great opportunity the situation might have discomforts might contain oppressive might contain narrowing elements might prove really but a stupefying anodyne but she did her sex no injustice in believing that nineteen women out of twenty would have accommodated themselves to it without a pang why then upon her also should it not irresistibly impose itself who was she what was she that she should hold herself superior what view of life what design upon fate what conception of happiness had she that pretended to be larger than these large these fabulous occasions if she wouldn't do such a thing as that then she must do great things she must do something greater poor isabel found ground to remind herself from time to time that she must not be too proud and nothing could be more sincere than her prayer to be delivered from such a danger the isolation and loneliness of pride had for her mind the horror of a desert place if it had been pride that interfered with her accepting lord warburton such a bêtise was singularly misplaced and she was so conscious of liking him that she ventured to assure herself it was the very softness and the fine intelligence of sympathy she liked him too much to marry him that was the truth something assured her there was a fallacy somewhere in the glowing logic of the proposition as he saw it even though she mightn't put her very finest finger-point on it and to inflict upon a man who offered so much a wife with a tendency to criticise would be a peculiarly discreditable act she had promised him she would consider his question and when after he had left her she wandered back to the bench where he had found her and lost herself in meditation it might have seemed that she was keeping her vow but this was not the case she was wondering if she were not a cold hard priggish person and on her at last getting up and going rather quickly back to the house felt as she had said to her friend really frightened at herself end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the portrait of a lady by henry james this librivox recording is in the public domain it was this feeling and not the wish to ask advice she had no desire whatever for that that led her to speak to her uncle of what had taken place she wished to speak to some one she should feel more natural more human and her uncle for this purpose presented himself in a more attractive light than either her aunt or her friend henrietta 
Her cousin, of course, was a possible confidant, but she would have had to do herself violence to air this special secret to Ralph. So the next day, after breakfast, she sought the occasion. Her uncle never left his apartment till the afternoon, but he received his cronies, as he said, in his dressing-room. Isabel had quite taken her place in the class so designated, which, for the rest, included the old man's son, his physician, his personal servant, and even Miss Stackpole. Mrs. Touchett did not figure in the list, and this was an obstacle the less to Isabel's finding her host alone. He sat in a complicated mechanical chair, at the open window of his room, looking westward over the park and the river, with his newspapers and letters piled up beside him, his toilet freshly and minutely made, and his smooth, speculative face composed to benevolent expectation. She approached her point directly. I think I ought to let you know that Lord Warburton has asked me to marry him. I suppose I ought to tell my aunt, but it seems best to tell you first. The old man expressed no surprise, but thanked her for the confidence she showed him. Do you mind telling me whether you accepted him? he then inquired. I've not answered him definitely yet. I've taken a little time to think of it, because that seems more respectful but I shall not accept him. Mr. Touchett made no comment upon this. He had the air of thinking that, whatever interest he might take in the matter, from the point of view of sociability, he had no active voice in it. Well, I told you you'd be a success over here. Americans are highly appreciated. Very highly indeed, said Isabel, but at the cost of seeming both tasteless and ungrateful, I don't think I can marry Lord Warburton. Well, her uncle went on, of course an old man can't judge for a young lady. I'm glad you didn't ask me before you made up your mind. I suppose I ought to tell you, he added slowly, but as it were not of much consequence, that I've known all about it these three days. About Lord Warburton's state of mind? About his intentions, as they say here. He wrote me a very pleasant letter, telling me all about them. Should you like to see his letter? the old man obligingly asked. Thank you. I don't think I care about that. But I'm glad he wrote to you. It was right that he should, and he would be certain to do what was right. Ah, well, I guess you do like him, Mr. Touchett declared. You needn't pretend you don't. I like him extremely. I'm very free to admit that but I don't wish to marry anyone just now. You think someone may come along whom you like better? Well, that's very likely, said Mr. Touchett, who appeared to wish to show his kindness to the girl by easing off her decision, as it were, and finding cheerful reasons for it. I don't care if I don't meet anyone else. I like Lord Warburton quite well enough. She fell into that appearance of a sudden change of point of view, with which she sometimes startled and even displeased her interlocutors. Her uncle, however, seemed proof against either of these impressions. "'He's a very fine man,' he resumed in a tone which might have passed for that of encouragement. "'His letter was one of the pleasantest I've received for some weeks. I suppose one of the reasons I liked it was that it was all about you. That is all except the part that was about himself.' I suppose he told you all that. He would have told me everything I wished to ask him, Isabel said. But you didn't feel curious? My curiosity would have been idle once I had determined to decline his offer. You didn't find it sufficiently attractive? Mr. Touchett inquired. She was silent a little. I suppose it was that, she presently admitted, but I don't know why. Fortunately, ladies are not obliged to give reasons, said her uncle. There's a great deal that's attractive about such an idea, but I don't see why the English should want to entice us away from our native land. I know that we try to attract them over there, but that's because our population is insufficient. Here, you know, they're rather crowded. However, I presume there's room for charming young ladies everywhere. There seems to have been room here for you, said Isabel whose eyes had been wandering over the large pleasure spaces of the park. Mr. Touchett gave a shrewd, conscious smile. There's room everywhere, my dear, if you'll pay for it. 
I sometimes think I've paid too much for this. Perhaps you also might have to pay too much. Perhaps I might, the girl replied. That suggestion gave her something more definite to rest on than she had found in her own thoughts, and the fact of this association of her uncle's mild acuteness with her dilemma seemed to prove that she was concerned with the natural and reasonable emotions of life, and not altogether a victim to intellectual eagerness and vague ambitions, ambitions reaching beyond Lord Warburton's beautiful appeal, reaching to something indefinable and possibly not commendable. In so far as the indefinable had an influence upon Isabel's behaviour at this juncture, it was not the conception, even unformulated, of a union with Caspar Goodwood, for however she might have resisted conquest at her English suitor's large, quiet hands, she was at least as far removed from the disposition to let the young man from Boston take positive possession of her. The sentiment in which she sought refuge after reading his letter was a critical view of his having come abroad, for it was part of the influence he had upon her that he seemed to deprive her of the sense of freedom. There was a disagreeably strong push, a kind of hardness of presence, in his way of rising before her. She had been haunted at moments by the image, by the danger of his disapproval, and had wondered, a consideration she had never paid in equal degree to anyone else, whether he would like what she did. The difficulty was that more than any man she had ever known, more than poor Lord Warburton, she had begun now to give his lordship the benefit of this epithet, Caspar Goodwood expressed for her an energy, and she had already felt it as a power, that was of his very nature. It was in no degree a matter of his advantages. It was a matter of the spirit that sat in his clear-burning eyes like some tireless watcher at a window. She might like it or not but he insisted ever with his whole weight and force. Even in one's usual contact with him, one had to reckon with that. The idea of a diminished liberty was particularly disagreeable to her at present, since she had just given a sort of personal accent to her independence by looking so straight at Lord Warburton's big bribe, and yet turning away from it. Sometimes Caspar Goodwood had seemed to range himself on the side of her destiny, to be the stubbornest fact she knew. She said to herself at such moments that she might evade him for a time, but that she must make terms with him at last, terms which would be certain to be favourable to himself. Her impulse had been to avail herself of the things that helped her to resist such an obligation, and this impulse had been much concerned in her eager acceptance of her aunt's invitation which had come to her at an hour when she expected from day to day to see Mr. Goodwood, and when she was glad to have an answer ready for something she was sure he would say to her. When she had told him at Albany, on the evening of Mrs. Touchett's visit, that she couldn't then discuss difficult questions, dazzled as she was by the great immediate opening of her aunt's offer of Europe, he declared that this was no answer at all, and it was now to obtain a better one that he was following her across the sea. To say to herself that he was a kind of grim fate was well enough for a fanciful young woman who was able to take much for granted in him, but the reader has a right to a nearer and clearer view. He was the son of a proprietor of well-known cotton mills in Massachusetts, a gentleman who had accumulated a considerable fortune in the exercise of this industry. Casper at present managed the works, and with a judgment and a temper which, in spite of keen competition and languid years, had kept their prosperity from dwindling. He had received the better part of his education at Harvard College, where, however, he had gained renown rather as a gymnast and an oarsman than as a gleaner of more dispersed knowledge. Later on he had learned that the finer intelligence, too, could vault and pull and strain, might even, breaking the record, treat itself to rare exploits. He had thus discovered in himself a sharp eye for the mystery of mechanics, and had invented an improvement in the cotton-spinning process, which was now largely used and was known by his name. You might have seen it in the newspapers, in connection with this fruitful contrivance 
assurance of which he had given to Isabel by showing her in the columns of the New York Interviewer an exhaustive article on the Goodwood patent, an article not prepared by Miss Stackpole, friendly as she had proved herself to his more sentimental interests. There were intricate, bristling things he rejoiced in. He liked to organize, to contend, to administer. He could make people work his will, believe in him, march before him, and justify him. This was the art, as they said, of managing men, which rested in him further on a bold though brooding ambition. It struck those who knew him well that he might do greater things than carry on a cotton factory. There was nothing cottony about Caspar Goodwood, and his friends took for granted that he would somehow and somewhere write himself in bigger letters. But it was as if something large and confused, something dark and ugly, would have to call upon him. He was not, after all, in harmony with mere smug peace and greed and gain, an order of things of which the vital breath was ubiquitous advertisement. It pleased Isabel to believe that he might have ridden on a plunging steed, the whirlwind of a great war, a war like the civil strife that had over-darkened her conscious childhood and his ripening youth. She liked, at any rate, this idea of his being by character and, in fact, a mover of men, liked it much better than some other points in his nature and aspect. She cared nothing for his cotton mill. The Goodwood patent left her imagination absolutely cold. She wished him no ounce less of his manhood, but she sometimes thought he would be rather nicer if he looked, for instance, a little differently. His jaw was too square and set, and his figure too straight and stiff. These things suggested a want of easy consonance with the deeper rhythms of life. Then she viewed with reserve a habit he had of dressing always in the same manner. It was not apparently that he wore the same clothes continually, for on the contrary his garments had a way of looking rather too new. But they all seemed of the same piece. The figure, the stuff, was so drearily usual. She had reminded herself more than once that this was a frivolous objection to a person of his importance, and then she had amended the rebuke by saying that it would be a frivolous objection only if she were in love with him. She was not in love with him, and therefore might criticize his small defects as well as his great, which latter consisted in the collective reproach of his being too serious, or rather not of his being so, since one could never be, but certainly of his seeming so. He showed his appetites and designs too simply and artlessly. When one was alone with him, he talked too much about the same subject, and when other people were present, he talked too little about anything. And yet he was of supremely strong, clean make, which was so much. She saw the different fitted parts of him, as she had seen, in museums and portraits, the different fitted parts of armoured warriors in plates of steel handsomely inlaid with gold. It was very strange. Where ever was any tangible link between her impression and her act? Caspar Goodwood had never corresponded to her idea of a delightful person, and she supposed that this was why he left her so harshly critical. When, however, Lord Warburton, who not only did correspond with it, but gave an extension to the term, appealed to her approval, she found herself still unsatisfied. It was certainly strange. The sense of her incoherence was not a help to answering Mr. Goodwood's letter, and Isabel determined to leave it a while unhonoured. If he had determined to persecute her, he must take the consequences, foremost among which was his being left to perceive how little it charmed her that he should come down to Garden Court. She was already liable to the incursions of one suitor at this place, and though it might be pleasant to be appreciated in opposite quarters, there was a kind of grossness in entertaining two such passionate pleaders at once, even in a case where the entertainment should consist of dismissing them. She made no reply to Mr. Goodwood, but at the end of three days she wrote to Lord Warburton, and the letter belongs to our history. Dear Lord Warburton, a great deal of earnest thought has not led me to change my mind about the suggestion you were so kind to make to me the other day. I am not, I am really and truly not, 
able to regard you in the light of a companion for life, or to think of your home, your various homes, as the settled seat of my existence. These things cannot be reasoned about, and I very earnestly entreat you not to return to the subject we discussed so exhaustively. We see our lives from our own point of view. That is the privilege of the weakest and humblest of us, and I shall never be able to see mine in the manner you proposed. Kindly let this suffice you, and do me the justice to believe that I have given your proposal the deeply respectful consideration it deserves. It is with this very great regard that I remain sincerely yours, Isabel Archer. While the author of this missive was making up her mind to dispatch it, Henrietta Stackpole formed a resolve which was accompanied by no demur. She invited Ralph Touchett to take a walk with her in the garden, and when he had assented with that alacrity which seemed constantly to testify to his high expectations, she informed him that she had a favour to ask of him. It may be admitted that at this information the young man flinched, for we know that Miss Stackpole had struck him as apt to push an advantage. The alarm was unreasoned, however, for he was clear about the area of her indiscretion as little as advised of his vertical depth, and he made a very civil profession of the desire to serve her. He was afraid of her, and presently told her so. When you look at me in a certain way, my knees knock together, my faculties desert me, I'm filled with trepidation, and I ask only for strength to execute your commands. You've an address that I've never encountered in any woman. Well, Henrietta replied good-humouredly, if I had not known before that you were trying somehow to abash me, I should know it now. Of course I'm easy game. I was brought up with such different customs and ideas. I'm not used to your arbitrary standards, and I've never been spoken to in America as you have spoken to me. If a gentleman conversing with me over there were to speak to me like that, I shouldn't know what to make of it. We take everything more naturally over there, and after all we're a great deal more simple. I admit that. I'm very simple myself. Of course, if you choose to laugh at me for it, you're very welcome, but I think on the whole I would rather be myself than you. I'm quite content to be myself. I don't want to change. There are plenty of people that appreciate me just as I am. It's true they're nice, fresh, free-born Americans. Henrietta had lately taken up the tone of helpless innocence and large concession. "'I want you to assist me a little,' she went on. "'I don't care in the least whether I amuse you while you do so, or rather I'm perfectly willing your amusement should be your reward. I want you to help me about Isabel.' "'Has she injured you?' Ralph asked. "'If she had, I shouldn't mind, and I should never tell you. What I'm afraid of is that she'll injure herself.' "'I think that's very possible,' said Ralph. His companion stopped in the garden walk, fixing on him perhaps the very gaze that unnerved him. "'That, too, would amuse you, I suppose. The way you do say things. I never heard anyone so indifferent.' "'To Isabel? Ah, not that.' "'Well, you're not in love with her, I hope.' "'How can I be when I'm in love with another?' You're in love with yourself, that's the other, Miss Stackpole declared. Much good may it do you. But if you wish to be serious once in your life, here's a chance. And if you really care for your cousin, here's an opportunity to prove it. I don't expect you to understand her. That's too much to ask. But you needn't do that to grant my favour. I'll supply the necessary intelligence. I shall enjoy that immensely, Ralph exclaimed. I'll be Caliban, and you shall be Ariel. You're not at all like Caliban, because you're sophisticated, and Caliban was not. But I'm not talking about imaginary characters. I'm talking about Isabel. Isabel's intensely real. What I wish to tell you is that I find her fearfully changed. Since you came, do you mean? Since I came, and before I came, she's not the same as she once so beautifully was as she was in America? Yes, in America. I suppose you know she comes from there. She can't help it, but she does. Do you want to change her back again? 
"'Of course I do, and I want you to help me.' "'Ah,' said Ralph, "'I'm only Caliban. I'm not Prospero.' "'You were Prospero enough to make her what she has become. "'You've acted on Isabel Archer since she came here, Mr. Touchett.' "'I, my dear Miss Stackpole, never in the world. "'Isabel Archer has acted on me. "'Yes, she acts on everyone. "'But I've been absolutely passive.' "'You're too passive, then. "'You had better stir yourself and be careful. "'Isabel's changing every day. "'She's drifting away, right out to sea. "'I've watched her, and I can see it. "'She's not the bright American girl she was. "'She's taking different views, a different colour, "'and turning away from her old ideals. "'I want to save those ideals, Mr. Touchett, "'and that's where you come in.' "'Not surely is an ideal.' "'Well, I hope not,' Henrietta replied promptly. "'I've got a fear in my heart that she's going to marry one of these fell Europeans, and I want to prevent it.' "'Ah, I see,' cried Ralph. "'And to prevent it you want me to step in and marry her?' "'Not quite. That remedy would be as bad as the disease, for you're the typical, the fell European from whom I wish to rescue her. No, I wish you to take an interest in another person.' a young man to whom she once gave great encouragement and whom she now doesn't seem to think good enough he's a thoroughly grand man and a very dear friend of mine and i wish very much you would invite him to pay a visit here ralph was puzzled by this appeal and it is perhaps not to the credit of his purity of mind that he failed to look at it first in the simplest light it wore to his eyes a tortuous air and his fault was that he was not quite sure that anything in the world could really be as candid as this request of Miss Stackpole's appeared. That a young woman should demand that a gentleman whom she described as her very dear friend should be furnished with an opportunity to make himself agreeable to another young woman, a young woman whose attention had wandered and whose charms were greater, this was an anomaly which for the moment challenged all his ingenuity of interpretation to read between the lines was easier than to follow the text and to suppose that miss stackpole wished the gentleman invited to garden court on her own account was the sign not so much of a vulgar as of an embarrassed mind even from this venial act of vulgarity however ralph was saved and saved by a force that I can only speak of as inspiration. With no more outward light on the subject than he already possessed, he suddenly acquired the conviction that it would be a sovereign injustice to the correspondent of the interviewer to assign a dishonourable motive to any act of hers. This conviction passed into his mind with extreme rapidity and it was perhaps kindled by the pure radiance of the young lady's imperturbable gaze. He returned this challenge a moment, consciously, resisting an inclination to frown as one frowns in the presence of large luminaries. "'Who's the gentleman you speak of?' "'Mr. Caspar Goodwood, of Boston. He has been extremely attentive to Isabel, just as devoted to her as he can live.' He has followed her out here, and he's at present in London. I don't know his address, but I guess I can obtain it. I've never heard of him, said Ralph. Well, I suppose you haven't heard of every one. I don't believe he has ever heard of you, but that's no reason why Isabel shouldn't marry him. Ralph gave a mild, ambiguous laugh. What a rage you have for marrying people. Do you remember how you wanted to marry me the other day? I've got over that. You don't know how to take such ideas. Mr. Goodwood does, however, and that's what I like about him. He's a splendid man and a perfect gentleman, and Isabel knows it. Is she very fond of him? If she isn't, she ought to be. He's simply wrapped up in her. And you wish me to ask him here, said Ralph reflectively. It would be an act of true hospitality. "'Casper Goodwood,' Ralph continued. "'It's rather a striking name.' "'I don't care anything about his name. "'It might be Ezekiel Jenkins, and I should say the same. "'He's the only man I have ever seen "'whom I think worthy of Isabel.' "'You're a very devoted friend,' said Ralph. "'Of course I am. 
If you say that to pour scorn on me, I don't care. I don't say it to pour scorn on you. I'm very much struck with it. You're more satiric than ever, but I advise you not to laugh at Mr. Goodwood. I assure you I'm very serious. You ought to understand that, said Ralph. In a moment his companion understood it. I believe you are. Now you're too serious. You're difficult to please. Oh, you're very serious indeed. You won't invite Mr. Goodwood. I don't know, said Ralph. I'm capable of strange things. Tell me a little about Mr. Goodwood. What's he like? He's just the opposite of you. He's at the head of a cotton factory, a very fine one. Has he pleasant manners? asked Ralph. Splendid manners, in the American style. Would he be an agreeable member of our little circle? I don't think he'd care much about our little circle. He'd concentrate on Isabel. And how would my cousin like that? Very possibly not at all. But it will be good for her. It will call back her thoughts. Call them back? From where? From foreign parts and other unnatural places. Three months ago she gave Mr. Goodwood every reason to suppose he was acceptable to her, and it's not worthy of Isabel to go back on a real friend simply because she has changed the scene. I've changed the scene, too, and the effect of it has been to make me care more for my old associations than ever. It's my belief that the sooner Isabel changes it back again, the better. I know her well enough to know that she would never be truly happy over here and I wish her to form some strong American tie that will act as a preservative. "'Aren't you perhaps a little too much in a hurry?' Ralph inquired. "'Don't you think you ought to give her more of a chance in poor old England?' "'A chance to ruin her bright young life? One's never too much in a hurry to save a precious human creature from drowning.' "'As I understand it, then,' said Ralph, you wish me to push Mr. Goodwood overboard after her. Do you know, he added, that I've never heard her mention his name? Henrietta gave a brilliant smile. I'm delighted to hear that. It proves how much she thinks of him. Ralph appeared to allow that there was a good deal in this, and he surrendered to thought while his companion watched him askance. If I should invite Mr. Goodwood, he finally said, it would be to quarrel with him. Don't do that. He'd prove the better man. You certainly are doing your best to make me hate him. I really don't think I can ask him. I should be afraid of being rude to him. It's as you please, Henrietta returned. I had no idea you were in love with her yourself. Do you really believe that? The young man asked with lifted eyebrows. That's the most natural speech I've ever heard you make. Of course I believe it, Miss Stackpole ingeniously said. Well, Ralph concluded, to prove to you that you're wrong, I'll invite him. It must be, of course, as a friend of yours. It will not be as a friend of mine that he'll come, and it will not be to prove to me that I'm wrong that you'll ask him, but to prove it to yourself. These last words of Miss Stackpole's on which the two presently separated, contained an amount of truth which Ralph Touchett was obliged to recognize, but it so far took the edge from too sharp a recognition that in spite of his suspecting it would be rather more indiscreet to keep than to break his promise, he wrote Mr. Goodwood a note of six lines, expressing the pleasure it would give Mr. Touchett the elder that he should join a little party at Garden Court of which Miss Stackpole was a valued member. Having sent his letter, to the care of a banker whom Henrietta suggested, he waited in some suspense. He had heard this fresh, formidable figure named for the first time, for when his mother had mentioned on her arrival that there was a story about the girls having an admirer at home, the idea had seemed deficient in reality, and he had taken no pains to ask questions the answers to which would involve only the vague or the disagreeable. Now, however, the native admiration of which his cousin was the object had become more concrete. It took the form of a young man who had followed her to London, who was interested in a cotton mill, and had manners in the most splendid of the American styles. 
Ralph had two theories about this intervener. Either his passion was a sentimental fiction of Miss Stackpole's, there was always a sort of tacit understanding among women, born of the solidarity of the sex, that they should discover or invent lovers for each other, in which case he was not to be feared, and would probably not accept the invitation. Or else he would accept the invitation, and in this event prove himself a creature too irrational to demand further consideration. The latter clause of Ralph's argument might have seemed incoherent, but it embodied his conviction that if Mr. Goodwood were interested in Isabel in the serious manner described by Miss Stackpole, he would not care to present himself at Garden Court on a summons from the latter lady. On this supposition, said Ralph, he must regard her as a thorn on the stem of his rose, as an intercessor he must find her wanting intact. Two days after he had sent his invitation, he received a very short note from Gaspar Goodwood, thanking him for it, regretting that other engagements made a visit to Garden Court impossible, and presenting many compliments to Miss Stackpole. Ralph handed the note to Henrietta, who, when she had read it, exclaimed, "'Well, I never have heard of anything so stiff!' "'I'm afraid he doesn't care so much about my cousin as you suppose,' Ralph observed. "'No, it's not that. It's some subtler motive. His nature's very deep. But I'm determined to fathom it, and I shall write to him to know what he means.' His refusal of Ralph's overtures was vaguely disconcerting. From the moment he declined to come to Garden Court, our friend began to think of him of importance. He asked himself what it signified to him whether Isabel's admirers should be desperados or laggards. They were not rivals of his and were perfectly welcome to act out their genius. Nevertheless, he felt much curiosity as to the result of Miss Stackpole's promised inquiry into the causes of Mr. Goodwood's stiffness. A curiosity for the present ungratified, inasmuch as when he asked her three days later, if she had written to London, she was obliged to confess she had written in vain. Mr. Goodwood had not replied. "'I suppose he's thinking it over,' she said. "'He thinks everything over. He's not really at all impetuous. But I'm accustomed to having my letters answered the same day.' She presently proposed to Isabel, at all events, that they should make an excursion to London together. "'If I must tell the truth,' she observed, I'm not seeing much at this place, and I shouldn't think you were either. I've not even seen that aristocrat, what's his name, Lord Washburton. He seems to let you severely alone. Lord Warburton's coming tomorrow, I happen to know, replied her friend, who had received a note from the master of Lockley in answer to her own letter. You'll have every opportunity of turning him inside out. "'Well, he may do for one letter, but what's one letter when you want to write fifty? I've described all the scenery in this vicinity, and raved about all the old women and donkeys. You may say what you please, scenery doesn't make a vital letter. I must go back to London and get some impressions of real life. I was there but three days before I came away, and that's hardly time to get in touch.' As Isabel, on her journey from New York to Garden Court, had seen even less of the British capital than this, it appeared a happy suggestion of Henrietta's that the two should go thither on a visit of pleasure. The idea struck Isabel as charming. She was curious of the thick detail of London, which had always loomed large and rich to her. They turned over their schemes together and indulged in visions of romantic hours. They would stay at some picturesque old inn, one of the inns described by Dickens, and drive over the town in those delightful hansoms. Henrietta was a literary woman, and the great advantage of being a literary woman was that you could go everywhere and do everything. They would dine at a coffee house and go afterwards to the play. They would frequent the Abbey and the British Museum and find out where Dr. Johnson had lived and Goldsmith and Addison. Isabel grew eager and presently unveiled the bright vision to Ralph, who burst into a fit of laughter which scarce expressed the sympathy she had desired. "'It's a delightful plan,' he said. 
I advise you to go to the Duke's Head in Covent Garden, an easy, informal, old-fashioned place, and I'll have you put down at my club. Do you mean it's improper? Isabel asked. Dear me, isn't anything proper here? With Henrietta, surely I may go anywhere. She isn't hampered in that way. She has travelled over the whole American continent, and can at least find her way about this minute island. Ah, then, said Ralph, let me take advantage of her protection to go up to town as well. I may never have a chance to travel so safely. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Stackpole would have prepared to start immediately, but Isabel, as we have seen, had been notified that Lord Warburton would come again to Garden Court, and she believed it her duty to remain there and see him. For four or five days he had made no response to her letter. Then he had written very briefly to say he would come to luncheon two days later. There was something in these delays and postponements that touched the girl, and renewed her sense of his desire to be considerate and patient, not to appear to urge her too grossly, a consideration the more studied that she was so sure he really liked her. Isabel told her uncle she had written to him, mentioning also his intention of coming, and the old man in consequence left his room earlier than usual, and made his appearance at the two o'clock repast. This was by no means an act of vigilance on his part, but the fruit of a benevolent belief that his being of the company might help to cover any conjoined straying away, in case Isabel should give their noble visitor another hearing. That personage drove over from Lockley, and brought the elder of his sisters with him, a measure presumably dictated by reflections of the same order as Mr. Touchett's. The two visitors were introduced to Miss Stackpole, who, at luncheon, occupied a seat adjoining Lord Warburton's. Isabel, who was nervous and had no relish for the prospect of again arguing the question he had so prematurely opened, could not help admiring his good-humoured self-possession, which quite disguised the symptoms of that preoccupation with her presence it was only natural she should suppose him to feel. He neither looked at her nor spoke to her, and the only sign of his emotion was that he avoided meeting her eyes. He had plenty of talk for the others, however, and he appeared to eat his luncheon with discrimination and appetite. Miss Molyneux, who had a smooth, nun-like forehead, and wore a large silver cross suspended from her neck, was evidently preoccupied with Henrietta Stackpole upon whom her eyes constantly rested in a manner suggesting a conflict between deep alienation and yearning wonder. Of the two ladies from Lockley, she was the one Isabel had liked best. There was such a world of hereditary quiet in her. Isabel was sure, moreover, that her mild forehead and silver cross referred to some weird Anglican mystery, some delightful reinstitution, perhaps, of the quaint office of the canoness. She wondered what Miss Molyneux would think of her if she knew Miss Archer had refused her brother, and then she felt sure that Miss Molyneux would never know, that Lord Warburton never told her such things. He was fond of her and kind to her, but on the whole he told her little. Such at least was Isabel's theory, when, at table, she was not occupied in conversation, she was usually occupied in forming theories about her neighbours. According to Isabel, if Miss Molyneux should ever learn what had passed between Miss Archer and Lord Warburton, she would probably be shocked at such a girl's failure to rise, or no, rather, this was our heroine's last position, she would impute to the young American but a due consciousness of inequality. Whatever Isabel might have made of her opportunities, at all events, Henrietta Stackpole was by no means disposed to neglect those in which she now found herself immersed. "'Do you know you're the first lord I've ever seen?' she said very promptly to her neighbour. "'I suppose you think I'm awfully benighted.' 
"'You've escaped seeing some very ugly men,' Lord Warburton answered, looking a trifle absently about the table. "'Are they very ugly? They try to make us believe in America that they're all handsome and magnificent, and that they wear wonderful robes and crowns.' "'Ah, the robes and crowns are gone out of fashion,' said Lord Warburton, "'like your tomahawks and revolvers.' "'I'm sorry for that. I think an aristocracy ought to be splendid,' Henrietta declared. "'If it's not that, what is it?' "'Oh, you know, it isn't much at the best,' her neighbour allowed. "'Won't you have a potato?' "'I don't care much for these European potatoes. I shouldn't know you from an ordinary American gentleman.' "'Do talk to me as if I were one,' said Lord Warburton. "'I don't see how you manage to get on without potatoes. "'You must find so few things to eat over here.' "'Henrietta was silent a little. "'There was a chance he was not sincere. "'I've had hardly any appetite since I've been here,' she went on at last. "'So it doesn't much matter. "'I don't approve of you, you know. "'I feel as if I ought to tell you that.' "'Don't approve of me?' "'Yes, I don't suppose anyone ever said such a thing to you before, did they? "'I don't approve of lords as an institution. "'I think the world has got beyond them, far beyond.' "'Oh, so do I. "'I don't approve of myself in the least. "'Sometimes it comes over me. "'How should I object to myself if I were not myself, don't you know? "'But that's rather good, by the way, not to be vainglorious.' "'Why don't you give it up, then?' Miss Stackpole inquired. "'Give up, uh, asked Lord Warburton, meeting her harsh inflection with a very mellow one. "'Give up being a lord.' "'Oh, I'm so little of one. One would really forget all about it if you wretched Americans were not constantly reminding one. However, I do think of giving it up, the little there is left of it, one of these days.' "'I should like to see you do it,' Henrietta exclaimed rather grimly. "'I'll invite you to the ceremony. We'll have a supper and a dance.' "'Well,' said Miss Stackpole, "'I like to see all sides. I don't approve of a privileged class, but I like to hear what they have to say for themselves.' "'Mighty little, as you see.' "'I should like to draw you out a little more,' Henrietta continued. "'But you're always looking away. You're afraid of meeting my eye.' I see you want to escape me. No, I'm only looking for those despised potatoes. Please explain about that young lady, your sister, then. I don't understand about her. Is she a lady? She's a capital good girl. I don't like the way you say that, as if you wanted to change the subject. Is her position inferior to yours? We neither of us have any position to speak of. "'But she's better off than I, because she has none of the bother.' "'Yes, she doesn't look as if she had much bother. "'I wish I had as little bother as that. "'You do produce quiet people over here, whatever else you may do.' "'Ah, you see one takes life easily on the whole,' said Lord Warburton. "'And then you know we're very dull. "'Ah, we can be dull when we try.' "'I should advise you to try something else.' I shouldn't know what to talk to your sister about. She looks so different. Is that silver cross a badge? A badge? A sign of rank. Lord Warburton's glance had wandered a good deal, but at this it met the gaze of his neighbour. Oh, yes, he answered in a moment. The women go in for those things. The silver cross is worn by the eldest daughters of Viscounts which was his harmless revenge for having occasionally had his credulity too easily engaged in America. After luncheon he proposed to Isabel to come into the gallery and look at the pictures, and though she knew he had seen the pictures twenty times, she complied without criticising this pretext. Her conscience now was very easy. Ever since she sent him her letter, she had felt particularly light of spirit. He walked slowly to the end of the gallery, staring at its contents and saying nothing. And then he suddenly broke out. I hoped you wouldn't write to me that way. It was the only way, Lord Warburton, said the girl. Do try and believe that. If I could believe it, of course I should let you alone. But we can't believe by willing it, and I confess I don't understand. 
I could understand your disliking me, that I could understand well. But that you should admit you do... What have I admitted? Isabel interrupted, turning slightly pale. That you think me a good fellow, isn't that it? She said nothing, and he went on. You don't seem to have any reason, and that gives me a sense of injustice. I have a reason, Lord Warburton. She said it in a tone that made his heart contract. I should very much like to know it. I'll tell you some day when there's more to show for it. Excuse my saying that in the meantime I must doubt of it. You make me very unhappy, said Isabel. I'm not sorry for that. It may help you to know how I feel. Will you kindly answer me a question? Isabel made no audible assent, but he apparently saw in her eyes something that gave him courage to go on. Do you prefer someone else? That's a question I'd rather not answer. Ah, you do, then, her suitor murmured with bitterness. The bitterness touched her, and she cried out, You're mistaken, I don't. He sat down on a bench, unceremoniously, doggedly, like a man in trouble, leaning his elbows on his knees and staring at the floor. I can't even be glad of that, he said at last, throwing himself back against the wall, for that would be an excuse. She raised her eyebrows in surprise. An excuse? Must I excuse myself? He paid, however, no answer to the question. Another idea had come into his head. Is it my political opinions? Do you think I go too far? I can't object to your political opinions because I don't understand them. You don't care what I think, he cried, getting up. It's all the same to you. Isabel walked to the other side of the gallery and stood there showing him her charming back, her light slim figure, the length of her white neck as she bent her head, and the density of her dark braids. She stopped in front of a small picture as if for the purpose of examining it, and there was something so young and free in her movement that her very pliancy seemed to mock at him. Her eyes, however, saw nothing. They had suddenly been suffused with tears. In a moment he followed her, and by this time she had brushed her tears away. But when she turned round her face was pale, and the expression of her eyes strange. That reason that I wouldn't tell you, I'll tell you it after all. It's that I can't escape my fate. Your fate? I should try to escape it if I were to marry you. I don't understand. Why should not that be your fate as well as anything else? Because it's not, said Isabel, femininely. I know it's not. It's not my fate to give up. I know it can't be. Poor Lord Warburton stared, an interrogative point in either eye. Do you call marrying me giving up? Not in the usual sense. It's getting, getting, getting a great deal. But it's giving up other chances. Other chances for what? I don't mean chances to marry, said Isabel, her colour quickly coming back to her. And then she stopped, looking down with a deep frown, as if it were hopeless to attempt to make her meaning clear. "'I don't think it presumptuous in me to suggest that you'll gain more than you'll lose,' her companion observed. "'I can't escape unhappiness,' said Isabel. "'In marrying you, I shall be trying to.' "'I don't know whether you'd try to, but you certainly would. That I must in candour admit,' he exclaimed with an anxious laugh. I mustn't, I can't, cried the girl. Well, if you're bent on being miserable, I don't see why you should make me so. Whatever charms a life of misery may have for you, it has none for me. I'm not bent on a life of misery, said Isabel. I've always been intensely determined to be happy, and I've often believed I should be. I've told people that you can ask them but it comes over me every now and then that I can never be happy in any extraordinary way, not by turning away, by separating myself. By separating yourself from what? From life, from the usual changes and dangers, what most people know and suffer. 
Lord Warburton broke into a smile that almost denoted hope. "'Why, my dear Miss Archer,' he began to explain, with the most considerate eagerness, "'I don't offer you any exoneration from life, or from chances or dangers whatever. I wish I could, depend upon it I would. For what do you take me, pray? Heaven help me, I'm not the Emperor of China. All I offer you is the chance of taking the common lot in a comfortable sort of way. The common lot? Why, I'm devoted to the common lot. Strike an alliance with me, and I promise you that you shall have plenty of it. You shall separate yourself from nothing whatever, not even from your friend Miss Stackpole. She'd never approve of it, said Isabel, trying to smile and take advantage of this side issue, despising herself, too, not a little, for doing so. Are we speaking of Miss Stackpole? his lordship asked impatiently. I never saw a person judge things on such theoretic grounds. Now I suppose you're speaking of me, said Isabel with humility, and she turned away again, for she saw Miss Molyneux enter the gallery, accompanied by Henrietta and by Ralph. Lord Warburton's sister addressed him with a certain timidity, and reminded him she ought to return home in time for tea, as she was expecting company to partake of it. He made no answer, apparently not having heard her. He was preoccupied, and with good reason. Miss Molyneux, as if he had been royalty, stood like a lady in waiting. "'Well, I never, Miss Molyneux,' said Henrietta Stackpole. "'If I wanted to go, he'd have to go. "'If I wanted my brother to do a thing, he'd have to do it.' "'Oh, Warburton does everything one wants,' Miss Molyneux answered with a quick, shy laugh. "'How very many pictures you have,' she went on, turning to Ralph. "'They look a good many because they're all put together,' said Ralph. "'But it's really a bad way.' "'Oh, I think it's so nice.' "'I wish we had a gallery at Lockley. "'I'm so very fond of pictures,' Miss Molyneux went on, "'persistently to Ralph, "'as if she were afraid Miss Stackpole would address her again. "'Henrietta appeared at once to fascinate and to frighten her. "'Ah, yes, pictures are very convenient,' said Ralph, "'who appeared to know better what style of reflection was acceptable to her. "'They're so very pleasant when it rains,' the young lady continued, it has rained of late so very often. "'I'm sorry you're going away, Lord Warburton,' said Henrietta. "'I wanted to get a great deal more out of you.' "'I'm not going away,' Lord Warburton answered. "'Your sister says you must. In America the gentlemen obey the ladies.' "'I'm afraid we have some people to tea,' said Miss Molyneux, looking at her brother. "'Very good, my dear. We'll go.' "'I hoped you would resist,' Henrietta exclaimed. "'I wanted to see what Miss Molyneux would do.' "'I never do anything,' said this young lady. "'I suppose in your position it's sufficient for you to exist,' Miss Stackpole returned. "'I should like very much to see you at home.' "'You must come to Lockley again,' said Miss Molyneux, very sweetly to Isabel, ignoring this remark of Isabel's friend.' Isabel looked into her, her quiet eyes a moment, and for that moment seemed to see in their grey depths the reflection of everything she had rejected in rejecting Lord Warburton, the peace, the kindness, the honour, the possessions, a deep security, and a great exclusion. She kissed Miss Molyneux, and then she said, "'I'm afraid I can never come again.' "'Never again? I'm afraid I'm going away.' "'Oh, I'm so very sorry,' said Miss Molyneux. "'I think that's so very wrong of you.' Lord Warburton watched this little passage. Then he turned away and stared at a picture. Ralph, leaning against the rail before the picture, with his hands in his pockets, had for the moment been watching him. "'I should like to see you at home,' said Henrietta, whom Lord Warburton found beside him. I should like an hour's talk with you. There are a great many questions I wish to ask you. I shall be delighted to see you, the proprietor of Lockley answered, but I'm certain not to be able to answer many of your questions. When will you come? Whenever Miss Archer will take me. We're thinking of going to London, but we'll go and see you first. I'm determined to get some satisfaction out of you. 
If it depends upon Miss Archer, I'm afraid you won't get much. She won't come to Lockley. She doesn't like the place. She told me it was lovely, said Henrietta. Lord Warburton hesitated. She won't come, all the same. You had better come alone, he added. Henrietta straightened herself, and her large eyes expanded. Would you make that remark to an English lady? she inquired with soft asperity. Lord Warburton stared. Yes, if I liked her enough. You'd be careful not to like her enough. If Miss Archer won't visit your place again, it's because she doesn't want to take me. I know what she thinks of me, and I suppose you think the same, that I oughtn't to bring in individuals. Lord Warburton was at a loss. He had not been made acquainted with Miss Stackpole's professional character, and failed to catch her allusion. Miss Archer has been warning you, she therefore went on. Warning me? Isn't that why she came off alone with you here, to put you on your guard? Oh, dear, no, said Lord Warburton brazenly. Our talk had no such solemn character as that. Well, you've been on your guard intensely. I suppose it's natural to you. That's just what I wanted to observe. And so, too, Miss Molyneux. She wouldn't commit herself. You have been warned anyway, Henrietta continued, addressing this young lady. But for you it wasn't necessary. I hope not, said Miss Molyneux vaguely. Miss Stackpole takes notes, Ralph soothingly explained. She's a great satirist. She sees through us all and she works us up. Well, I must say, I never have had such a collection of bad material, Henrietta declared, looking from Isabel to Lord Warburton, and from this nobleman to his sister and to Ralph. There's something the matter with you all. You're as dismal as if you had got a bad cable. You do see through us, Miss Stackpole, said Ralph, in a low tone, giving her a little intelligent nod as he led the party out of the gallery. There's something the matter with us all. Isabel came behind these two. Miss Molyneux, who decidedly liked her immensely, had taken her arm to walk beside her over the polished floor. Lord Warburton strolled on the other side with his hands behind him and his eyes lowered. For some moments he said nothing, and then, "'Is it true you're going to London?' he asked. "'I believe it has been arranged.' And when shall you come back? In a few days, but probably for a very short time. I'm going to Paris with my aunt. When, then, shall I see you again? Not for a good while, said Isabel, but some day or other I hope. Do you really hope it? Very much. He went a few steps in silence. Then he stopped and put out his hand. Good-bye. Good-bye, said Isabel. Miss Molyneux kissed her again, and she let the two depart. After it, without rejoining Henrietta and Ralph, she retreated to her own room, in which apartment before dinner she was found by Mrs. Touchett, who had stopped on her way to the saloon. "'I may as well tell you,' said that lady, "'that your uncle has informed me of your relations with Lord Warburton.' Isabel considered. "'Relations? They're hardly relations.' That's the strange part of it. He has seen me but three or four times. Why did you tell your uncle rather than me? Miss Touchett dispassionately asked. Again the girl hesitated. Because he knows Lord Warburton better. Yes, but I know you better. I'm not sure of that, said Isabel, smiling. Neither am I, after all, especially when you give me that rather conceited look. One would think you were awfully pleased with yourself, and had carried off a prize. I suppose that when you refuse an offer like Lord Warburton's, it's because you expect to do something better. Ah, my uncle didn't say that, cried Isabel, smiling still. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James the LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It had been arranged that the two young ladies should proceed to London under Ralph's escort, though Mrs. Touchett looked with little favour on the plan. 
It was just the sort of plan, she said, that Miss Stackpole would be sure to suggest, and she inquired if the correspondent of the interviewer was to take the party to stay at her favourite boarding-house. "'I don't care where she takes us to stay so long as there's local colour," said Isabel. "'That's what we're going to London for.' "'I suppose that after a girl has refused an English lord, she may do anything,' her aunt rejoined. "'After that one needn't stand on trifles.' "'Should you have liked me to marry Lord Warburton?' Isabel inquired. "'Of course I should.' "'I thought you disliked the English so much.' "'So I do, but it's all the greater reason for making use of them.' "'Is that your idea of marriage?' And Isabel ventured to add that her aunt appeared to her to have made very little use of Mr. Touchett. "'Your uncle's not an English nobleman,' said Mrs. Touchett, "'though even if he had been, I should still probably have taken up my residence in Florence.' "'Do you think Lord Warburton could make me any better than I am?' the girl asked with some animation. "'I don't mean I'm too good to improve. I mean, I mean that I don't love Lord Warburton enough to marry him.' "'You did right to refuse him, then,' said Mrs. Touchett, in her smallest, sparest voice. "'Only the next great offer you get, I hope you'll manage to come up to your standard.' We had better wait until the offer comes before we talk about it. I hope very much I may have no more offers for the present. They upset me completely. You probably won't be troubled with them if you adopt permanently the bohemian manner of life. However, I've promised Ralph not to criticize. I'll do whatever Ralph says is right, Isabel returned. I've unbounded confidence in Ralph. "'His mother's much obliged to you,' this lady dryly laughed. "'It seems to me, indeed, she ought to feel it,' Isabel irrepressibly answered. Ralph had assured her that there would be no violation of decency in their paying a visit, the little party of three, to the sights of the metropolis, but Mrs. Touchett took a different view. Like many ladies of her country who had lived a long time in Europe, she had completely lost her native tact on such points, and in her reaction, not in itself deplorable, against the liberty allowed to young persons beyond the seas, had fallen into gratuitous and exaggerated scruples. Ralph accompanied their visitors to town, and established them at a quiet inn in a street that ran at right angles to Piccadilly. His first idea had been to take them to his father's house in Winchester Square, a large, dull mansion which at this period of the year was shrouded in silence and brown holland. But he bethought himself that, the cook being at Garden Court, there was no one in the house to get them their meals, and Pratt's hotel accordingly became their resting place. Ralph, on his side, found quarters in Winchester Square, having a den there of which he was very fond, and being familiar with deeper fears than that of a cold kitchen. He availed himself largely, indeed, of the resources of Pratt's Hotel, beginning his day with an early visit to his fellow travellers, who had Mr. Pratt in person, in a large, bulging white waistcoat, to remove their dish-covers. Ralph turned up, as he said, after breakfast, and the little party made out a scheme of entertainment for the day. As London wears in the month of September a face blank but for its smears of prior service, the young man, who occasionally took an apologetic tone, was obliged to remind his companion, to Miss Stackpole's high derision, that there wasn't a creature in town. "'I suppose you mean the aristocracy are absent,' Henry answered, "'but I don't think you could have a better proof that if they were absent altogether they wouldn't be missed. It seems to me the place is about as full as it can be. There's no one here, of course, but three or four millions of people.' What is it you call them, the lower middle class? They're only the population of London, and that's of no consequence. Ralph declared that for him the aristocracy left no void that Miss Stackpole herself didn't fill, and that a more contented man was nowhere at that moment to be found. In this he spoke the truth, for the stale September days, in the huge half-empty town, had a charm wrapped in them as a coloured gem might be wrapped in a dusty cloth. 
When he went home at night to the empty house in Winchester Square, after a chain of hours with his comparatively ardent friends, he wandered into the big dusky dining room, where the candle he took from the hall table, after letting himself in, constituted the only illumination. The square was still, the house was still. When he raised one of the windows of the dining room to let in the air, he heard the slow creak of the boots of a lone constable. His own step in the empty place seemed loud and sonorous. Some of the carpets had been raised, and whenever he moved he roused a melancholy echo. He sat down in one of the armchairs. The big, dark dining table twinkled here and there in the small candlelight. The pictures on the wall, all of them very brown, looked vague and incoherent. There was a ghostly presence as of dinners long since digested, of table talk that had lost its actuality. This hint of the supernatural, perhaps, had something to do with the fact that his imagination took a flight and that he remained in his chair a long time beyond the hour at which he should have been in bed, doing nothing, not even reading the evening paper. I say he did nothing, and I maintain the phrase in the face of the fact that he thought at these moments of Isabel. To think of Isabel could only be for him an idle pursuit, leading to nothing, and profiting little to any one. His cousin had not yet seemed to him so charming, as during these days spent in sounding, tourist fashion, the deeps and shallows of the metropolitan element. Isabel was full of premises, conclusions, emotions. If she had come in search of local colour, she found it everywhere. She asked more questions than he could answer, and launched brave theories as to historic cause and social effect that he was equally unable to accept or to refute. The party went more than once to the British Museum, and to that brighter palace of art, which reclaims for antique variety so large an area of a monotonous suburb. They spent a morning in the Abbey, and went on a penny steamer to the Tower. They looked at pictures both in public and private collections, and sat on various occasions beneath the great trees in Kensington Gardens. Henrietta proved an indestructible sightseer, and a more lenient judge than Ralph had ventured to hope. She had indeed many disappointments, and London at large suffered from her vivid remembrance of the strong points of the American civic idea. But she made the best of its dingy dignities, and only heaved an occasional sigh, and uttered a desultory, well, which led no further, and lost itself in retrospect. The truth was that, as she said to herself, she was not in her element. "'I've not a sympathy with inanimate objects,' she remarked to Isabel at the National Gallery, and she continued to suffer from the meagerness of the glimpse that had as yet been vouchsafed to her of the inner life. Landscapes by Turner and Assyrian bulls were a poor substitute for the literary dinner-parties at which she had hoped to meet the genius and renown of Great Britain. "'Where are your public men? Where are your men and women of intellect?' she inquired of Ralph, standing in the middle of Trafalgar Square, as if she had supposed this to be a place where she would naturally meet a few. "'That's one of them on top of the column, you say. Lord Nelson. Was he a lord, too? Wasn't he high enough that they had to stick him a hundred feet in the air? That's the past. I don't care about the past. I want to see some of the leading minds of the present.' I won't say of the future, because I don't believe much in your future. Poor Ralph had a few leading minds among his acquaintance, and rarely enjoyed the pleasure of buttonholing a celebrity, a state of things which appeared to Miss Stackpole to indicate a deplorable want of enterprise. If I were on the other side, I should call, she said, and tell the gentleman, whoever he might be, that I had heard a great deal about him, and had come to see for myself but I gather from what you say that this is not the custom here. You seem to have plenty of meaningless customs, but none of those that would help along. We are in advance, certainly. I suppose I shall have to give up the social side altogether. And Henrietta, though she went about with her guide-book and pencil, and wrote a letter to the interviewer about the tower, 
in which she described the execution of Lady Jane Grey, had a sad sense of falling below her mission. The incident that had preceded Isabel's departure from Garden Court left a painful trace in our young woman's mind. When she felt again in her face, as from a recurrent wave, the cold breath of her last tutor's surprise, she could only muffle her head till the air cleared. She could not have done less than what she did, this was certainly true. But her necessity, all the same, had been as graceless as some physical act in a strained attitude, and she felt no desire to take credit for her conduct. Mixed with this imperfect pride, nevertheless, was a feeling of freedom which in itself was sweet, and which, as she wandered through the great city with her ill-matched companions, occasionally throbbed into odd demonstrations. When she walked in Kensington Gardens, she stopped the children, mainly of the poorer sort, whom she saw playing on the grass. She asked them their names and gave them sixpence, and when they were pretty, kissed them. Ralph noticed these quaint charities. He noticed everything she did. One afternoon, that his companions might pass the time, he invited them to tea in Winchester Square, and he had the house set in order as much as possible for their visit. There was another guest to meet them, an amiable bachelor, an old friend of Ralph's, who happened to be in town, and for whom prompt commerce with Miss Stackpole appeared to have been neither difficulty nor dread. Mr. Bantling, a stout, sleek, smiling man of forty, wonderfully dressed, universally informed, and incoherently amused, laughed immoderately at everything Henrietta said, gave her several cups of tea, examined in her society the bric-a-brac of which Ralph had a considerable collection, and afterwards, when the host proposed they should go out into the square and pretend it was a fête champêtre, walked round the limited enclosure several times with her, and, at a dozen turns of their talk, bounded responsive, as with a positive passion for argument, to her remarks upon the inner life. Oh, I see. I dare say you found it very quiet at Garden Court. Naturally, there's not much going on there when there's such a lot of illness about. Touchett's very bad, you know. The doctors have forbidden his being in England at all, and he has only come back to take care of his father. The old man, I believe, has half a dozen things the matter with him. They call it gout, but to my certain knowledge he has organic disease so developed that you may depend upon it he'll go, some day soon, quite quickly. Of course that sort of thing makes a dreadfully dull house. I wonder they have people when they can do so little for them. Then I believe Mr. Touchett's always squabbling with his wife. She lives away from her husband, you know, in that extraordinary American way of yours. If you want a house where there's always something going on, I recommend you to go down and stay with my sister, Lady Pencil, in Bedfordshire. I'll write to her tomorrow, and I'm sure she'll be delighted to ask you. I know just what you want. You want a house where they go in for theatricals and picnics and that sort of thing. My sister's just that sort of woman. She's always getting up something or other, and she's always glad to have the sort of people who help her. I'm sure she'll ask you down by return of post. She's tremendously fond of distinguished people and writers. She writes herself, you know, but I haven't read everything she has written. It's usually poetry, and I don't go in much for poetry, unless it's Byron. I suppose you think a great deal of Byron in America, Mr. Bantling continued, expanding in the stimulating air of Miss Stackpole's attention, bringing up his sequences promptly, and changing his topic with an easy turn of hand. Yet he none the less gracefully kept in sight of the idea, dazzling to Henrietta, of her going to stay with Lady Pencil in Bedfordshire. I understand what you want. You want to see some genuine English sport. The Touchets aren't English at all, you know. They have their own habits, their own language, their own food. Some odd religion, even, I believe, of their own. The old man thinks it's wicked to hunt, I'm told. You must get down to my sister's in time for the theatricals, and I'm sure she'll be glad to give you a part. I'm sure you act well. I know you're very clever. 
My sister's forty years old and has seven children, but she's going to play the principal part. Plain as she is, she makes up awfully well, I will say for her. Of course, you needn't act if you don't want to. In this manner Mr. Bantling delivered himself while they strolled over the grass in Winchester Square, which, although it had been peppered by the London soot, invited the tread to linger. Henrietta thought her blooming, easy-voiced bachelor, with his impressibility to feminine merit and his splendid range of suggestion, a very agreeable man, and she valued the opportunity he offered her. I don't know, but I would go if your sister should ask me. I think it would be my duty. What do you call her name? Pencil. It's an odd name, but it isn't a bad one. I think one name's as good as another. But what's her rank? Oh, she's a baron's wife, a convenient sort of rank. You're fine enough, and you're not too fine. I don't know but what she'd be too fine for me. What do you call the place she lives in, Bedfordshire? She lives away in the northern corner of it. It's a tiresome country, but I dare say you won't mind it. I'll try and run down while you're there. All this was very pleasant to Miss Stackpole, and she was sorry to be obliged to be separate from Lady Pencil's obliging brother. But it happened that she had met the day before, in Piccadilly, some friends whom she had not seen for a year. The Miss Climbers, two ladies from Wilmington, Delaware, who had been travelling on the continent and were now preparing to re-embark. Henrietta had had a long interview with them on the Piccadilly pavement, and though the three ladies all talked at once, they had not exhausted their store. It had been agreed, therefore, that Henrietta should come and dine with them in their lodgings in German Street at six o'clock on the morrow, and she now bethought herself of this engagement. She prepared to start for German Street, taking leave first of Ralph Touchett and Isabel, who, seated on garden chairs in another part of the enclosure, were occupied, if the term may be used, with an exchange of amenities less pointed than the practical colloquy of Miss Stackpole and Mr. Bantling. When it had been settled between Isabel and her friend, that they should be reunited at some reputable hour at Pratt's Hotel. Ralph remarked that the latter must have a cab. She couldn't walk all the way to German Street. "'I suppose you mean it's improper for me to walk alone,' Henrietta exclaimed. "'Merciful powers, have I come to this?' "'There's not the slightest need of your walking alone,' Mr. Bantling gaily interposed. "'I should be greatly pleased to go with you.' I simply meant that you'd be late for dinner, Ralph returned. Those poor ladies may easily believe that we refuse at the last to spare you. You had better have a hansom, Henrietta, said Isabel. I'll get you a hansom if you'll trust me, Mr. Bantling went on. We might walk a little till we meet one. I don't see why I shouldn't trust him, do you? Henrietta inquired of Isabel. I don't see what Mr. Bantling could do to you, Isabel obligingly answered. But, if you like, we'll walk with you till you find your cab. Never mind, we'll go alone. Come on, Mr. Bantling, and take care you get me a good one. Mr. Bantling promised to do his best, and the two took their departure, leaving the girl and her cousin together in the square, over which a clear September twilight had now begun to gather. It was perfectly still. The wide quadrangle of dusky houses showed lights in none of the windows, where the shutters and blinds were closed, the pavements were a vacant expanse, and putting aside two small children from a neighbouring slum, who, attracted by symptoms of abnormal animation in the interior, poked their faces between the rusty rails of the enclosure, the most vivid object within sight was the big red pillar-post on the southeast corner. Henrietta will ask him to get into the cab and go with her to German Street, Ralph observed. He always spoke of Miss Stackpole as Henrietta. "'Very possibly,' said his companion. "'Or rather, no, she won't,' he went on. "'But Bantling will ask leave to get in.' "'Very likely again. I'm very glad they're such good friends.' "'She has made a conquest. He thinks her a brilliant woman. It may go far,' said Ralph. Isabel was briefly silent. "'I call Henrietta a very brilliant woman, but I don't think it will go far.' 
They would never really know each other. He has not the least idea what she really is, and she has no just comprehension of Mr. Bantling. There's no more usual basis of union than a mutual misunderstanding. But it ought not to be so difficult to understand Bob Bantling, Ralph added. He is a very simple organism. Yes, but Henrietta's a simpler one still. And pray, what am I to do? Isabel asked, looking about her through the fading light, in which the limited landscape gardening of the square took on a large and effective appearance. I don't imagine that you'll propose that you and I, for our amusement, shall drive about London in a hansom. There's no reason we shouldn't stay here, if you don't dislike it. It's very warm. There will be half an hour yet before dark, and if you permit, I'll light a cigarette. You may do as you please, said Isabel, if you'll amuse me till seven o'clock. I propose at that hour to go back and partake of a simple and solitary repast, two poached eggs and a muffin, at Pratt's Hotel. Mayn't I dine with you? Ralph asked. No, you'll dine at your club. They had wandered back to their chairs in the centre of the square again, and Ralph had lighted his cigarette. It would have given him extreme pleasure to be present in person at the modest little feast she had sketched, but in default of this he liked even being forbidden. For the moment, however, he liked immensely being alone with her in the thickening dusk at the centre of the multitudinous town. It made her seem to depend upon him and to be in his power. This power he could exert but vaguely. The best exercise of it was to accept her decision submissively, which indeed there was already an emotion in doing. "'Why won't you let me dine with you?' he demanded, after a pause. "'Because I don't care for it.' "'I suppose you're tired of me.' "'I shall be an hour hence. You see, I have the gift of foreknowledge.' "'Oh, I shall be delightful meanwhile,' said Ralph. But he said nothing more, and as she made no rejoinder, they sat some time in a stillness which seemed to contradict his promise of entertainment. It seemed to him she was preoccupied, and he wondered what she was thinking about. There were two or three very possible subjects. At last he spoke again. Is your objection to my society this evening caused by your expectation of another visitor? She turned her head with a glance of her clear, fair eyes. Another visitor? What visitor should I have? He had none to suggest, which made his question seem to himself silly as well as brutal. You've a great many friends that I don't know. You've a whole past from which I was perversely excluded. You were reserved for my future. You must remember that my past is over there across the water. There's none of it here in London. Very good, then, since your future is seated beside you. Capital thing to have your future so handy. And Ralph lighted another cigarette, and reflected that Isabel probably meant she had received news that Mr. Casper Goodwood had crossed to Paris. After he had lighted his cigarette, he puffed it a while, and then he resumed. I promised just now to be very amusing, but you see I don't come up to the mark and the fact is there's a good deal of temerity in one's undertaking to amuse a person like you. What do you care for my feeble attempts? You've grand ideas. You've a high standard in such matters. I ought at least to bring in a band of music or a company of mountebanks. One mountebank's enough, and you do very well. Pray go on, and in another ten minutes I shall begin to laugh. I assure you I'm very serious, said Ralph. You do really ask a great deal. I don't know what you mean. I ask nothing. You accept nothing, said Ralph. She coloured, and now suddenly it seemed to her that she guessed his meaning. But why should he speak to her of such things? He hesitated a little, and then he continued. There's something I should like very much to say to you. It's a question I wish to ask. It seems to me I've a right to ask it, because I've a kind of interest in the answer. Ask what you will, Isabel replied gently, and I'll try to satisfy you. Well, then, I hope you won't mind my saying that Warburton has told me of something that has passed between you. Isabel suppressed a start. She sat looking at her open fan. 
Very good. I suppose it was natural he should tell you. I have his leave to let you know he has done so. He has some hope still, said Ralph. Still? He had it a few days ago. I don't believe he has any now, said the girl. I'm very sorry for him, then. He's such an honest man. Pray, did he ask you to talk to me? No, not that. But he told me because he couldn't help it. We're old friends, and he was greatly disappointed. He sent me a line asking me to come and see him, and I drove over to Lockley the day before he and his sister lunched with us. He was very heavy-hearted. He had just got a letter from you. Did he show you the letter? asked Isabel, with momentary loftiness. By no means, but he told me it was a neat refusal. I was very sorry for him, Ralph repeated. For some moments Isabel said nothing, then at last. Do you know how often he had seen me, she inquired? Five or six times. That's to your glory. It's not for that I say it. What then do you say it for? Not to prove that poor Warburton's state of mind superficial, because I'm pretty sure you don't think that. Isabel certainly was unable to say what she thought, but presently she said something else. If you've not been requested by Lord Warburton to argue with me, then you're doing it disinterestedly, or for the love of argument. I've no wish to argue with you at all. I only wish to leave you alone. I'm simply greatly interested in your sentiments. I'm greatly obliged to you, cried Isabel, with a slightly nervous laugh. Of course you mean that I'm meddling in what doesn't concern me. But why shouldn't I speak to you of this matter without annoying you or embarrassing yourself? What's the use of being your cousin if I can't have a few privileges? What's the use of adoring you without hope of a reward if I can't have a few compensations? What's the use of being ill and disabled and restricted to mere spectatorship at the game of life if I really can't see the show when I've paid so much for my ticket? Tell me this, Ralph went on while she listened to him with quickened attention. What had you in mind when you refused Lord Warburton? What had I in mind? What was the logic, the view of your situation that dictated so remarkable an act? I didn't wish to marry him, if that's logic. No, that's not logic, and I knew that before. It's really nothing you know. What was it you said to yourself? You certainly said more than that. Isabel reflected a moment, then answered with a question of her own. Why do you call it a remarkable act? That's what your mother thinks, too. Warburton's such a thorough good sort. As a man, I consider he has hardly a fault. And then he's what they call here no end of a swell. He has immense possessions, and his wife would be thought a superior being. He unites the intrinsic and the extrinsic advantages. Isabel watched her cousin, as to see how far he would go. I refused him because he was too perfect then. I'm not perfect myself, and he's too good for me. Besides, his perfection would irritate me. That's ingenious rather than candid, said Ralph. As a fact, you think nothing in the world too perfect for you. Do you think I'm so good? No, but you're exacting all the same, without the excuse of thinking yourself good. Nineteen women out of twenty, however, even of the most exacting sort, would have managed to do with Warburton. Perhaps you don't know how he has been stalked. I don't wish to know. But it seems to me, said Isabel, that one day when we talked of him, you mentioned odd things to him. Ralph smokingly considered. I hope that what I said then had no weight with you, for they were not false, the things I spoke of. They were simply peculiarities of his position. If I had known he wished to marry you, I'd never have alluded to them. I think I said that as regards that position, he was rather a skeptic. It would have been in your power to make him a believer. I think not. I don't understand the matter, and I'm not conscious of any mission of that sort. You're evidently disappointed, Isabel added, looking at her cousin with rueful gentleness. You'd have liked me to make such a marriage. Not in the least. I'm absolutely without a wish on the subject. 
I don't pretend to advise you, and I content myself with watching you with the deepest interest. She gave rather a conscious sigh. I wish I could be as interesting to myself as I am to you. There, you're not candid again. You're extremely interesting to yourself. Do you know, however, said Ralph, that if you've really given Warburton his final answer, I'm rather glad it has been what it was. I don't mean I'm glad for you, and still less, of course, for him. I'm glad for myself. Are you thinking of proposing to me? By no means. From the point of view I speak of, that would be fatal. I should kill the goose that supplies me with the material of my inimitable omelettes. I use that animal as the symbol of my insane illusions. What I mean is that I shall have the thrill of seeing what a young lady does who won't marry Lord Warburton. That's what your mother counts upon, too, said Isabel. Ah, there will be plenty of spectators. We shall hang on the rest of your career. I shall not see all of it, but I shall probably see the most interesting years. Of course, if you were to marry our friend, you'd still have a career. A very decent, in fact, a very brilliant one. But relatively speaking, it would be a little prosaic. It would be definitely marked out in advance. It would be wanting in the unexpected. You know, I'm extremely fond of the unexpected. And now that you've kept the game in your hands, I depend on your giving us some grand example of it. I don't understand you very well, said Isabel, but I do so well enough to be able to say that if you look for grand examples of anything from me, I shall disappoint you. You'll do so only by disappointing yourself, and that will go hard with you. To this she made no direct reply. There was an amount of truth in it that would bear consideration. At last she said abruptly, I don't see what harm there is in my wishing not to tie myself. I don't want to begin life by marrying. There are other things a woman can do. There's nothing she can do so well. But you're, of course, many-sided. If one's two-sided, it's enough, said Isabel. You're the most charming of polygons, her companion broke out. At the glance from his companion, however, he became grave, and to prove it went on. You want to see life. You'll be hanged if you don't, as the young men say. I don't think I want to see it as the young men want to see it, but I do want to look about me. You want to drain the cup of experience. No, I don't wish to touch the cup of experience. It's a poisoned drink. I only want to see for myself. You want to see, but not to feel, Ralph remarked. I don't think that if one's a sentient being, one can make the distinction. I'm a good deal like Henrietta. The other day when I asked her if she wished to marry, she said, Not till I've seen Europe. I, too, don't wish to marry till I've seen Europe. You evidently expect a crowned head will be struck with you. No, that would be worse than marrying Lord Warburton. But it's getting very dark, Isabel continued, and I must go home. She rose from her place, but Ralph only sat still and looked at her. As he remained there, she stopped, and they exchanged a gaze that was full on either side, but especially on Ralph's, of utterances too vague for words. "'You've answered my question,' he said at last. "'You've told me what I wanted. I'm greatly obliged to you.' "'It seems to me I've told you very little. "'You've told me the great thing, that the world interests you, and that you want to throw yourself into it.' Her silvery eyes shone a moment in the dusk. I never said that. I think you meant it. Don't repudiate it. It's so fine. I don't know what you're trying to fasten upon me, for I'm not in the least an adventurous spirit. Women are not like men. Ralph slowly rose from his seat, and they walked together to the gate of the square. No, he said, women rarely boast of their courage. Men do, with a certain frequency. Men have it to boast of. Women have it too. You've a great deal. Enough to go home in a cab to Pratt's Hotel, but not more. Ralph unlocked the gate, and after they had passed out he fastened it. 
"'We'll find your cab,' he said, and as they turned towards the neighbouring street in which this quest might avail, he asked her again if he mightn't see her safely to the inn. "'By no means,' she answered. "'You're very tired. You must go home and go to bed.' The cab was found, and he helped her into it, standing a moment at the door. "'When people forget I'm a poor creature, I'm often incommoded,' he said. "'But it's worse when they remember it.'" End of chapter 15「Chapters 16 and 17 of The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters 16 and 17 of The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. She had had no hidden motive in wishing him not to take her home. It simply struck her that for some days past she had consumed an inordinate quantity of his time, and the independent spirit of the American girl, whom extravagance of aid places in an attitude that she ends by finding affected, had made her decide that for these few hours she must suffice to herself. She had, moreover, a great fondness for intervals of solitude, which since her arrival in England had been but meagrely met. It was a luxury she could always command at home, and she had wittingly missed it. That evening, however, an incident occurred which, had there been a critic to note it, would have taken all colour from the theory that the wish to be quite by herself had caused her to dispense with her cousin's attendance. Seated toward nine o'clock in the dim illumination of Pratt's Hotel, and trying with the aid of two tall candles to lose herself in a volume she had brought from Garden Court, she succeeded only to the extent of reading other words than those printed on the page, words that Ralph had spoken to her that afternoon. Suddenly the well-muffled knuckle of the waiter was applied to the door, which presently gave way to his exhibition even as a glorious trophy of the card of a visitor. When this memento had offered to her fixed sight the name of Mr. Caspar Goodwood, she let the man stand before her without signifying her wishes. "'Shall I show the gentleman up, ma'am?' he asked, with a slightly encouraging inflection. Isabel hesitated still, and while she hesitated, glanced at the mirror. "'He may come in,' she said at last, and waited for him, not so much smoothing her hair as girding her spirit. Caspar Goodwood was accordingly the next moment shaking hands with her, but saying nothing till the servant had left the room. "'Why didn't you answer my letter?' he then asked in a quick, full, slightly peremptory tone, the tone of a man whose questions were habitually pointed, and who was capable of much insistence. She answered by a ready question. "'How did you know I was here?' "'Miss Stackpole let me know,' said Caspar Goodwood. "'She told me you would probably be at home alone this evening, and would be willing to see me.' "'Where did she see you to tell you that?' "'She didn't see me. She wrote to me.' Isabel was silent. Neither had sat down. They stood there with an air of defiance, or at least of contention. "'Henrietta never told me she was writing to you,' she said at last. "'This is not kind of her.' "'Is it so disagreeable to you to see me?' asked the young man. "'I didn't expect it. I don't like surprises.' "'But you knew I was in town. It was natural we should meet.' "'Do you call this meeting? I hoped I shouldn't see you. In so big a place as London it seemed very possible.' "'It was apparently repugnant to you even to write to me,' her visitor went on. Isabel made no reply. The sense of Henrietta Stackpole's treachery, as she momentarily qualified it, was strong within her. Henrietta is certainly not a model of all the delicacy, she exclaimed with bitterness. It was a great liberty to take. I suppose I'm not a model either, of those virtues or of any others. The fault's mine as much as hers. As Isabel looked at him, it seemed to her that his jaw had never been more square. This might have displeased her, but she took a different turn. No, it's not your fault so much as hers. What you've done was inevitable, I suppose, for you. 
"'It was indeed,' cried Caspar Goodwood, with a voluntary laugh. "'And now that I have come, at any rate mayn't I stay?' "'You may sit down, certainly.' She went back to her chair again, while her visitor took the first place that offered, in the manner of a man accustomed to pay little thought to that sort of furtherance. "'I've been hoping every day for an answer to my letter. You might have written me a few lines.' "'It wasn't the trouble of writing that prevented me. I could as easily have written you four pages as one. But my silence was an intention,' Isabel said. "'I thought it the best thing.' He sat with his eyes fixed on hers while she spoke. Then he lowered them and attached them to a spot in the carpet, as if he were making a strong effort to say nothing but what he ought. He was a strong man in the wrong, and he was acute enough to see that an uncompromising exhibition of his strength would only throw the falsity of his position into relief. Isabel was not incapable of tasting any advantage of position over a person of this quality and though little desirous to flaunt it in his face, she could enjoy being able to say, "'You know you oughtn't to have written to me yourself,' and to say it with an air of triumph. Caspar Goodwood raised his eyes to her own again. They seemed to shine through the visit of a helmet. He had a strong sense of justice, and was ready any day in the year, over and above this, to argue the question of his rights. "'You said you hoped never to hear from me again. I know that.' but I never accepted any such rule as my own. I warned you that you should hear very soon. I didn't say I hoped never to hear from you, said Isabel. Not for five years, then, for ten years, twenty years. It's the same thing. Do you find it so? It seems to me there's a great difference. I can imagine that at the end of ten years we might have a very pleasant correspondence. I shall have matured my epistolary style." She looked away while she spoke these words, knowing them of so much less earnest to cast than the countenance of her listener. Her eyes, however, at last came back to him, just as he said very irrelevantly, "'Are you enjoying your visit with your uncle?' "'Very much indeed.' She dropped, but then she broke out. "'What good do you expect to get by insisting?' "'The good of not losing you.' You've no right to talk of losing what's not yours. And even from your own point of view, Isabel added, you ought to know when to let one alone. I disgust you very much, said Caspar Goodwood gloomily, not as if to provoke her to compassion for a man conscious of this blighting fact, but as if to set it well before himself so that he might endeavour to act with his eyes on it. "'Yes, you don't at all delight me. "'You don't fit in, not in any way, just now. "'And the worst is that your putting it to the proof in this manner "'is quite unnecessary.' "'It wasn't, certainly, as if his nature had been soft, "'so that pinpricks would draw blood from it, "'and from the first of her acquaintance with him, "'and of her having to defend herself against a certain air "'that he had of knowing better what was good for her "'than she knew herself,' she had recognized the fact that perfect frankness was her best weapon. To attempt to spare his sensibility, or to escape from him edgewise, as one might do from a man who had barred the way less sturdily, this in dealing with Caspar Goodwood, who would grasp at everything of every sort that one might give him, was wasted agility. It was not that he had not susceptibilities, but his passive surface, as well as his active, was large and hard, and he might always be trusted to dress his wounds so far as they required it himself. She came back, even for her measure of possible pangs and aches in him, to her old sense that he was naturally plated and steeled, armed essentially for aggression. "'I can't reconcile myself to that,' he simply said. There was a dangerous liberality about it, for she felt how open it was to him to make the point that he had not always disgusted her. "'I can't reconcile myself to it either, and it's not the state of things that ought to exist between us. If you'd only try to banish me from your mind for a few months, we should be on good terms again.' "'I see. If I should cease to think of you at all for a prescribed time, I should find I could keep it up indefinitely.' "'Indefinitely is more than I ask.' It's more even than I should like. 
"'You know that what you ask is impossible,' said the young man, taking his adjective for granted in a manner she found irritating. "'Aren't you capable of making a calculated effort?' she demanded. "'You're strong for everything else. Why shouldn't you be strong for that?' "'An effort calculated for what?' And then, as she hung fire, "'I'm capable of nothing with regard to you,' he went on, "'but just of being infernally in love with you. "'If one's strong, one loves only the more strongly.' "'There's a good deal in that, "'and indeed our young lady felt the force of it, "'felt it thrown off into the vast of truth and poetry "'as practically a bait to her imagination. "'But she promptly came round. "'Think of me or not, as you find most possible, "'only leave me alone.' "'Until when?' "'Well, for a year or two. "'Which do you mean? "'Between one year and two there's all the difference in the world.' "'Call it two, then,' said Isabel, "'with a studied effect of eagerness. "'And what shall I gain by that?' "'her friend asked, with no sign of wincing. "'You'll have obliged me greatly. "'And what will be my reward?' "'Do you need a reward for an act of generosity?' "'Yes, when it involves a great sacrifice. "'There's no generosity without some sacrifice. "'Men don't understand such things. "'If you make the sacrifice, you'll have all my admiration.' "'I don't care a cent for your admiration, "'not one straw with nothing to show for it. "'When will you marry me? "'That's the only question. "'Never, if you go on making me feel only as I feel at present.' "'What do I gain, then, by not trying to make you feel otherwise? "'You'll gain quite as much as by worrying me to death.' "'Casper Goodwood bent his eyes again "'and gazed a while into the crown of his hat. "'A deep flush overspread his face. "'She could see her sharpness had at last penetrated. "'This immediately had a value, classic, romantic, "'redeeming, what did she know, for her?' the strong man in pain was one of the categories of the human appeal little charm as he might exert in the given case why do you make me say such things to you she cried in a trembling voice i only want to be gentle to be thoroughly kind it's not delightful to me to feel people care for me and yet to have to try and reason them out of it i think others also ought to be considerate we have each to judge for ourselves I know you're considerate as much as you can be. You've good reasons for what you do. But I really don't want to marry or to talk about it at all now. I shall probably never do it. No, never. I've a perfect right to feel that way, and it's no kindness to a woman to press her so hard, to urge her against her will. If I give you pain, I can only say I'm very sorry. It's not my fault. I can't marry you simply to please you. I won't say that I shall always remain your friend, because when women say that, in these situations, it passes, I believe, for a sort of mockery. But try me some day. Caspar Goodwood, during this speech, had kept his eyes fixed upon the name of his hatter, and it was not until some time after she had ceased speaking that he raised them. When he did so, the sight of a rosy, lovely eagerness in Isabel's face threw some confusion into his attempt to analyze her words. "'I'll go home. I'll go tomorrow. I'll leave you alone,' he brought out at last. "'Only,' he heavily said, "'I hate to lose sight of you.' "'Never fear. I shall do no harm.' "'You'll marry someone else as sure as I sit here,' Caspar Goodwood declared. "'Do you think that a generous charge?' why not plenty of men will try to make you i told you just now that i don't wish to marry and that i almost certainly never shall i know you did and i like your almost certainly i put no faith in what you say thank you very much do you accuse me of lying to shake you off you say very delicate things why should i not say that you've given me no pledge of anything at all no, that's all that would be wanting. You may perhaps even believe you're safe from wishing to be. But you're not, the young man went on, as if preparing himself for the worst. Very well, then, we'll put it that I'm not safe. Have it as you please. I don't know, however, said Caspar Goodwood, that my keeping you in sight would prevent it. Don't you, indeed? 
I'm after all very much afraid of you. Do you think I'm so very easily pleased? she asked, suddenly changing her tone. No, I don't. I shall try to console myself with that. But there are a certain number of very dazzling men in the world, no doubt, and if there were only one it would be enough. The most dazzling of all will make straight for you. You'll be sure to take no one who isn't dazzling. If you mean by dazzling, brilliantly clever, Isabel said, and I can't imagine what else you mean. I don't need the aid of a clever man to teach me how to live. I can find out for myself. Find out how to live alone? I wish that when you have you'd teach me. She looked at him a moment, then with a quick smile, Oh, you ought to marry, she said. He might be pardoned if for an instant this exclamation seemed to him to sound the infernal note, and it is not on record that her motive for discharging such a shaft had been of the clearest. He oughtn't to stride about lean and hungry, however. She certainly felt that for him. God forgive you, he murmured between his teeth as he turned away. Her accent had put her slightly in the wrong, and after a moment she felt the need to right herself. The easiest way to do it was to place him where she had been. "'You do me great injustice. You say what you don't know,' she broke out. "'I shouldn't be an easy victim. I've proved it.' "'Oh, to me, certainly.' "'I've proved it to others as well,' and she paused a moment. "'I refused a proposal of marriage last week.' what they call, no doubt, a dazzling one. "'I'm very glad to hear it,' said the young man gravely. "'It was a proposal many girls would have accepted. It had everything to recommend it.' Isabel had not proposed to herself to tell this story, but now she had begun, the satisfaction of speaking it out, and doing herself justice took possession of her. "'I was offered a great position and a great fortune, by a person whom I like extremely. Caspar watched her with intense interest. Is he an Englishman? He's an English nobleman, said Isabel. Her visitor received this announcement at first in silence, but at last said, I'm glad he's disappointed. Well then, as you have companions in misfortune, make the best of it. I don't call him a companion, said Caspar grimly. Why not, since I declined his offer absolutely? That doesn't make him my companion. Besides, he's an Englishman. And pray, isn't an Englishman a human being? Isabel asked. Oh, those people, they're not of my humanity, and I don't care what becomes of them. You're very angry, said the girl. We've discussed this matter quite enough. Oh, yes, I'm very angry. I plead guilty to that. She turned away from him, walked to the open window, and stood a moment looking into the dusky void of the street, where a turbid gaslight alone represented social animation. For some time neither of these young persons spoke. Caspar lingered near the chimney-piece with eyes gloomily attached. She had virtually requested him to go, he knew that, but at the risk of making himself odious he kept his ground. She was too nursed a need to be easily renounced, and he had crossed the sea all to wring from her some scrap of a vow. Presently she left the window and stood again before him. You do me very little justice, after my telling you what I have told you just now. I'm sorry I told you, since it matters so little to you. Ah, cried the young man, if you were thinking of me when you did it and then he paused with the fear that she might contradict so happy a thought. "'I was thinking of you a little,' said Isabel. "'A little? I don't understand. If the knowledge of what I feel for you had any weight with you at all, calling it a little is a poor account of it.' Isabel shook her head as if to carry off a blunder. "'I refused a most kind, noble gentleman. Make the most of that.' I thank you, then, said Caspar Goodwood gravely. I thank you immensely. And now you had better go home. May I not see you again? he asked. I think it's better not. You'll be sure to talk of this, and you see it leads to nothing. I promise you not to say a word that will annoy you. 
Isabel reflected and then answered, "'I return in a day or two to my uncle's, and I can't propose to you to come there. It would be too inconsistent.' Caspar Goodwood, on his side, considered. "'You must do me justice, too. I received an invitation to your uncle's more than a week ago, and I declined it.' She betrayed surprise. "'From whom was your invitation?' from Mr. Ralph Touchett, whom I supposed to be your cousin. I declined it because I had not your authorization to accept it. The suggestion that Mr. Touchett should invite me appeared to have come from Miss Stackpole. It certainly never did for me. Henrietta really goes very far, Isabel added. Don't be too hard on her. That touches me. No, if you declined, you did quite right, and I thank you for it and she gave a little shudder of dismay at the thought that Lord Warburton and Mr. Goodwood might have met at Garden Court. It would have been so awkward for Lord Warburton. "'When you leave your uncle, where do you go?' her companion asked. "'I go abroad with my aunt, to Florence and other places.' The serenity of this announcement struck a chill to the young man's heart. He seemed to see her whirled away into circles from which he was inexorably excluded. Nevertheless, he went on quickly with his questions. "'And when shall you come back to America?' "'Perhaps not for a long time. I'm very happy here.' "'Do you mean to give up your country?' "'Don't be an infant.' "'Well, you'll be out of my sight, indeed,' said Caspar Goodwood. "'I don't know,' she answered rather grandly. The world, with all these places so arranged and so touching each other, comes to strike one as rather small. "'It's a sight too big for me,' Caspar exclaimed, with a simplicity our young lady might have found touching if her face had not been set against concessions. This attitude was part of a system, a theory, that she had lately embraced, and to be thorough, she said after a moment, don't think me unkind if I say it's just that, being out of your sight, that I like. If you were in the same place, I should feel you were watching me, and I don't like that. I like my liberty too much. If there's a thing in the world I'm fond of, she went on with a slight recurrence of grandeur, it's my personal independence. But whatever there might be of the too superior in this speech moved Caspar Goodwood's admiration. There was nothing he winced at in the large air of it. He had never supposed she hadn't wings and the need of beautiful free movements. He wasn't, with his own long arms and strides, afraid of any force in her. Isabel's words, if they had meant to shock him, failed of the mark and only made him smile with a sense that here was common ground. Who would wish less to curtail your liberty than I? What can give me greater pleasure than to see you perfectly independent, doing whatever you like? It's to make you independent that I want to marry you. That's a beautiful sophism, said the girl, with a smile more beautiful still. An unmarried woman, a girl of your age, isn't independent. There are all sorts of things she can't do. She's hampered at every step. That's as she looks at the question, Isabel answered with much spirit. I'm not in my first youth. I can do what I choose. I belong quite to the independent class. I've neither father nor mother. I'm poor and of a serious disposition. I'm not pretty. I therefore am not bound to be timid and conventional. Indeed, I can't afford such luxuries. Besides, I try to judge things for myself. To judge wrong, I think, is more honourable than not to judge at all. I don't wish to be a mere sheep in the flock. I wish to choose my fate and know something of human affairs beyond what other people think it compatible with propriety to tell me." She paused a moment, but not long enough for her companion to reply. He was apparently on the point of doing so, when she went on. "'Let me say this to you, Mr. Goodwood. You're so kind as to speak of being afraid of my marrying. If you should hear a rumour that I'm on the point of doing so, Girls are liable to have such things said about them. Remember what I have told you about my love of liberty, and venture to doubt it." There was something passionately positive in the tone in which she gave him this advice, 
and he saw a shining candor in her eyes that helped him to believe her. On the whole he felt reassured, and you might have perceived it by the manner in which he said, quite eagerly, "'You want simply to travel for two years? I'm quite willing to wait two years, and you may do what you like in the interval. If that's all you want, pray say so. I don't want you to be conventional. Do I strike you as conventional myself? Do you want to improve your mind? Your mind's quite good enough for me, but if it interests you to wander about a while and see different countries, I shall be delighted to help you in any way in my power. You're very generous. That's nothing new to me. The best way to help me will be to put as many hundred miles of sea between us as possible. One would think you were going to commit some atrocity, said Caspar Goodwood. Perhaps I am. I wish to be free even to do that if the fancy takes me. Well, then, he said slowly, I'll go home. And he put out his hand, trying to look contented and confident. Isabel's confidence in him, however, was greater than any he could feel in her. Not that he thought her capable of committing an atrocity, but, turn it over as he would, there was something ominous in the way she reserved her option. As she took his hand, she felt a great respect for him. She knew how much he cared for her, and she thought him magnanimous. They stood so for a moment, looking at each other, united by a hand-clasp, which was not merely passive on her side. "'That's right,' she said, very kindly, almost tenderly, you lose nothing by being a reasonable man. But I'll come back wherever you are two years hence, he returned with characteristic grimness. We have seen that our young lady was inconsequent, and at this she suddenly changed her note. Ah, remember, I promise nothing, absolutely nothing. Then, more softly, as if to help him to leave her, and remember, too, that I shall not be an easy victim." You'll get very sick of your independence. Perhaps I shall. It's even very probable. When that day comes, I shall be very glad to see you. She had laid her hand on the knob of the door that led into her room, and she waited a moment to see whether her visitor would not take his departure. But he appeared unable to move. There was still an immense unwillingness in his attitude and a sore remonstrance in his eyes. I must leave you now, said Isabel, and she opened the door and passed into the other room. This apartment was dark, but the darkness was tempered by a vague radiance set up through the windows from the court of the hotel, and Isabel could make out the masses of the furniture, the dim shining of the mirror, and the looming of the big four-posted bed. She stood still a moment listening, and at last she heard Caspar Goodwood walk out of the sitting-room and closed the door behind him. She stood still a little longer, and then, by an irresistible impulse, dropped on her knees before her bed and hid her face in her arms. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 She was not praying, she was trembling, trembling all over. Vibration was easy to her, was in fact too constant with her, and she found herself now humming like a smitten harp. She only asked, however, to put on the cover, to case herself again in brown holland, but she wished to resist her excitement, and the attitude of devotion, which she kept for some time, seemed to help her to be still. She intensely rejoiced that Caspar Goodwood was gone. There was something in having thus got rid of him that was like the payment for a stamped receipt of some debt too long on her mind. As she felt the glad relief, she bowed her head a little lower. The sense was there, throbbing in her heart. It was part of her emotion, but it was a thing to be ashamed of. It was profane and out of place. It was not for some ten minutes that she rose from her knees, and even when she came back to the sitting-room, her tremor had not quite subsided. It had had, verily, two causes. Part of it was to be accounted for by her long discussion with Mr. Goodwood, but it might be feared that the rest was simply the enjoyment she found in the exercise of her power. She sat down in the same chair again and took up her book, but without going through the form of opening the volume. 
She leaned back with that low, soft, aspiring murmur with which she often uttered her response to accidents of which the brighter side was not superficially obvious, and yielded to the satisfaction of having refused two ardent suitors in a fortnight. That love of liberty of which she had given Caspar Goodwood so bold a sketch was as yet almost exclusively theoretic. She had not been able to indulge it on a large scale. But it appeared to her she had done something. She had tasted of the delight, if not of battle, at least of victory. She had done what was truest to her plan. In the glow of this consciousness, the image of Mr. Goodwood, taking his sad walk homeward through the dingy town, presented itself with a certain reproachful force, so that, as at the same moment the door of the room was opened, she rose with an apprehension that he had come back. But it was only Henrietta Stackpole returning from her dinner. Miss Stackpole immediately saw that our young lady had been through something, and indeed the discovery demanded no great penetration. She went straight up to her friend, who received her without a greeting. Isabel's elation in having sent Caspar Goodwood back to America presupposed her being in a manner glad he had come to see her but at the same time she perfectly remembered Henrietta had had no right to set a trap for her. "'Has he been here, dear?' the latter yearningly asked. Isabel turned away, and for some moments answered nothing. "'You acted very wrongly,' she declared at last. "'I acted for the best. I only hope you acted as well.' "'You're not the judge. I can't trust you,' said Isabel." This declaration was unflattering, but Henrietta was much too unselfish to heed the charge it conveyed. She cared only for what it intimated with regard to her friend. "'Isabel Archer,' she observed with equal abruptness and solemnity, "'if you marry one of these people, I'll never speak to you again.' "'Before making so terrible a threat, you had better wait till I'm asked,' Isabel replied." Never having said a word to Miss Stackpole about Lord Warburton's overtures, she now had no impulse whatever to justify herself to Henrietta by telling her that she had refused that nobleman. "'Oh, you'll be asked quick enough once you get off on the continent. Annie Clymer was asked three times in Italy. Poor, plain little Annie!' "'Well, if Annie Clymer wasn't captured, why should I be?' I don't believe Annie was pressed, but you'll be. That's a flattering conviction, said Isabel, without alarm. I don't flatter you, Isabel. I tell you the truth, cried her friend. I hope you don't mean to tell me that you didn't give Mr. Goodwood some hope. I don't see why I should tell you anything. As I said to you just now, I can't trust you. But since you're so much interested in Mr. Goodwood, I won't conceal from you that he returns immediately to America. You don't mean to say you've sent him off, Henrietta almost shrieked. I asked him to leave me alone, and I ask you the same, Henrietta. Miss Stackpole glittered for an instant with dismay, and then passed her the mirror over the chimney-piece and took off her bonnet. I hope you've enjoyed your dinner, Isabel went on but her companion was not to be diverted by frivolous propositions. "'Do you know where you're going, Isabel Archer?' "'Just now I'm going to bed,' said Isabel, with persistent frivolity. "'Do you know where you're drifting?' Henrietta pursued, holding out her bonnet delicately. "'No, I haven't the least idea, and I find it very pleasant not to know. A swift carriage of a dark night rattling with four horses over roads that one can't see. That's my idea of happiness. Mr. Goodwood certainly didn't teach you to say such things as that, like the heroine of an immoral novel, said Miss Stackpole. You're drifting to some great mistake. Isabel was irritated by her friend's interference, yet she still tried to think what truth this declaration could represent. She could think of nothing that diverted her from saying, "'You must be very fond of me, Henrietta, to be willing to be so aggressive.' "'I love you intensely, Isabel,' said Miss Stackpole with feeling. "'Well, if you love me intensely, let me as intensely alone. 
I asked that of Mr. Goodwood, and I must also ask it of you. Take care you're not let alone too much. That's what Mr. Goodwood said to me. I told him I must take the risks. You're a creature of risks. You make me shudder, cried Henrietta. When does Mr. Goodwood return to America? I don't know. He didn't tell me. Perhaps you didn't inquire, said Henrietta, with a note of righteous irony. I gave him too little satisfaction to have the right to ask questions of him. This assertion seemed to Miss Stackpole for a moment to bid defiance to comment, but at last she exclaimed, "'Well, Isabel, if I didn't know you, I might think you were heartless.' "'Take care,' said Isabel. "'You're spoiling me.' "'I'm afraid I've done that already. I hope at least,' Miss Stackpole added, "'that he may cross with Annie Clymer. Isabel learned from her the next morning that she had determined not to return to Garden Court, where old Mr. Touchett had promised her a renewed welcome, but to await in London the arrival of invitation that Mr. Bantling had promised her from his sister, Lady Pencil. Miss Stackpole related very freely her conversation with Ralph Touchett's sociable friend, and declared to Isabel that she really believed she had now got hold of something that would lead to something. On the receipt of Lady Pencil's letter, Mr. Bantling had virtually guaranteed the arrival of this document, she would immediately depart for Bedfordshire, and if Isabel cared to look out for her impressions in the interviewer, she would certainly find them. Henrietta was evidently going to see something of the inner life this time. "'Do you know where you're drifting, Henrietta Stackpole?' Isabel asked, imitating the tone in which her friend had spoken the night before. "'I'm drifting to a big position, that of the Queen of American Journalism. If my next letter isn't copied all over the West, I'll swallow my penwiper.' She had arranged with her friend, Miss Annie Clymer, the young lady of the Continental office, that they should go together to make those purchases which were to constitute Miss Clymer's farewell to a hemisphere in which she, at least, had been appreciated, and she presently repaired to German Street to pick up her companion. Shortly after her departure, Ralph Touchett was announced, and as soon as he came in, Isabel saw he had something on his mind. He very soon took his cousin into his confidence. He had received from his mother a telegram to the effect that his father had had a sharp attack of his old malady, that she was much alarmed, and that she begged he would instantly return to Garden Court. On this occasion, at least, Mrs. Touchett's devotion to the electric wire was not open to criticism. "'I've judged it best to see the great doctor, Sir Matthew Hope, first, Ralph said. "'By great good luck he's in town. He's to see me at half-past twelve, and I shall make sure of his coming down to Garden Court, which he will do the more readily, as he has already seen my father several times, both there and in London. There's an express at 2.45, which I shall take, and you'll come back with me, or remain here a few days longer, exactly as you prefer. I shall certainly go with you, Isabel returned. I don't suppose I can be of any use to my uncle, but if he's ill, I should like to be near him. "'I think you're fond of him,' said Ralph, with a certain shy pleasure in his face. "'You appreciate him, which all the world hasn't done. The quality's too fine.' "'I quite adore him,' Isabel, after a moment, said. "'That's very well. After his son, he's your greatest admirer.' She welcomed this assurance, but she gave secretly a small sigh of relief at the thought that Mr. Touchett was one of those admirers who couldn't propose to marry her. This, however, was not what she spoke. She went on to inform Ralph that there were other reasons for her not remaining in London. She was tired of it and wished to leave it, and then Henrietta was going away, going to stay in Bedfordshire. In Bedfordshire? With Lady Pencil, the sister of Mr. Bantling, who was answered for an invitation. Ralph was feeling anxious, but at this he broke into a laugh. Suddenly, none the less, his gravity returned. Bantling's a man of courage, but if the invitation should get lost on the way? I thought the British post office was impeccable. 
the good homer sometimes nods said ralph however he went on more brightly the good bantling never does and whatever happens he'll take care of henrietta ralph went to keep his appointment with sir matthew hope and isabel made her arrangements for quitting pratt's hotel her uncle's danger touched her nearly and while she stood before her open trunk looking about her vaguely for what she should put into it the tears suddenly rose to her eyes it was perhaps for this reason that when ralph came back at two o'clock to take her to the station she was not yet ready he found miss stackpole however in the sitting-room where she had just risen from her luncheon and this lady immediately expressed her regret at his father's illness he's a grand old man she said he's faithful to the last if it's really to be the last pardon my alluding to it but you must often have thought of the possibility i'm sorry that i shall not be at garden court you'll amuse yourself much more in bedfordshire i shall be sorry to amuse myself at such a time said henrietta with much propriety but she immediately added i should like so to commemorate the closing scene my father may live a long time said ralph simply then adverting to topics more cheerful he interrogated miss stackpole as to her own future now that ralph was in trouble she addressed him in a tone of larger allowance and told him that she was much indebted to him for having made her acquaintance with mr bantling he has told me just the things i want to know she said all the society items and all about the royal family i can't make out that what he tells me about the royal family is much to their credit but he says that's only my peculiar way of looking at it well all i want is that he should give me the facts i can put them together quick enough once i've got them and she added that mr bantling had been so good as to promise to come and take her out that afternoon to take you where ralph ventured to inquire to buckingham palace he's going to show me over it so that i may get some idea of how they live ah said ralph we leave you in good hands the first thing we shall hear is that you're invited to windsor castle if they ask me i shall certainly go once i get started i'm not afraid but for all that henrietta added a moment i'm not satisfied i'm not at peace about isabel what is her last misdemeanor well i've told you before and i suppose there's no harm in my going on i always finish a subject that i take up mr goodwood was here last night ralph opened his eyes he even blushed a little his blush being the sign of an emotion somewhat acute he remembered that isabel in separating from him in winchester square had repudiated his suggestion that her motive in doing so was the expectation of a visitor at pratt's hotel and it was a new pang to him to have to suspect her of duplicity on the other hand he quickly said to himself what concern was it of his that she should have made an appointment with a lover had it not been thought graceful in every age that young ladies should make a mystery of such appointments ralph gave miss stackpole a diplomatic answer i should have thought that with the views you expressed to me the other day this would satisfy you perfectly that he should come to see her that was very well as far as it went it was a little plot of mine i let him know that we were in london and when it had been arranged that i should spend the evening out i sent him a word the word we just uttered to the wise i hoped he would find her alone i won't pretend i didn't hope that you'd be out of the way he came to see her but he might as well have stayed away isabel was cruel and ralph's face lighted with the relief of his cousins not having shown duplicity i don't know exactly what passed between them but she gave him no satisfaction she sent him back to america poor mr goodwood ralph sighed her only idea seems to be to get rid of him henrietta went on poor mr goodwood ralph repeated the exclamation it must be confessed was automatic it failed exactly to express his thoughts which were taking another line you don't say that as if you felt it i don't believe you care 
ah said ralph you must remember that i don't know this interesting young man that i've never seen him well i shall see him and i shall tell him not to give up if i didn't believe isabel would come round miss stackpole added well i'd give up myself i mean i'd give her up end of chapter seventeen